yeah, I think we we chose also him because he's a very well known researcher and he has lots of papers on on the topic uh, advancing hardware for neuromorphic systems. We would like to really hear your thoughts. Uh, thanks, Guillermo. <clears throat> so as uh, as Guillermo said, uh, and I do have a hardware background, so I'm going to talk about uh, the fact that we need to go all the way from algorithms to hardware uh, to really make uh, a difference. Um, so, um, you know, deep learning certainly has made a huge amount of progress, and we all know that we are in this, uh, you know, conference here, and both in vision and in, uh, you know, <clears throat> language models and so on. So if I were to really look at, uh, and then this is some of the data that you might have seen before, uh, if I were to really look at uh, the power consumption of the co computation required for training, and I'm showing here as an example, you know, NAS for large scale uh, NAS, you probably need, for example, uh, you know, uh, computations of the order of 10 to the 21 or so. So that's a humongous number of computations that you need. And if you really translate that into, you know, common carbon footprint, the numbers are quite, uh, you know, outrageous. Uh, uh, turns out it's uh, uh, equivalent to, you know, taking a round trip, uh, um, uh, a flight from San Francisco to uh, New York. Um, and it's much more than that. On the other side of it, if we were to really look at uh, edge applications, and in particular, actually looked, looked at uh, smart glass and a Google Edge TPU, and we did some analysis of implementing a retina net DNN, um, and then calculated the battery life under ideal conditions. We didn't even con consider the uh, cost for display and so, uh, so on, which is going to require a good amount of power consumption. It turns out that the battery life under ideal conditions is about, uh, about an hour. Uh, so with all the non-idealities display and other things that's going to come into picture, it's probably going to be half an hour or so. So the question, of course, is where do these inefficiencies come from? We certainly know the brain is reasonably efficient, and we have an existential proof of that. Uh, so um, these inefficiencies come from the fact that we possibly don't have the right kind of algorithms. Uh, we don't have the right kind of sensors and the hardware architecture. And finally, at the end of it, at the bottom of it, we probably don't have the right kind of circuits and uh, devices. Hmm? So uh, if I were to now really think about, you know, comparing with the biological systems and um, you know, the biological systems do possess a level of uh, functionality that is unmatched with the artificial systems. And this is an example that uh, we considered, uh, which is a fruit fly, which has about, uh, you know, 100,000 neurons. They fly fast, avoiding obstacles and dodge dynamic obstacles really, you know, uh, efficiently. And uh, then, um, uh, you know, working with the uh, coasters uh, here, we actually figured out uh, that uh, the system that they implemented, the flying monkey, uh, the compute power is about uh, you know one to two watts. The compute power. Well, on the other side of it, if you really look at the fruit fly, it's probably about microwatts of power consumption. So there's a huge amount of uh, you know efficiency gap uh, that exists. So the question, of course, is uh, 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 you know can we try to reduce that efficiency gap in some ways? Huh? So the big picture that we uh, looked at. Is, uh, is it possible to actually have uh, you know, autonomous intelligent systems uh, by improving the compute efficiency and the robustness of these cognitive systems through a cross-layer uh, approach, going all the way from algorithms to hardware. And we'll find out that there's a need for really thinking about co-designing the algorithms of the hardware in some ways. Huh? So uh, the exemplary application driver that we looked at as a part of an IARPA project uh, that, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> Uh, Costas is involved in and also as a part of the Center for Brain Inspired Computing, which is a uh, center funded by DARPA and uh, SRC companies. Uh, we're looking at basically vision-based navigation, completely vision-based navigation. And uh, the idea is to really do localization, mapping, odometry, you know, path planning, and so on, uh, where, uh, you know, with the diverse learning modalities, you know, supervised learning, you know, um, uh, reinforcement learning, and also looked at different kinds of uh, uh, you know, spike-based and non-spike-based computing uh, to get a, a compute efficiency which is more than 100x better than what can be done today. Uh, I kept robustness here. Whatever the design that you do at the end of it, you certainly need to be robust. Uh, and then it's sometimes it's a little bit difficult to define and to really say, hey, how much of an improvement in robustness that we want, but the robustness and explainability certainly are important issues. So uh, as I said, in order to really handle this problem, we need to take a you know, cross-layer design approach. And in the context of this workshop, um, uh, we're going to be looking at uh, you know, sensors going from different kinds of uh, 
uh, you know, cameras, in particular, actually the, uh, the frame-based cameras and the DVS cameras, uh, looking at the algorithms and the hardware. So now if I were to really go from point A to point B, uh, you know, for this uh, uh, drone to go from point A to point B, uh, avoiding obstacles, got to do an optical flow segmentation, object detection, you name it, you know, tracking, localization, and so on. So to start with, uh, the, what kind of sensors are we going to use? And in this particular case, we're going to be looking at only, you know, frame-based and event-based cameras. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, the algorithms that we need to develop, and I'll go very, very briefly into some of those, um, is that you have to do these you know, optical flow segmentation, blah, blah, blah. And uh, what kind of network architecture is going to be suitable for that? And that turns out to be quite important. We'll see that uh, hybrid in some ways is the way to go. And I'll talk about that. And finally, at the end of it, the algorithm that we develop has to be implemented in the right kind of hardware. And uh, in some ways, today's hardwares are basically the you know the CPUs and the T, uh, TPUs and uh, uh, and the GPUs. And so, question of course is, if you were to implement some of those in these uh, you know today's hardware, uh, do you have the efficiency? And if you don't, what are the things that we really need to do to actually come up with the right kind of hardware? Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, just to very quickly go over the different kind of modalities that one has to look at because we're looking at different kind of cameras um, and the kind of application that we're looking at are, uh, so to say, sequential applications. Uh, turns out that the network architecture, certainly one can look at the standard deep learning uh, <coughs> networks. And, um, but uh, for sequential tasks, in a lot of ways, uh, turns out, and especially for these DVS cameras with spike inputs, uh, it does make sense to use the spike-based computation units. And the spiking networks, uh, what are spiking networks? They're basically, you know, if you think about it, there are RNNs. Uh, and then there's an inherent, uh, you know, recurrence because of the fact that you have a membrane potential, uh, which can be a leaky integrating fire kind of neuron. And uh, on the other side of it, uh, you know, it's difficult to train in a lot of ways. Uh, and uh, uh, so is it possible that I actually come up with some hybrid networks where part of the network could be, uh, you know, in, in, uh, leaky integrated and fire kind of neurons, other part of the network could potentially be, you know, really kind of uh, activation that you have. Huh? And it turns out for such networks, you can potentially get a good amount of improvement, huh? uh, both in energy and in terms of uh, accuracy. Now, the hardware computational efficiency, as I mentioned, you know, currently we do use GPUs. And we'll see that some of these algorithms that we implemented in the GPUs may not be quite efficient. So there's a need to really think about uh, you know, new hardware. There's a huge amount of focus today on really looking at uh, you know, compute in memory kind of hardwares. You know, why compute in memory? The uh, interesting thing is that today's hardware, if you really look at it, uh, the, uh, you know, the von Neumann kind of architecture, uh, you actually, if you were to do, for example, a huge number of matrix vector multiplication, and that's what you end up doing in all these uh, you know, uh, in algorithms, uh, it turns out that the traffic from the memory to the CPU can be quite huge. So is it possible that I do the computations in the memory itself in some ways and thereby reduce that traffic if I can, and that can potentially give you a large amount of improvement. So uh, sparsity is another thing that uh, plays a big role in, in deep learning. And uh, so if I can actually effectively utilize sparsity in my architecture, then I can also get large, uh, a good amount of improvement. And finally, at the end of it, you find that most of these hardware that we're looking at are not quite suitable for SNNs. They don't do event-driven computation, and they may not effectively implement some of these uh, uh, algorithms. So there's a need to really think about the hardware architecture that's suitable for that. You know, there are non-commercial hardwares available. For example, the Intel Loihi. Uh, they may not today be able to implement large-scale designs, but they can potentially be quite effective for a class of applications. So, um, and uh, certainly, I'm not going to go into any details of it. There are some interesting uh, you know, emerging devices that can potentially be used, which can mimic the neuron and the uh, synaptic functionalities in a more efficient way. Yeah? And, uh, and, and finally, the training complexity, I'm not going to go into any details of that, but, uh, you know, is it important in a lot of applications that I do, you know, on-chip learning, can I do that effectively? So with that in mind, I'm just uh, going to uh, briefly talk uh, about some of these sensors that one can use, uh, and in particular, actually, the DVS and the, uh, and the, uh, the frame-based cameras. Uh, and again, I'm probably talking to the uh, uh, choir here, and you're all familiar with it. But what is really important to understand that the choice of the sensors would dictate the choice of 
the different modalities, yeah? how much memory requirement that I'm going to have, what's the kind of latency I'm going to have on the energy and accuracy. Yeah? That's going to play a role. So again, the frame-based cameras are the regular cameras on the other side of it. You can potentially think of these uh, you know, DVS cameras where there's, when there's a relative motion between the object and the camera, then you actually have a spike which is formed. And if you can effectively use those spikes for computation, that can be quite exciting. Huh? Uh, I'm gonna quickly go over, and, and uh, one other thing I just wanted to mention is the fact that uh, when it comes to these, uh, you know, even this camera, since you end up having spikes as input, it huh? uh, turns out, uh, that the spike-based computation units like a spiking neural network, which are again effectively an RNN uh, or a kind of a you know, low-cost version of an LSTM, if I may say so, um, uh, can be potentially useful and for these sequential tasks. So uh, now if I go into the algorithm side of things, what it really tells you is that if I have these sensor inputs that are coming in, is it possible that I actually have the right kind of network architecture, the right kind of training technique? to do, uh, for example, optical flow segmentations and so on. Huh? Uh, so if I were to really look at optical flow, and this is an example, I'm gonna very quickly go over it. Uh, uh, we looked at the possibility of using both uh, the cameras, the, the, the even camera input uh, and, the, uh, and the frame camera input, combine them together, fuse them together into a network. So, so to say, take the best of both worlds in some ways and do optical flow. And it turns out that actually the fusion flow net that we presented, I think at uh, ICRA last year, um, uh, actually gives you, uh, you know, quite good results uh, compared to, for example, uh, a network which is completely spiking. It was actually a little bit difficult to train from that angle, but, uh, you know, it, it, but even though the spiking network actually had less number of, you know, slightly less parameters, it turns out actually uh, and the fusion flow net gave uh, much better uh, results in terms of the uh, endpoint error. And then finally, we looked at very, very low complexity. Uh, you know, network architectures like a completely, uh, you know, spiking network architecture with about, you know, 60,000 parameters, where these other ones are actually about, you know, 10 million parameters or so. And it turns out that you can do reasonably well. And the reason why it does reasonably well is because the fact that, uh, you know, it can effectively utilize the, uh, uh, the memory potential, or in other words, uh, effectively use it as an RNN. For these flows, and these are some of the results of uh, this, you know, um, <coughs> spike flow net, uh, fusion flow net, and this full fledged ANN. And it turns out that fusion flow net, uh, as I mentioned, uh, does probably the best job. Uh, and I wanted to mention a few other things. So we looked at very low complexity, uh, you know, lightweight networks like a spiking network, and uh, and then try to analyze uh, these low complexity spiking networks with the corresponding ANN. And it uh, turns out that the corresponding ANN would require larger number of parameters. And the reason why it would require large number of parameters is because of the fact that, uh, you know, effectively, again, we're utilizing an SNN to do work as an LSTM or an RNN. Okay. Uh, and uh, what we found is that these low complexity networks can potentially give you the same kind of uh, power consumption, uh, or rather, same kind of uh, uh, accuracy as a baseline ANN that I'm showing there. Uh, however, with a lot uh, lower number of parameters and at this end of it, a lot lower power consumption. Um, I know that uh, we don't have time with segmentation, doing other kinds of uh, things that we did in object detection segmentations and all, but uh, just wanted to mention that uh, again, the hybrid approach of really taking both inputs uh, of the DVS camera and the hybrid networks actually does give you, you know, good segmentation results. Uh, finally, in object detection and tracking, one of the things that we looked at, and this was presented at this year's ICRA, is the fact that you can use completely, you know, low complexity spike-based computation unit to be able to actually uh, do uh, a tracking of these objects. Uh, to that effect, uh, you know, this is a very, very simple one layer spiking network that I'm showing using DVS camera inputs and uh, to be able to actually not only track the objects, but at the same time, be able to say what speed it's going at. Huh? And this is an example of that. I think there's a demo in one of the, uh, you know, uh, sessions today where, uh, you know, showing that it's possible to actually, you know, use these, uh, you know, these DVS cameras again uh, to do, for example, not only let me see if I can move it faster. Instead of that, I messed it up. Yeah, so what it really does is that you can see the different colored 
uh, and this uh, ball was moving. And uh, uh, depending on the speed, we can actually detect what speed it's going at, low speed, high speed, medium speed, and so on, with a very, very simple mind. It's you know, spike the computational limit. Huh? And I uh, wanted to also show, for example, the one that uh, you know, Costas has been looking at uh, as a part of our project is uh, really this EV catcher, which is taking inspiration from nature and uh, trying to be able to you know, catch the ball. Uh, again, the, uh, the camera being the DPS camera. Uh, finally, very quickly talk about tape. Hey, so since we talk about these hybrid uh, architectures, uh, network architectures, what kind of you know, hardware architectures can be suitable uh, for implementing some of these algorithms. So, and these, uh, it's not that you're building an ASIC, you're building an accelerator, right? And at the end of it, it has to have you know, a good amount of programmability. Uh, so the hardware architecture that one uh, has to efficiently implement the algorithms, both the SNNs and ANNs. Uh, and we believe that there's a need for these hybrid systems. Uh, and uh, finally, another thing that I mentioned earlier is the fact that there's a need to really think about in-memory computing in some ways to be able to actually do this matrix vector multiplication very effectively. If you have to do, for example, transcendental functions in some of these transformer-like architectures, it turns out it's also possible to actually embed sometimes a ROM into a RAM and to be able to do some of these transcendental functions more uh, you know, efficiently rather than storing it in a map table in, the, in, in your DRAM. So is it possible that I do in-memory, you know, near and in-memory computing? There are other possibilities. You can actually do, you know, approximate stochastic hardware and so on. I'm not going to go into that, but, you know, if I'm able to do in-memory computing, it turns out then it can actually get potentially compared to what's there today, GPUs and CPUs, you can get a good amount of improvement in both energy consumption uh, and power. So the basic idea, uh, again, uh, I probably don't have much time, but the basic idea is to really think about having a crossbar. And the crossbar is really nothing other than having a, a resistive element at the cross point of each, each of these, uh, at the crossbars. And if you have inputs which are coming in, which are voltage, the output is gonna be current, which is a summation of VI times GI. In other words, it's actually a dot product that you end up doing. Huh? Now, if you do this dot product, it's an analog domain. There's a lot of other things that you have to do. You have to transform that into a, uh, in a digital domain. And you have to read the, use the right kind of devices. It's not that you can't do CMOS, but you can potentially use these other kinds of devices. And you can think of an architecture where you have these different kinds of you know, crossbars put together with some peripheral circuitry, which in this particular case are gonna be the analog to digital converters. And if you do that, you can potentially think of a spatial architecture, which is highly parallel and can implement some of these algorithms very efficiently. Um, and uh, now if I take CMOS as an example, what we did is we looked at different kinds of implementation to start with the baseline being a GPU based baseline, which in this particular case is an NVIDIA Jetson TX2 for comparison. And then we actually build our own. Uh, we developed an adaptive, uh, you know, sparsity aware compute and memory architecture for ANNs. And then we also developed a spiking neural network accelerator. The spiking neural, neural network becomes a little bit different because your memory potential has to be stored. So if you're doing in-memory computing, in that case, you have to not only think about uh, you know, the weights, uh, but you have to also think about, hey, how to store that uh, memory potential and effectively update it. And uh, again, doing in-memory computing. And then also, also looked at some of these you know, uh, emerging hardware techniques and using some of those to get rid of this ADC, which can be the analog to digital uh, networks, which is the bottleneck. And finally also ended up using some comparisons with uh, Intel Loihi processor. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, you know, the hardware architecture on the Jetson 2, where you actually implemented this, uh, you know, optical flow protection. And uh, what I wanted to underscore is the fact that uh, even though this is an all in implementation, uh, which actually shows the energy consumption on this axis uh, on an implementation in, uh, in, in the Jetson. So this is all ANN. This is a hybrid network, uh, you know, SNN and ANN, and this is all, uh, you know, SNN, which has a huge, you know, really low number of parameters. But what you really end up seeing is that the power consumption for these ANN SNNs are quite higher than these large scale ANNs that we implemented. Huh? That really says that it's actually not quite suitable for the kind of uh, and, and, and implementations that we did with that. Huh? Uh, and uh, so what we did is we actually implemented uh, an hardware accelerator doing in-memory computing 
And again, uh, this chip, I'm not going to go into the details of it. It's actually a CMOS chip, um, uh, which we implemented showing that, hey, it's possible to get a good amount of uh, tops per watt. Um, uh, energy, energy consumption is really good, but it still actually has the power consumption which is dominated this, uh, which is shown in this orange uh, by the uh, analog to digital converters. So if I can get rid of these analog to digital converters, uh, then we can potentially get a large amount of improvement. And to that effect, actually, we looked at some of those. Huh? But before that, I also wanted to mention that, uh, you know, uh, looked at a spike bus computation unit, and if I can use a spike-based computation, you need to do the computation. And again, remember, as I mentioned earlier, that it's kind of like an LSTM that, I, that you're using. Uh, a few things which are important is that you need to really look at sequential uh, a, a, you know, tasks. A lot of times we were actually earlier implementing, for example, you know, just for images using you know, standard images using SNNs, uh, it may not be suitable. Uh, uh, but if you do for the sequential task, it does make sense to use SNNs. And uh, as I mentioned, that one has to really think about the membrane potential along with the parameters that you have to do for in-memory computing. So that's what we did. And what we really uh, did here is that we came up with an architecture which has a fused uh, in a weight memory and the membrane potential memory together to do this computations. Uh, and uh, what it really shows is that, and then this is a chip that we implemented in a 65 nanometer technology that uh, you know, we, one can get potentially a large improvement compared to the ANNs. Remember that I showed earlier that uh, uh, the Jetson is not able to do that. Now you're able to get a good amount of improvement over uh, the ANNs. And then uh, and, and quickly mentioning the fact that, uh, um, you know, power consumption is dominated by uh, the analog to digital converters, but if you now are able to actually think about getting rid of these analog to digital converters, huh? you might say, hey, what's going to happen? My accuracy is going to decrease. Yes, if you don't do anything, the accuracy is going to decrease, but if you can train on the hardware, meaning thereby that not only you learn the data, you also learn the hardware at the same time. So if you do that, in that case, I can show that you can get a good amount of improvement compared to the ADC-based designs. And, uh, and, and that turns out to be quite, quite interesting. And this is actually an example showing that, you know, completely ADC-based implementations of, uh, you know, and doing ADC-less training with full precision and uh, this one, and the AE results, which is the, uh, you know, endpoint error that we have are slightly worse, but, uh, you know, certainly acceptable in a lot of these cases. Um, I'm not going to talk about Intel Loihi implementation, but actually in, the, in one of the posters, uh, you know, they're going to talk about that, uh, you know, tracking that we did on the Loihi. And Loihi does well, but certainly not implement large-scale designs. So, um, so key takeaways, uh, the way I look at it, uh, you know, proper sensor fusion, proper hybrid networks, taking really the best of both worlds in some ways, and, uh, you know, uh, can potentially capture the uh, essence of some of these, uh, you know, training. And in some cases for completely sequential applications, we can potentially can use SNNs. And again, SNNs should be used in a way that it's suitable for use in, uh, you know, proper applications. So that is important, not for images, but really for sequential tasks. And, uh, and we don't really have, one of the things that we don't have is sort of the next generation data sets. Uh, I know that Costas has been working on some of those and we actually looked at some of those, but, uh, you know, development of some of these synthetic and real uh, world data sets is going to be really important to really keep this moving. Mm -hmm. and, and finally, from the hardware point of view, again, I feel that, uh, you know, proper hardware architectures are going to be essential to reap the benefits of, uh, you know, what we talked about. And again, hybrid in a lot of ways, I feel is the way to go. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we have time for one question. There will be a panel discussion at the end of the session. Now, while we switch speakers, uh, one question. You can come here close to the microphone. All right, we can also have the questions at the end in the panel discussion. So let's send the speaker again.
Maybe you send it on my personal email. You want to send it back? Oh, you want me to present to Zoom? Yes, because it was on the last two projects. But um, I'm not on the network conference network. Can you connect to CPI network? No, I'm on my phone normally. Are you guys in the back or standing back there? Because I'm going to put your finger on that's what to say. Yeah, it's nice. Now it's going to disappear. It's Should we go? Okay. 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 This one. And the last one is Vancouver, lower face. I think if you give us your genetic art. Yeah. I can't access it from here. Which can you send it back to RD the announcement? At my channel's com. No? Yeah. You guys too hot? Yes. Yeah. Too hot? Let's open the door then. Hi, Toby. <laughs> Is that door open? Um, I'm not sure you can, you know. My trigger. Which one? An alarm. Uh, the one you want. And you want to make sense. Yeah. Yeah. The mic? It's live for the breaking. Oh. Oh. Isn't that? Okay. Uh, not yet. Let me refresh. Not working. No, my computer is working. He wants me to uh, present on Zoom because oh. some people are asking. Yeah. yeah. Very slow. Not here, yeah. You sent it to which address? Right there. Yeah. Here? Yeah. You have to switch off because it's not coming from there. So you have to switch off uh, the volume. To avoid My volume? To avoid the talk. And? Um, you can do you know what I should do? Oh, I can see me. Okay. There you go. Do you want computer audio? No, the audio is oh, me out. So, no, wait. <laughs> Leave meeting, I'll come back. Sorry. Launch? No, no, no. Mail, we have to press it again. I couldn't I see your screen. It's coming, yeah. Okay. And I press anyway. So what should I do here? And then you can keep your video off. So what do they do? How do I do that? Join with computer audio. Yeah, you yeah. go and join. Yeah. yeah. And turn them on. Got it. Got it. Uh, no, this is all on. And huh? I'll just go to share screens and show the screen where you have your presentation. The microphone, this is working. It's offline. It's offline. So I have some coming from here. Okay. So this one, okay. There is some sound. 
Yes, it's also here for the room is here and the recording is there. Okay. So I will now play the sound and try to. Uh, yeah, I'll find. Uh, how do I get rid of it? Huh? What's happening? Oh, we're going. They're trying to lift it up so people can see it in the back part. We can minimize this, right? Uh, do you, can you minimize that? Okay. Wow, Christophe's back. I haven't seen him in three years. <laughs> All right. Okay. Yeah, I think we are better ready. Thanks very much uh, for your patience. So the second speaker, we have Riyad Benasman. He is uh, now head of research at uh, Meta. Yes, and before he was at uh, Pittsburgh University of Medicine. And, and yeah, I was between CMU and Pitt. Yeah. And CMU. And uh, I think today you want to talk about events and frames, how to combine them. So very much in line with what Kaushik was talking about, events and frames, the hybrid approach. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you. So thank you so much for the invitation. Um, I want to uh, share with you a few uh, ideas and fuel for the mind. If you're interested in more technical work, please come to see us for the conference. But I enjoy since we're here for quite a long time, just talking about one thing. And can you hide that thing with the? I can't. I don't know how to do that. Yeah, huh? Hide that stuff at the top. No, three dots. No, to the right. Yeah. Hide something. Yes. Hide, yeah. Wow. And um, and so this idea is always about. I think the field is always asking question about events and frames. And frames are a different world. Events are a different world. And people are ah, I'm frames. I'm events. People shift between events and frames. But reality is, what I want to say in this talk, it, they're somehow very similar and very different. And and one includes the other. We'll get there. So if I had to rephrase this talk, it would be something like uh, this. Basically what I'll be talking about today is the importance of understanding structure and uh, statistics, because basically this is what both information are providing you. And I'll get there. So we'll do it like a petit uh, zero equations, we'll go there. So since I joined computer vision in 1993, <clears throat> I've seen the, this community change three times directions. And so I wanted to understand the timeline of where we came from, why are we all here? And obviously there are some important dates, 1958, this is the invention of perceptron, and then you had 59, the Hublin Wiesel, and then the first picture, uh, you know, digitized picture. And then there was this birth of computer vision around the, the 60s with Larry Roberts, who started doing all the filtering. And then there was, of course, the summer of vision where computer vision thought people would solve it at MIT for a summer project. Of course, it didn't happen. And then Larry Roberts could be seen as the first, as the father of computer vision, just because he did it. And then he ran away doing building internet, I think. And then the second father, of the field could be seen as Rosenfeld. Everybody who dominated the field in the 80s and 90s somehow passed through that uh, lab. It was a hub. And then, of course, the David Marr that dominated the field, this idea of, hey, I have an image. I'm going to extract something and something and something. And it's the hierarchy, like the vertical hierarchy, which I think is now has to be changed into a horizontal, but it's a different story. And then the 90s. There are all of us here, some of us are from the 90s here, we called it geometry a lot. And then the thousands, it was all the quest of, oh, now we solve geometry, how can we solve pattern recognition? So the 2000 was the sift, and, but with no machine learning yet. And when you look again, around the 2000, we have GPUs and we start having, you know, this invasion of AI. So you see it, it bur the fields go and changes and people change and people adapt. So reality is now since 2000 with the GPU, the game is mainly a game of data collection and data training. So we academics, I'm not academic anymore, but are out of this game, right? So it's really a game of power. And so uh, the question is what's gonna happen next, right? And so the other hand, this is frames, events. Where is, 
you see, things change. There is no truth. So this is not my work. Really, it, it was presented at ICCV in 2019. Someone said, computer vision looking back to look forward. And she really realized that computer vision has been reinvented many times, and that the computer vision community resists novelty. So obviously, you're all here because most of us did the great work to advertise and, and get you here. And so thank you so much. Now, look at this thing. We dedicate in our community 2% of our time to think about the fundamental of what we do. Isn't that a problem? 2% of the paper accepted here think about what we should do next. This is really a problem. So we are a very good community of engineers. And I think sometimes it's nice to have something new that comes and shifts because at the end it's engineering that prevails, right? So my question for many reasons around the end of the nineties, because most of us here were working on fancy cameras and going beyond geometry and single viewpoints and it never really worked. And my opinion was because the images are something really bad. And so I asked myself a question, why are we using images? Why are images the optimal structure of data? Is it true? So now we know probably not. And are the gray levels really what we need? Just a very simple, simple question. And I think I got the answer for that because when you really look back, why we try images, I think the answer is, I saw it many times, it's a, a moment of a history. It comes from painting. Everything we do here started here. This is the mother of all camera. It's, uh, it's called the camera obscura. It was fun to do, but suddenly it reaches us because people made money out of this. There was a, a money approach and people start painting faster. And, and so it's a real a momentum of history. And when we talk about event acquisition, now people think DVS and, and it's a very good solution. So I'm not doing, I'm not reminding you all this, you know, this is basically changing from sampling on the time axis to another dimension with this amplitude and you can do all the fancy things. So it's a good way. That's why we're gathered here to talk about this. Reality is time is the most valuable thing in, in this uh, framework. And I will show you why it is so important. And so, Obviously, DVS, old days. I have the first uh, 128 DVS soldiered by Toby himself. Should keep it in the museum one day. <laughs> and then, then we see this new type of sensors that are called hybrids. So the hybrids has a very funny story. Toby and I in 2007 wanted to write the European product, remember? And I told him, it's a problem that we don't have uh, photo consistency. At some point, I would be happy to have uh, a gradient to know how much light is going. Not all the time, but sometimes. And brains do it. Brains have frames and they have uh, events. So the, this was the starting of this design and that Rafa did first. And don't get me wrong, this is not even this vision. This is event-based serving frames. Here we are using events to enhance the, the image appearance, the image rendering, the image everything. This is events serving frames. And it's interesting, right? But if you go in this path, it's super great, but you're going in the path of rendering, of making images look better or whatever you want to render to somebody. Very good. Great. But if I think you are interested in other options. This might not be the right sensor for you, right? Um, so when you think event acquisition, I think what we all say here again and again, it's the world is changing, it's dominated by this. This is battery powered. So you have to reduce data. You have to put less current on wires and extract as many meaningful information. So. As Toby said it, and many times it's stupid to burn energy to acquire something and send it and store it and then throw it away. We all talked about that. So the solution is, the, I don't believe there is any generic solution. The DVS is not the absolute way of acquiring this type of event acquisition. And I honestly believe there is an infinite number of solutions. And this is motivated by one fact. If you take five minutes to see how many different eyes and vision systems there are out there, 
I don't think we can compare to each other. We can find similarities, but everybody adapts whatever he's doing to his environment. So there is no, uh, it's not all about changes. There are many, many, many solutions, but you have to start somewhere and that's good. Anyway, so I think what really matters is whatever you're gonna do in this field, what you care about is, can I get the dynamics of that scene and try to understand what's the nature of the data? That's it. If changes are, changes are what we could build in the 2000s with our 180 nanometer licenses, probably there was better to do. So if you had to say, let me do a panorama, I think all of us can come up with something like this, like a spark sorting in a neuroscience lab. You can come up with two axes, integration time, how long does it take me to get an information and power. So at one end, frames take time and they burn energy. At the lower end, you have events, they're almost continuous time, they burn very little, they burn and you have something in between. I honestly, I didn't know Power-wise, if it was more or less, my belief is you can do it much less, but I put it somewhere in the middle, debatable. And But what I want to tell you today is, although these look so different, somehow they are ex very, very similar, and at the same time, very different. So let me tell you why I'm saying this. I think when we do event-based and we really look at them very deeply, we are facing this type of things. We have on one hand structure and we have on the other hand statistics. So don't look at the slide, look at me. I'm telling you a very funny story. Imagine you are looking at something, right? You have two main things you can do. You can say, yeah, I know that thing. Knowing that thing doesn't mean you understand how it works, right? I can see a, a gardener passing every day. So I know that guy. I don't know who he is. I don't know why he's passing there. But all I know is, I know that at two he passes by, I see him sometimes there, that's statistics. I know nothing of his life. I don't know if he's sick, if nothing, statistics. So I know. On the other hand, I can understand. I can understand that person. Understanding meaning I will know his components. I will know how they connect to each other, how they evolve over time. So I know basically, I can, I, can, I can understand how, what makes him, what builds him, what's the connection between those pieces. And you see, this is fundamentally different. One is statistics, I know stuff. One is understanding, I deeply understand. If you have time to lose, go on the internet, this is slightly different, and look for a video from Feynman that says, knowing versus understanding. And he has a very funny story. He says, you have two theories, theory A and theory B. Which one is better? This is not my words, it's all Feynman's word. So in theory, A and B do the job, but one is better than the other. Anyone know which one is better? The better one is the one that can you make a slight change and it can evolve into something bigger. Whereas the other one can only do that. Now let us go back to event cameras. Event camera can produce frames. and can do everything we do with frames, with an event camera, right? But event camera can do much more. They have time, they have, I will show you more than that. Whereas a frame can do lots of things but can never be an event camera. Do you see the difference? One can evolve into something much bigger while the other one is stuck there. So a cat and difference, they all look different. But my daughter who is five, she saw one cat and she knows it's a cat because they're all structurally identical. All cats roughly look the same, have the same behavior, have the same structure, but in appearance, they are so different. So if you wanna see, recognize a cat, you have two options. You can try to get his statistics and you're gonna go to spend 30,000 hours to collect 10,000 millions of all the cats in the world to recognize one, that's knowing. And you have understanding. I know what the cat is. I know how he walks. I know his dynamics. Therefore, I can do much more from it. And so vision so far, as you can see, uses frames. Therefore, everything we've done so far, people tried in the 70s to go to add velocity. But you can see images don't contain time. They don't, contain, they don't measure things precisely. So if you can summarize of what we do in an image, it's mainly statistics, appearance, it's knowing. Whereas on the other hand, 
if you take an event camera, <laughs> this is. <laughs> wait, 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 stop. stop. <laughs> this, I took this because I know. Time an event camera was connected to uh, an FPGA, and the idea was to shuffle cards super fast. Everybody knows that, and recognize the tip center. So I took that same baseline, uh, so that same data, and I'm gonna sonify. I'm gonna this uh, because it had the feedback. If I put it, I'll, I'll it. yeah. <laughs> No. 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 Space time signature is completely different. So there is information. This is how event-based machine learning works. This is why it works because there is structure. Now, if you want to learn this, you have many ways. You can smash it and go back to statistics. Good luck. Or you can play in this field. And when you do that, what you are gonna look for is how can I detect these structures because that's what makes my information. There's a very nice paper from 2015 that basically hinted about statistics versus understanding where it's really nice. This paper shows why event base has such a high dynamic, why the properties of temporal structure of high, of high um, temporal resolution really bring something new to the table. So you see this A is moving around like when you read it. And in space time, uh, here I'm only showing the orientation, the, the histogram of how many edges are oriented this way. So it's a histogram of orientation. And here it's, see the sum here? On the same uh, statistics, I got the dynamics of how the number of pixels oriented by a bunch of time uh, a fraction of time uh, uh, on an interval of time evolve over time. And you can see an A, although looks very different statistically to a V in distribution, it's completely different from a dynamic and a structure point of view because structurally it is different. And this applies to everything. And the paper even goes to tell you what's the minimal, um, when, when can you become event-based and when are you uh, uh, in frame-based mode? When, when is it statistics? And what's the temporal threshold that makes you go to the structure? Okay, that's the paper. It's done in an ad hoc way. I didn't develop the math myself, but it's really nice. So to my knowledge, time surfaces learn, do this, um, do this um, structure learning. I'm gonna tell you why. So imagine you have sets of events, probably people didn't get that. And you have this last event, arriving at time t, what you want to know is how can I describe the structure? You see, the, it doesn't matter who speaks, it's when he speaks and where it, it is being spoken. So this idea we found was to create some decay over some tau. And when you look at the amount of value here over the curve, it gives you some, some vector that describes this structure. And that's what it is called the time vector or time surface. So call it whatever it is. This is a structure. This is structural. This is not by, uh, statistics, right? And so when you go to an event based mode, it brings you something more about the structure. It's not that easy. It's a structure on many time scales, right? You're looking for dynamics. So when you have a time uh, surface, hierarchy, the first layers are very short, like in the brain. You want to get the features, the, what's happening. So your tau here, which is how far in the past am I gonna look where my structures start, is what defines your integration time to define your structure. Not integration time, your observation time. What do, what, how far should I keep something that is useful for me now, right? And so when you get those decays, you get the time surface, you get many of those, so you cluster. And then when you cluster, you get the best four clusters here. This is a toy example. And you see these cluster respond in a very unique manner. So this is not a static feature. This is saying 
This is describing an edge maybe moving this way or an edge moving that way. You see what I mean? It has space and time, both and velocity, somehow normalized. And you can go deeper. Now, anything that comes from here will pass through the first filter and say, oh, that's feature number one. Oh, and then it was followed by feature number two. And you can scale it up again and again, which is really cool when you want to do an architecture because you don't have to think much. But this time, you are not seeing how pixels are evolving. What's the structure of pixels? Now, the second layer is the structure of features. How do these features combine over time, over a larger time scale? Because now the, you, know, you integrate more information. And then you get longer decays because you integrate more. You do the same thing. And now you have other time surfaces that describe the structure of space and time, but on larger time scale on, on the, in the feature space. You see what, what I'm saying? And you can keep going. And, and you can do it on a month, on a year, on 20 years, if you have data a cluster again. See again, these features are now highly specialized as how's the feature of the feature of the feature combined. And you can keep going until at some point your, your observation time is sufficiently long. It, you get some distribution. I have seen the feature one and then feature two. You see what I mean when the time scales become longer? And you can see they're all super different, right? And so just show you an example. This is the Manchu and he's moving his head. And you see here, it's color coded by which time surface is responding. And the more you go deeper, you have many strategies. You can make your time larger, but also your space larger, it depends. And what you see here is how it's detecting. I think this is the IBM database, but we just wanted to do a toy example. And the thing recognizes rolling and etc. So, although you've seen all this, what I wanted to say today is this is completely different from a, a normal machine learning. This is a different paradigm. It's a, that's why you shouldn't be using ConvNet maybe to do the mapping between the the timing and whatever you want. But fundamentally, we have access to something really unique. And reality is, as you can see, an image, a frame-based camera. And an event camera do the same job, but an event camera can do the job of the frame camera. The frame camera cannot. So this is present in nature. We know that the retina has two pathways. One is what we call magno and parvo. One is where, and the other is what. So what normally takes a bit more of time because, and it's normally a combination of fast and slow. I'm not, you know, this sounds familiar. So nature plays with this. this frames exist, or I don't think in the form we think of them, but something close to a gray level, I believe exists and is used. And something like events is also used. So there is two mechanism operating, statistic and structure. That's what makes us super strong, right? I can recognize it's a cat, but I say, I've never seen this cat before. You see, that's why you say the sentence. You can say the sentence, I think it's a cat, but I've never seen it before because you're operating on structure and you're operating on statistics. Right? I see a human being, it's not my mother. You see, you have both, you need both because the world is described by its dynamics and its appearance. I'm almost done. Last, there's hope. There was this camera that this guy did a long time ago that I believe is the best. It's a very good camera in many ways. So it gave you all the time domain, the events and the gray level all encoded in time. So now you have a very sparse and neat way to get gray levels long, we don't care, statistics, and we get events. And it's all event-based, asynchronous, sparse, low power. And it's a pity this sensor is not built anymore. I think I have, I saved as much as I could. And just to show you why this is so nice. So these are all data generate like 30 frames per second. This is one microsecond. It's not true, it's not really one microsecond, but you can see it's updated asynchronously. Every gray level there, is asynchronously updated. And when you turn them, you see what everybody is talking about here, frames, redundant, statistics, boring, slow, greedy, fine, but required, needed, important. On the other hand, you can have all this continuous gray levels, beautifully timed, and honestly, not bad. There is a class of algorithm, and fortunately, I think we are among the very few who wrote them, who do who, who, where we do computer vision event per event on gray levels, right? You can do it. It's not that different. 
but it's completely different from doing it with events and playing with time. Okay, but you can still rewrite those equations of uh, image processing iteratively. So all I wanted to say today is images and events are two, uh, they represent two different spaces that are required, are needed, and that should not compete. They're both super important. One is low power and fast. One is more huh, and slow because you need to integrate more cues. We have the really, it's really rare that the field like us in this room are able to think, hey, we have a novel paradigm for machine learning. It's not statistics, it's structure. Okay. Thank you so much. That's all I want to say today. <laughs> and if you're interested in time surfaces, there's a beautiful paper that shows how you can that tau can be updated permanently while you're working. Because the decay, that, that's what matters. How far in the past it's meaningful for me. And that's uh, it's in the main conference if you're interested. Thank you. Yeah, thanks very much. Any question for Riyadh while we are changing Julia? Yeah, of course. And then to the image as well. Yeah, but what I mean is fundamentally it's two different types of data. Yeah. Of course, you need to review yeah. the technology here and there. Yeah. But the, the way you acquired it is more close to statistics, where the way you acquired it, I'm not talking computing, I'm talking yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but I think the structure is still something else. It's really the spectrum, like what is the meaningful structure? And I have space and time. What is the structure that is going to be the speaker Well, for a vision, I mean, yeah. you want to get close to what the time surface is, but you hear it. I still don't like the time surface. So people hear it. I mean, you have a structure. If you smash it, you won't have anything. In the dialect, the several papers around 2000 arguing that uh, grammars and structures and all that are actually themselves statistics. Uh, so everything can be done with occurrences or distances either in time or in space. And uh, uh, actually, he argues extremely strongly with examples from Chomsky, etc. Et I think what you show is more geometry, not really the, the structure of it. It's more geometry, like a more continuous geometry. So if you look at what structure means in its definition, structure means you understand the components and how those components relate to each other. So if I have a cat walking and I'm allowed to understand how the components unfold over time, I have an idea of how these parts relate over time. Therefore, I have access to the structure. If I go in there and I snap it, all I have is appearance. It's that it was. So all, that's all I, I want to have the most. All I'm saying is, Structure. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Let's let's continue later with the panel discussion. Yeah, it's not really. Yeah, it's, it's just structure. We continue later with the questions. Now we have uh, Kathy Schumann. She is a uh, professor at the University of Tennessee, and she has a very nice review paper on uh, neuromorphic computing. Um, she leads the the group on neuromorphic computing there at the University of Tennessee. Yeah, thanks very much. Thank you, and thank you for the invitation. So um, I'm going to tell you about a workflow for low-power neuromorphic computing for event-based vision. Our group is just getting started with event-based vision, but you'll get a feel for the sorts of things that we're most interested in and what we want to apply event-based vision for within those constructs over the course of the presentation. So I am part of a much larger neuromorphic effort at the University of Tennessee. We're the 10 lab neuromorphic computing research group. And as you all could tell from Kaushik's, Kaushik's talk, or if you were in the neuromorphic community, we're reinventing everything in the neuromorphic computing stack, top to bottom across the field. And we have all of those components at Tennessee that we're working on simultaneously. So we're really interested in doing application algorithm hardware co-design. So all across the stack um, with the folks who are part of our research group. So I definitely want to acknowledge them. Um, 
this work is definitely not mine alone. Uh, a, a lot of different people have contributed. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about what our group does, you can visit our website. Mm -hmm. So one of the big things that we focus on is two of the, the leads of our group, me and uh, Jim Plank, are computer scientists. So we are coming at neuromorphic computing from a computer science perspective. I'm more of a machine learning person. Jim absolutely hates machine learning. Um, so we are a good pairing. He does more of our system software and actually makes what all we do in our group work. So to do our neuromorphic computing research, we've developed our 10 lab neuromorphic software framework where the core of that framework implements APIs that allow users to interact with neuromorphic hardware and with algorithms and applications. And part of that software core is that common interface, the API that we define, but we also include input and output coding. So if you have problems that aren't natively event or spike based that will translate that data into spikes and uh, output coding that will take spikes coming out of a network and, and turn it back into decisions or actions or whatever you need for your application. And we also have network compilation tools that allow you to compose different networks. Now, why do we do this? It's because there's a ton of different work in neuromorphic computing that is largely disconnected from each other. So we have this core to allow us to connect different hardware implementations, both those that we're developing at the University of Tennessee. Um, we do a lot of memoristive based neuromorphic implementations. We also look at some spintronic based neuromorphic implementations. Um, as well as fully digital CMOS uh, hardware. But we also work with collaborators who are developing neuromorphic systems made out of some standard materials, including uh, an architecture that was developed at Oak Ridge National Lab that's uh, currently implemented on an FPGA, so a fully digital neuromorphic system called Caspian, but also people who are making neuromorphic systems out of like biomimetic materials and superconducting optoelectronics. Very different behaviors, very different um, ways that those implementations actually run and what applications they would be good for. Um, but we have a common API so that I don't have to care about how those hardware implementations are different. I can interact with them from the computer science level without changing my code. Um, and we also integrate with a bunch of external simulators through our software so we can evaluate on, um, on aspects that we don't have implemented in physical hardware. Now we're up to the region that I live in on this chart. So um, we also implement a wide variety of different algorithms that are compatible with our 10 lab software framework, and we're always interested in integrating more. Um, we have a couple of evolutionary based approaches, which I'll talk more about in a moment. We have uh, currently one back propagation based approach, although we're working on implementing additional. Um, Whetstone is a, is a technique that was developed by researchers at Sandia National Labs. We have a supervised STDP implementation. We have a neuromorphic decision tree um, and random forest implementation, and we do reservoir computing as well. And then we have a bunch of different applications um, on top of the algorithm space. And so the goal with our framework is for, a, for us to be able to plug and play, to make this modular so that um, you as a researcher can come in at any level of the stack and use whichever hardware platform you want to use. If you're developing an algorithm or if you're an ap application developer and you do not want to have to worry about algorithms or hardware, you can plug right into that level as well. So. I'm going to focus on one of our algorithms. This is one that I developed starting when, uh, during my dissertation research. So we've been working on it for over a decade, which is an evolutionary optimization based approach. Now, uh, Kaushik mentioned this morning that uh, it's not always easy to train spiking neural networks um, to do tasks for you. Um, so we took an approach to target uh, designing sparse, recurrent, and usually pretty small um, spiking neural networks for real-world neuromorphic applications. And this is an evolutionary-based approach where we assume that somebody has, has given us a hardware implementation. I don't care what that hardware implementation is as long as it has neurons and synapses on it. Um, and they have a problem that they want us to solve. And they come to us with that, that combo hardware and application. And what EONS will do is it will attempt to design a spiking neural network for the hardware platform to solve that problem. So the way that it works is we assume we have no idea what the network uh, to solve that problem should look like. And frequently we have no idea what the network should look like to solve that problem. Um, so we start with a bunch of randomly initialized network solutions, different numbers of neurons, different levels of connectivity, different parameters. And then we evaluate and rank them. So if you happen to have an actual physical hardware implementation, you can use uh, hardware in the loop here, load the networks onto the hardware, run them on an application, 
we're usually doing a simulation of both the hardware and the application here to get a score for how well all of these networks are performing, which allows us to do selection to preferentially select better performing individuals to serve as parents while still maintaining diversity. And then we do reproduction operations to produce children. Our reproduction operations do random mutations. They do crossover, which takes two parents and um, uh, recombines them to produce children that inherit characteristics from both of those parents. And then we repeat this process. So we use EONS a lot for a lot of different reasons. We use it because it works across all sorts of different hardware platforms. It doesn't care how your neuron works or how your synapse works. It will attempt to operate within whatever characteristics and constraints you have. It will work across a bunch of different application domains. You just need a score to tell how well your network is doing on that application. Um, and you can combine it with different uh, training and learning approaches as well. Perhaps you just want to use EONS to learn the structure of the network and use something else to learn the parameters. There are two major problems with EONS, one I'm going to mention now. Um, it can be slow to converge, but you can make it go faster if you happen to have more compute resources or if you are actually using hardware in the loop. And the second one I'm going to come back to in a moment. So I wanted to give you an idea of the types of problems that we go after in our group. Our group really focuses on control applications because we see that that's an important space where Neuromorphic can make a contribution, where you want to have real-time interaction with the environment, where you need something that's extremely low power. Um, and this is a, a place where we think Neuromorphic can really contribute. So we always start with toys, y'all, because that's like the easiest place to start. And, and I will note that this entire project that I'm about to tell you about was led by two high school students. Um, so we also start small so that we can integrate it up to, to higher levels. So this is an example of the sort of project we do. Um, small scale autonomous vehicle control, particularly autonomous race car control. So this is literally a one tenth scale car. We did not develop the specification of the car that came from a, a community called the F one tenth community. Everything you see in this picture is to spec for that F-110 build, except for the uh, FPGA-based neuromorphic system, the microcathian that zip tied to the top of the car, you know, as you do in real time. Um, that's not normal for the F-110 community. Neuromorphic is not usually part of the, the story here. But this we thought was a good opportunity to showcase what neuromorphic could actually provide. So what do we do for these sorts of applications? We, for our control applications, typically train in simulation. That F110 community provided a simulation environment. Um, our sensing platform here, here is LiDAR, the LiDAR that's sitting on top of the car. And we needed a spiking neural network that would take the LiDAR information as input and make decisions about the control of the car, the steering angle and the speed. We train in simulation and then we deploy to the actual physical environments. And that deployment step is always really important to what we do because we're thinking about deployment. We're thinking about what the constraints are of the hardware um, that we're deploying to. What are the needs of the application in terms of latency? Those are important components. The deployment piece is, is critical to what we're doing. So this is what the simulated environment looks like um, on the right of the slide here. And one example of an EONS network that was involved for this task is shown on the left, and this is a video which hopefully y'all are going to be able to see play. One thing I want you to notice about the network, uh, and this network is controlling the car, which you probably can't see. Um, there is a purple dot that's driving around the simulator there. That's not your eye just like glitching or anything. There is a little purple car driving around there. But what I want you to notice really is the network. This network is very small. We're talking about under 100 neurons, actually under 200 synapses. Um, so very, very small, sparse, highly recurrent. Inputs to inputs connected to each other, outputs to outputs connected to each other. The top row are our inputs, the bottom row are our outputs. Um, and then we have that one lone hidden neuron that it needed for processing, but it's in there, you know, just because just it needed it. These are the types of networks that we are targeting. Very small, very sparse, very, very recurrent to solve tasks like this one, driving the car around the track. This is how it actually translates. The network that we train in the simulated environment actually running physically on the hardware that, again, is zip tied to the top of the car there, um, driving around the track. And I will note one of the things I'm proudest of about this, we built this whole workflow to make this easy for people who are unfamiliar with Neuromorphic to step in and start using it. This was a project that was led by high school students, two high school uh, seniors, um, both of whom are now freshmen at MIT, so not like 
normal high school students, but high school students nonetheless. So I want you to, to remember that. So we love to do physical demonstrations of the work that we're doing because it provides those constraints that we're trying to operate within. So we wanted to bring that to event-based processing as well. And this is still in progress, but I'll, I'll tell you where we're at by the end of the talk. So we have seen eons do well across a wide variety of different control tasks. That car was just one of them. We've done a lot of things in robotics. We've done um, a lot of things in other real world applications, including real time fuel injection control and internal combustion engines. We've seen that it can produ produce very small sparse recurrent neural networks. Here's the second issue about eons. It doesn't work well when you have very large input spaces. So in order to apply EONS to applications like event-based processing, we need some way to reduce the size of the observation. So one of our very smart PhD students, uh, Charlie Rizzo, whose picture is up in the, at the top of the slide here, has developed a way to do downsampling in a neuromorphic way. So we're keeping everything on the neuromorphic chip. We're going straight from events into a neuromorphic chip that is going to do the downsampling for us that is then going to go into a, a network that EONS is going to train to solve a particular task. So this approach, Charlie is calling spiking threshold pooling. It works a lot in terms of the high level and the parameters that you're thinking about as pooling does in, in traditional artificial neural networks. We have a chip that's defined by its size and its stride. And of course, it strides across um, the field of view. And if you are have an overlap at the end, we pad it with zeros um, if it goes outside the region. Here is the stride of five. So of course, then we do have overlapping chips. And then we have another parameter here, which is our threshold. And that threshold tells us how many events within that chip do we need to actually consider that region to fire as a region. So in this case, the threshold is three. We're considering both positive and negative polarity events as events here, but you could pick or choose one or the other, um, and the same sort of approach would apply. In this case, with the threshold of three, of these eight different chips, just zero, five, and seven would fire. Now, in order to actually do this, because remember, we're always thinking about the hardware that we're going to deploy to. We know we want to do all of this pre-processing neuromorphically, and we have to implement this on a neuromorphic hardware implementation. And we're starting with one implementation that we are developing at the University of Tennessee, but this can work across a bunch of different hardware implementations. The networks might look slightly, di slightly different depending on the hardware characteristics, but the Ravens model is the one we're using here. It has an integrate and fire neuron model with leak, so leaky integrate and fire, although that leak is programmable. Um, we have programmable SCDP. We're not using that um, in this implementation, and we have a novel refractory period. Um, so the way the leak works, you can set that per neuron in the hardware. It's linear leak, so very simple, subtracted from the neuron's potential at each cycle. The refractory period is inspired by a biological neuron's refractory period and is programmable as well at the neuron level and has both absolute and relative refractory period. So the absolute refractory period, it cannot accumulate any charge or change the potential during the absolute refractory period, which is the key feature that we're going to leverage here. So Charlie has developed what he's calling counting networks. These are hand-tooled spiking neural networks that you can deploy to neuromorphic systems that will do this neuromorphic downsampling. So in this case, the networks are defined by the rows, the columns, and the threshold in the shipping methodology. And we also have an additional parameter, which is the time coalescing value. It's called F because it's almost turning them into frames, but we're not using the time, losing the timing resolution. We then feed them into networks. Three the counting networks, a general counting network, a pixel counting network, and an optimized network. This is what they actually look like. Were you expecting to see a low-level details of a specking neural network in this? Get ready. Here we go. Okay, so we have input neurons. They're in green. Uh, our output neuron is in red. Here, hidden neurons shown in blue. And we have two different types of synapses. One is excitatory, one is inhibitory, and they have two different synaptic delay values associated with them. We also have our output neuron having an absolute refractory period. So this is an example of a three by three um, region that we would be looking at. And here's an example of how this network would actually work. Suppose the three leftmost inputs are firing. We have an event at each of those at a particular time, time zero. And it generates spikes on the outgoing synapses for each of those input neurons. The output neuron at, at time one is going to get those three values those three incoming spikes, 
which meets its threshold, that's going to cause it to fire. And Raven's meeting the threshold cause it, causes it to fire. And then that neuron is going to enter its refractory period, which means that it, it's going to ignore all of the inhibitory spikes that are coming into it. This is only important because this is saying, okay, three spikes happened. I'm firing. Um, I'm ignoring everything else that hits me during my absolute refractory period. This network is now ready to be used again on a new region. If you don't happen to have three that fire at any one time, so let's say we have two here, this is where those inhibitory connections come in because the potential in that output neuron is gonna be two. We still have two spikes that are coming in that are inhibitory. Those are gonna hit and cause that neuron's potential to go back to zero. And now the network is ready to be used again. So this can be used in a streaming fashion as long as you are um, have, have your, your uh, neural working system running fast enough that it can collect data in that streaming way. Very similar to the counting network it is our pixel counting network where it's just gonna look to see how many of the individual pixels are actually firing, not how many events are happening. Um, the only thing that's different here is that input neurons, once they fire, enter a refractory period during which they can't receive anything else. So it's just counting how many of the individual pixels actually fire. There's also a version of our, uh, our network that's optimized for fewer neurons. In this case, we're leaking out the charge on the output neuron so that we don't have to have those inhibitory connections that are going in to re reset the potential to zero. Now, why do y'all care? Why do we go through all this stuff? You remember at the beginning when I mentioned that Jim Plank hates machine learning? He likes building networks like these that do something that are useful to machine learning, but that he understands exactly what's happening in the network that he has handled. So I will skip the examples here and go straight in. So we wanted to start, again, we like to start with toy examples. Now, there's not a lot out in the world, and correct me if I'm wrong, if there is, please tell me because we would like to know. There's not a lot of simulation control environments that give you event-based sensing data back through them. Carla, one of the autonomous driving simulators, that one does, but that was too advanced for us to start with. We want to start small. So Charlie, uh, same PhD student who developed the downsampling technique, um, last summer developed a wrapper for the Atari uh, uh, 2600 games. There's a simulation environment, the arcade learning environment. He built a wrapper for that that converts the frames of the um, various Atari games into events. This was a good place for us to start in testing these different approaches and to do real-time control using event-based sensing. So we did a case study um, where we applied this to Pong. Uh, and the, the screen here for Pong is uh, 33,600 pixels. We use the um, AL uh, Arcade Learning Environment EDC library that Charlie developed to represent the game screen as collections of events. Um, there's a paper on this and the GitHub is freely available. So please check that out if you want to play with it. Um, turns those into events. We actually cropped the screen to only include the necessary pieces. We cropped off the player paddle and the scores, but you could easily leave those in and it wouldn't change the performance of the system. Now we can apply the event counting network as our spiking threshold pooling layer. Our initial pass does a 10 by 10 um, coalescing just over one, so not really doing time coalescing at all, threshold of eight and a stride of five. And you can see the regions that are picking up there of those different events. This takes us from a 180 by 140 down to a 36 by 28 input space. That's actually still pretty big for Eon. So we do another, another pass, which is the blue squares that you're seeing that are picking up on. It's actually looking at the green uh, regions, just the spikes that are coming out of the green. Um, and that is telling us where things are happening within the screen. So we are using this to do downsampling. You can also use this to define regions of interest on your problem and help get rid of some of the noise in your background. So this gets us down to an eight by six. This is 48 inputs that is now much more uh, feasible for eons to deal with. Remember again, hairball of a network that eons produces very, uh, very sparse, highly recurrent. This is the very sparse, highly recurrent network that takes those 48 inputs after downsampling and actually plays Pong. So we have the 48 inputs Lot, no hidden in this case, lots of recurrent, um, and we just have the two outputs up and down on the paddle. This was the network that Eons trained to uh, play Pong. In this case, what's happening here is it's taking the frames, 
making them into events, doing the downsampling, then passing them through that network. And remember that all of the downsampling is happening neuromorphically. So it's taking straight the events from your camera. You could feed those directly into your neuromorphic implementation that would do all of the pre-processing for you and then actually come up with the control path. So to give you a, a quick summary of what we've been looking at here, we are training spiking ne neural networks with eons on simulated events using this uh, spiking threshold pooling to do our downsampling. And we have shown that you can implement this entirely on the neuromorphic implementation. And we have actually evaluated this on hardware on a single monolithic network. Some of the ongoing work, we currently have a set of undergraduate students because undergraduate students love video games doing this on a bunch of different Atari games. Um, and we're using the provided method by the AL environment for episodic stochasticity. We are also using time multiplexing to reduce the size of the downsampling layers um, in our physical hardware implementation so we can use smaller neuromorphic hardware to actually do this. And we are also actively using this approach to apply to other event-based camera data sets and problems, including a paper at the upcoming ICONS conference on uh, the application of this approach to the uh, gesture data set that was also showed earlier. On the whole, what I want y'all to take away from this is that we're really working to develop a complete software framework that allows people to come in and do neuromorphic computing, even if they only have expertise in one of the areas of the stack, and to do it on real world applications, although we always start with those toy applications. We've implemented this uh, neuromorphic downsampling approach, which allows for orders of magnitude reduction in the observation space, and we've successfully applied it across a couple of different event-based camera applications. If you want to hear more about that uh, gesture uh, application using our downsampling approach, or just want to engage with other components of the neuromorphic community, I'm shamelessly plugging the ICONS conference because I'm the general chair. It's August 1st through the 3rd, Santa Fe, New Mexico. Uh, check out our website for more information on that. With that, I will thank our uh, collaborators and our funding um, and give you a hint as to what we're working on, hopefully, by icons. Um, I don't know if you can see the camera pointed at the TV with the Atari um, on the space here, but we're working on the actual physical demonstration with the camera, the neuromorphic hardware, and the Atari being played directly by the neuromorphic system. So that's it. If you have questions, I'm happy to take them. Thank you. World-class research happening in this photo. We definitely don't have the Atari just for people to play in the lab. Can you get close to the microphone, Julia, please? Okay, great. So I wonder what is the path for scaling this up, you know, so that you can use the car simulation and, and real world and next aspect like that. Absolutely. So there, there's two paths. One of the, the things that you will have noticed, we have those hyperparameters of the downsampling approach, the size of the chip, the stride, all of those. Those are the same sort of hyperparameters you would encounter in a deep learning approach too. We're doing hyperparameter tuning to evaluate those. We're also developing um, variations on this that do things besides counting and um, pixel counting and event counting to be able to to scale up the other thing from the hardware perspective is we're doing that time multiplexing so that the networks themselves don't blow up in size so that we can actually do them in real time so sliding you know a fewer numbers of networks over the the image instead of duplicating yeah I have a question. your networks look really funny did you encounter funny networks you can tell us about oh my god the the evolved networks yeah every one of our evolved networks is funny in some its own unique way. Um, we have done some try to explainability studies on smaller networks when they even get up to the, the larger, um, this one, it becomes a lot harder to try to understand what's going on. But one of the things we've seen for input to input connectivity is that um, eons will often evolve networks that are basically doing a function call that if you got this combination of inputs here and it went to this output, it'll do a function call to those inputs to reduce having to <clears throat> duplicate the same structure multiple the times. What you, what you end up doing is basically as if you have areas. You know what I mean? Yeah. That's what I really like here. It's really gorgeous. I'm really curious to see. I, these networks are super fun, and anybody that wants to analyze them, we have literally millions of them. So if anybody wants to play with them, we've got them. Collaborate with us. Please reach out. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
But is it accidental that the density of the connections is heavier at the top, or every time you get the moment you got the same high density? Not yeah, every time you evolve yeah. it, you can get very different connectivity. But different that's people. topographic, right? Yeah. It's suppressive. Did you see the elements different? That every network that you evolve will look different. We are looking for commonality across them to try to predict which pieces are functionally required to have a particular So, the final speaker in session one is Andre Van Schaik. He's from Western Sydney University. Uh, he's a professor there, and he is the director of the International Center for Neuromorphic Systems, which I believe has many efforts in developing neuromorphic uh, technology. So, Greg Cohen is also part of that, and many others. All right. <laughs> Let's allow you to share my screen. Until it's clear. Yeah, don't leave. Yeah, no, I gotta leave again, I guess. Oh, I guess I'm not gonna be able to do Thought I had it all set up nice and quick. Yeah, I just join, won't join by audio. I don't need audio for this. Okay. Yes, continue. No, I it. By default, is recording. Yeah. yeah. Share screen. Let's stop on the share. No, sure, sound. No, I'm not using sound in this. All good to go? Yeah. Good to go. Okay. Take my glasses off so I can see you again. It's a, it's a problem. What's international about the center? Ah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Uh, wondering. <laughs> so we're um, the international part at the moment is, is a lot of partnerships that we have with various institutions. We have a partnership with Zurich, with University of Manchester, with the Indian Institute okay. of Science, with Browning and, and so forth. And I'm actually looking further towards that to create some international branches, actually, of ICNS at, at other universities. So it's growing. Um, we'll get there. Oh, well, yes. Not many people are um, in Australia. So to, I wanted to talk today about what are we doing with event-based cameras in the real world? And really, it's an excuse. It's more of a highlights reel to show you some cool videos that we've made with these event-based cameras, because um, I'm really proud of some of the ones that we have. So in terms of applications of event-based vision, um, one that we've been working on and that some of you may be familiar with is using them for satellite tracking um, to determine where satellites are. This is um, a setup from 2017, so about five, six, six years ago. And I hope you saw that thing shoot through in the top, uh, In the, in the top left there. We, so we had an event-based camera, a, a fairly old one, on the back of a telescope. We were just tuning it to see if we could get the biases right and whether we could see anything. And we were about to point it at the start. And something shot through. And, hey, what's that? And that was a satellite. And that was our first glance of a satellite and that we could catch us with, with, with them. Yeah. In plain day, right? This was during the day, yeah. Yeah, and um, so and when we then started looking at actually tracking a satellite, so here this is a rocket body that we're tracking. On the left is the footage from the event-based camera. On the right is like a, a time uh, cube of it. And then because we're tracking a rocket body, the stars that we go past will shoot through, and they'll all shoot through in this in the same direction. Um, so this was at the, the very beginning that we were looking at that. And 
when we started this work, I didn't realize um, why you would want to track satellites all the time. I thought satellites are like planets and stars, you know, once you know where they are in orbit, you can predict a thousand years ahead and you know that they're going to be there. That's actually not true at all, particularly the lower Earth orbit ones. Um, they're much smaller than planets and stars, therefore they're much easier to move about. So they're subject to solar winds. Um, the low Earth orbit ones, they get some atmosphere from the Earth, still some effects there. Um, and their orbits, they're only good for about 24 hours, basically. And because you're looking through a telescope, you're basically looking through a straw at the, at the sky, you see a very tiny part um, of the sky. And if you're pointing the telescope in the wrong direction, because your orbit prediction is wrong, then you won't see it. And then good luck finding where it is again. So that's why every day, everything that's going around the Earth needs to be observed at least twice, basically. And so there's a business to be made there. And um, currently, optically, it's done like this. So here you take a video or um, uh, basically a picture with an astronomical camera. And then five seconds later, you take another picture with a long exposure time. That's why the stars are moving. And five seconds later, you take another picture. It's like zero to motion, right? Yeah. yeah. So, well, in this case, you're, you're, we're actually tracking the satellite. So can you spot it? No. So let me see if I can do this here. If I grab it, can you see it now? Yeah. Right, that's the trick, right? One of the things for us, at least for the eye, you have to move things. Well, and then you see the static point. Well, it actually moves a little bit. You, you, you can see it. But... The right then, right? Yeah, right in the center here, right? Oh, 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 I see. I thought it was that yeah. right spot. Yeah. The, the entire game up there is not to have your satellite shine, basically, right? Yeah. Yeah. So that that's... Um, so we developed that into what we call our astrocyte. Um, nice pun on the name. Um, which is basically a converted shipping container, sliding roof, garage door opener for the roof, um, a lift in there to lift the telescope up. And then um, the telescope com comes out and we do our observations remotely and automatically as you, you will see in a moment. So this is one that we deployed in Australia um, in the outback. Um, it, it's fairly flat around there. It's a nice dark area too, so you don't get much light pollution around there. And the nice thing about these is you can deploy them anywhere. There's a whole industry made around transporting shipping containers around the world. Um, so you can you can take it, drop it, set it up in a day, start doing observations with it. And that's where the event-based camera gives us an advantage is we don't need such a stable base as for those photos that you saw. For those, you need astronomical camera in an astronomical observatory that's on a big concrete slab, usually on top of a hill somewhere. Um, and everybody knows too where those observatories are here. Any shipping container that, uh, around the country could actually be an observatory, um, which is also an advantage for them. So we've developed the software. This is sped up, but to operate it remotely to do these observations. Um, you know, we task it remotely. At the moment, we're running it constantly. That one in the desert is doing about 500 observations every night. Um, we're recording that data. Obviously, when it's cloudy or raining, we can't use it. Um, but luckily, the weather in the desert is quite good. So um, we can... The green streets there? Down the bottom. Yeah. They're um, a subset of where the satellites are projected onto the sky. Uh, from the data. Okay. Yes. I keep asking Greg, do you see weird stuff up there? <laughs> um, not so much from from here, no. But we we do see some weird stuff. You'll you'll, you'll see some later when 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 you're up there. <laughs> yeah. No. From here, um, I mean, unless you call like two satellites meeting up and and parting again, things like that, which are exercises that have particularly in the geostationary. Well, so they do refueling, right? Yeah. yeah. 
um, things like that, or like spying on each other and, and stuff like that. So low Earth orbit, for those that don't know, it's about 400 kilometers above ground. Uh, whereas the geostationary ones, the ones that are where your TV stations and so on are all, are, that's about 36 to 40,000 kilometers above ground. So that's uh, a lot further, right? A hundred times further. So we've also written the processing of the event. So we like, and you, you notice both objects are moving, but we use the stars. As, as our refer as our point of reference and then then we localize the object that is our target with respect to the stars so the stars are our stationary reference frame and then we can tell exactly where these these objects are um, we extract this automatically in the recordings that we do now um, so we don't need human processing in the loop um, and we have two of those and we're about to build a third and we're about to spin this out into a company that will start delivering this as a commercial service um that's we're hoping this that this company will be up and running sort of august this year so that's one application area now let's take this to space itself go the other way well how do you get to space um with a rocket not this one it's a sounding rocket I wouldn't get you very, very far, but still, this is a NASA launch, the first one, um, or at least the first one in a very, very long time in, in Australia, um, from the north of Australia. And on the right, you can see with the standard camera, it is overexposed for most of the part that you're interested in once that rocket starts. Um, so the rocket is almost gone out of the field of view before this camera recovers from that. Whereas on the left, you can even see, nope, I just missed it, so I'm going to go back. You, you can see the stabilizing rockets fire as, 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 as this, this, the second um, thing. So when it, when it reaches the, the, the top up, up, up here, you'll see that happen in, this, in, the, in the slow motion. And look at the amount of detail you get just from the event-based camera, you know, in this launch from the exhaust that you get. Can you point to the one of the cables? Yeah, so it, it's it's about um, here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, the, the side jets, they make them spin, mm -hmm. and that stabilizes them in flight. So now you can't... Hang on. Go to the next one. So you can't set that up right before the launch, like the, the last few hours before the launch, you're not allowed anywhere near um, the rocket. So you set it up hours ahead and you can monitor your event rate and speed up and slow down if you want. Like we're slowing down here because we saw a nice shooting star that you'll see in a moment in this hour long footage, there you go. Um, wasn't what we were looking for, obviously. And then you speed it up again um, because there's nothing nothing much interesting is happening. And you look at the, the event rate, you see clouds come by, they change the event rate a bit because of course they, they generate some events for you. You have the megapixel, right? It, yeah, this is this is the Prophecy Gen 4 yeah. sensor, yeah. So those are clouds going by or something? Those are clouds going by. And you can see here the event rate that the rocket is going to launch in a moment. So we'll slow it down. And you can see that actually the event rate looks like it's saturating right at the start of the launch. Again, you saw the sounding, uh, the, the spinning rockets at the end. And here at the end, you, you'll also see the, the second stage firing after. But by then we're covered in some, and you see some bits shooting off. Um, I hope they were supposed to shoot off those bits. I'm, I'm not really sure. So here it extinguishes and then there's, a, there's another one coming there. There. So a second firing and then, then we speed it up again. Okay, so we look at rocket launches with this. We think that's quite a nice use of these event-based cameras to extract information from the data. Um, but I was saying, let's take this to space. So um, in um, December 2018, we launched um, 
this uh, Falconera uh, payload to, to space. Um, it's on the International uh, Space Station on the Columbus module. Um, those are two Davis 240 cameras, are so quite old ones um, that we put up there. We, we wanted to start with cameras that we understood really well. On the left, you see an image um, taken from a high definition camera up there that is mounted near where um, our equipment is mounted. On the right is a rendering that we make from the data we get from um, from the event-based camera look, that's looking down. So we, I said we have two up there, one's looking down, one's looking forward at the horizon. So this is the downward looking camera. And as the space station moves, of course, you're scanning the earth like you're peeling an apple basically, and, and you're, you can render an, an image around that. Um, so here's, here's an example of, of doing that. Um, so this is above, um, Egypt, so Alexandria down here, down the bottom, or I'd say here, Suez canals through here. And, and as we go, we can build up that image and, and overlay it on, on the Google map or take it away now, the, the features that we see. And so this is taken at night, so we mainly see the lights of the cities here, but we can also see um, the other one, the previous one, this was taken during the day. Um, and you can see some, some cloud co co um, coverage in there as well. So um, if you want to see more um, about the downward um, looking camera and the things we do, Sami who's here in the audience, he has a, he has a poster um, about this. And, um, today that um, you can look at. Um, so this is the raw data from the RAM recording, which, which is looking forward at the horizon. And you go like, mm, that's not all that interesting, is it? It's not a lot to, to see, you, you think, right? And I must apologize, by the way, I forgot to do that at the start for the people on Zoom, because these type of event-based images the video encoders for Zoom really don't work very well for these type of images. So you, you get really poor data. But in this case, there isn't really a lot to see, at least at first instance. We saw as well, right? You saw some streaks down the bottom maybe and so on. Um, but if we do what Riyadh was talking about, a bit of time surfacing and the other trick, the one that I did with the astro, uh, photography where you jiggle it back and forth. We actually do call that jiggle. So we time surface and jiggle, and this is what you see. So you see features from the earth down below, the horizon is here. You see the stars go up and there's a satellite there that you see swooping through. So we can, we can label those, see if you see, so that's the stars all going up, giving us a nice reference frame for, the, for this data. Even something else, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we're still missing one. Look, there's one up here that we haven't laid. Oh, didn't man. Oh, right up here at the beginning of the recording. It's another one that shoots out a frame. Um, don't, no idea why so many, because most of the time we don't see, see this many, but this is a there's a really nice, nice recording for it. The other thing you recognize from the day was 240 is this uh, bright line, dark line, bright line, dark line, bright line, dark line. Um, that, that's still there and you can process all this out and a lot of fixed pattern noise that you can see in, the, in, in this, right? That I haven't processed here. Again, of course, you can subtract fixed pattern noise reasonably well. It's yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, so it went up there as this nominal scientific mission um, to put it up there is to look at lightning and particularly what are called sprites. And sprites are lightning that goes from the cloud to the upper atmosphere rather than down to ground or between clouds. Um, we can see lightning, as you can see here in this footage. Again, it's processed the same way. We're jiggling it back and forth. The time surface is a bit shorter here, so it's a little harder to see the stars, but you can still see the stars move up and down in, in, in this image. 
But there, the resolution really is not that great um, on these cameras. And the event lasts very briefly, so it, it's, a, it's a real issue for us. For looking down, scanning the ground, yes, the camera has low resolution, but because you detect the edges with very high temporal resolution in the direction that you're moving, you can actually build up a picture with quite high resolution. Across, you can't, because there's nothing you can do. Um, but with lightning, we can't do the same, same trick. So now, let's do this on, on the ground here with a better camera. So we, uh, well, a more modern camera, let's be nice about it. Um, and we look at, record a lightning strike. And you can also do this with a high fr uh, rate frame-based camera. Um, which will set you back about $100,000 US um, and weighs about eight kilograms and can record for like five seconds or so and then its buffer is full. And power is thousands. Oh yeah, it's a, <laughs> and it costs a lot of power. So now you can, we can slow this down 400 times. You see the raindrops falling nicely. You can watch the lightning form. Um, you can track the leaders of the, of, of the lightning and so on. Um, you know, and really, really studied uh, the lightning. Now, if you want to get really bored by lightning, if you didn't think it was possible, but this is um, slow down 20,000 times, basically. So it's like a, a, every microsecond is an update, basically, to, to this frame. You can see it's kind of matrixy, right? The rain has stopped falling, um, but everything else is like this lightning is moving a little little bit and so you can really track the points of, of the, the lightning um, with these cameras quite well. So with these newer versions we can see lightning much better. So we're taking um, two of those up to the International Space Station next year um, that's being built at the moment so that's going to be Falcon Odin um, and next week is the engineering design review for for that one um, in Colorado. And the difference, well, it's a much bigger package. It will have steerable mirrors in it, so we can adjust where it's looking. Um, that's a big change and a big thing for space. Like when you're on a satellite, having moving pieces is really becomes an issue because when, when you move one of these things, the International Space Station moves. It's a little bit, but you know, it's like there's, there's nothing holding it in, in place if you don't do it right. So, well, where's the camera here? And what are the mirrors? So, so, the cameras are down here. The mirrors are steering the field of view. And then there's a zoomable lens on there for the, for the ground looking camera as well. So, we can, um, you know, change the, the zoom. So, the difference is that crosswise at the moment, Falcon Neuro on the ground has a, pic, uh, a resolution about 250 meters. As I said, in the direction that we're scanning, it's better than that, but in, in that direction it's 250 meters. And with this, this setup will be down to six meters um, resolution that we, we should get. And so that's going up um, next year. And this is, um, a model of the of, of the payload basically so you get an idea of the of the size of what is going on there. So talking about steerable and zoomable optics, we got a chance to fly this camera too on a on a Cessna with a very nice gimbal on it with some nice optics. And this is just, again, show, showing off a video. We don't really know what to do with this yet, but um, clearly you can get some some nice data of, of, of your cars here. The Tesla is flying, but it's being stabilized. It's stabilized by this gimbal. Yeah, it's incredible, huh? Yeah. Look at, at, the, at this zoom. It does the clear, basically, better clear. Yeah, it's a, it's a... Yeah, yeah, traffic camera. 
probably like you check the tail length or something like that and it tells you about the speed because of the time surface decay yeah if you set it right you can can, can do that just right so and let's see if you can guess what this is a bridge no a building an opera house Somebody will get it. <laughs> Driving range. Does anybody play golf? Multi-level. Multi-level driving range. Yeah. I can show you a beautiful people. So there's things that you see you see so shooting through. Well, not the the one that went really fast. They don't hit them that hard, but there you can see the golf ball shooting out. This uh, top golf at, in Colorado. No? There's one where you, you see bullets passing by, no? Yeah, we don't have that oh, here. I, I didn't put 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 yeah, the put, the put the bullet uh, yeah. um, stuff in here. So, and really, those were well. I have one last video that I'll just let play in the background while I take um, questions for the in, in the interest of time. Um, again, it's like a guessing game, this one, to see if you can figure out what you're looking at here. And I can take questions in the meantime, if you want. I have a question I was wondering about. Oh, can you, can you go to the mic? Yeah. <laughs> on, this, on this deep valley, why do people care about these spikes and not uh, ground lightning for forest fires, which are a big business in Australia? They do, they do too. And so we've got another project which is looking at tracking ground lightning from satellites as well. But is it somehow easier to see the sprites or? Well, so it's hard to see the sprites from the ground because they're above the clouds. You need to be, you need to be above the clouds to, to see them. And so the only footage we have of them is from these phantom cameras on like a chartered aircraft that, that, that is doing it. Of this event based camera, a 1280 by 720 pixels. So it's HD, but just one megapixel. Okay. Yeah. If I understood correctly, you are looking at uh, stars and uh, satellites from day. Yeah. Well, we may, at the moment, we're mainly, we're mainly recording at night because it's a lot easier. And uh, how do we see satellites at night? Uh, they, they the satellites at night, so the ones that are geostationary, they still get lit by the sun all night long because they never enter the Earth's shadow, well, rarely. And, uh, and uh, the lower Earth orbit ones, we have to capture them at just after dusk and be just before dawn, basically, when they still get lit by the sun. And there's a couple of hours on each side where before they enter. The, the shadow of the earth. Is there a way to remotely or automatically assemble or biases? Uh, because you might be recording at different uh, illumination conditions and and at, at low light conditions, it's really very noisy, right? So is there a way to deal with that remotely when you use the bad up there? Um, so we can change the biases. It's not done automatically. Um, we can, we need to upload it and the communication is not there's not an internet uh, site for the International Space Station that you can go to and, and change it. So it's a, um, it goes around the Earth in 90 minutes. So it, we, we have an uplink every uh, one hour and a half if we need to, or downlink to, to get some data on. Um, and so we can change biases. Um, we don't do that um, very often because it, it, it's a hassle and it's not done automatically. And so all this is done with the footage that you saw from the International Space Station. Same settings, day or night, basically. Okay. The maximum number of events that we can see. Um, I need to. Check that actually. If that's uh, yeah, where where it where it saturates. Um, actually, 
Christoph, you know what the maximum rate is of that one, right? No, no, not this one. Yeah. Yeah, I'd need to. This is 10, 10 million, maybe? Yeah, and 20 million, something like that. Good. Thanks. Could we now have also questions that we may have missed from the first speakers? If you don't mind coming, uh, Kausik, Katie, and uh, Andrew. Yeah. 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 I mean, you can stay. Yeah. Stop sharing. Yeah, so before we move on to the positive session, if you have questions for them, please go ahead, get close to the microphone and ask. Yeah. I think. Kausik, I think there is a question for you. Yeah. Yeah, because we just have one. I have the I have a lot of I was wondering, like, uh, how much can we combine the frames and the Right. I mean, I mean, again, it really depends on. Yeah. Well, it depends on on what you want to do with it. And it's a for packing stuff on the ground. So before you go to the poster session, one second. It is, this is the floor map of the poster session. And if you have a paper, you should have a number for your paper.
Oh, yeah, sure. Okay, is it coming through? Okay. The sound is coming through. Yeah. Okay. Yep, yep. I put the mic on. Yeah. Say something, test it. No, no this is okay. Yeah, okay. This is okay. okay, sounds good. The other one is this is the oh, I see. for the Zoom. This is not for the room. Nice. You guys are well set up. The microphones. I guess I won't. 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 I gu
Yeah. We have a panel after this, right? I think it's a bit of a little more count. People wanted to just stand up. Okay. So I'm tempted to remove it and say, you know, five more minutes of questions for each and then no panel. Okay, just let me know. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's what happened like what happened at the nice home because it's two hours people don't yeah, yeah. so then let's make it five minutes. Yeah, no more questions maybe. Costas Sounds good. What will be the session that we began so we must not come? It's on the Daniel is here. Oh, okay. Okay. Is he around? Yeah. Is he here? Yeah. It's oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So he's not in the program, right? Or did you the program? That's great. You guys have lots of at least the room is small, actually. Yeah. But some of the other workshops, he's uh, possibly going to be a zoo or not. Yes, he's still alive. I think he's still sleeping. He's still sleeping. Ah, that's a thing. Which speaker is not coming? Is that all okay? Well, is I Yeah. I call you Hyde, or how do they call you? No, they should call me Hyde. I was thinking this, but yeah, what can I do? <laughs> yeah, people are doing correct them all the time now. Well, I would say the same with my name. I don't correct it. It's a mistake. All right. So welcome back to the afternoon session. Now we have session number three um, on algorithms. And we have the pleasure to have uh, Felix Heide uh, from Princeton University. And uh, he has uh, a very nice work on uh, small lenses. Maybe not yet in the event cameras. But... But uh, we thought that um, it would be relevant to get also the perspective of what could be if, for example, these smaller lenses or more computational imaging was put on combined with an end camera. So. Yeah, exactly. Thank you so much for the for the kind introduction. 
And yes, I'm going to talk about optics in this talk and how we can use optics not only to build really small cameras, but also do some computation in the optics. And because event-based cameras are really exciting in the sense that they can do some computation with this event-based readout, um, this could go perfectly together with some of the stuff that we've been developing over the last couple of years. So hopefully this talk can give you some inspiration and happy to work together on, on combining these two modalities. So why did we look into small lenses? Well, if you look at modern smartphones, and this is from an Apple event from uh, 2018, not really that much has changed, right? So we still build these compound optics for our cameras, which consists of a sequence of um, plastic or glass elements that have a sphere, a spherical, uh, spherical um, surface profiles. And we built these things um, with relatively complex optical simulators um, to, in the end, cram them together to get rid of that camera bump, which is what Steve Jobs wanted. And we still haven't really done that yet. So. What um, I want to talk about in this talk um, is to investigate flat metasurfaces. So metamaterials have been used and, and proposed um, for a long time now um, in order to perform various different optical um, functions. So I want to try to convince you that uh, meta optics such as this one here, which is about a millimeter um, in, in size on, on each length, um, can be potentially um, a replacement for a compound optic. So on a high level, what do we want to do, right? So I showed you this, this compound lens element here from before from the, from the Apple camera. Um, and we want to replace that with one thin layer of a nanophotonic element plus some computation at the back end. So sort of like a low power uh, reconstruction algorithm that's kind of folded into the ISP um, at the back end. And why do we look at metasurfaces and, instead of diffractive optical elements or some other optical elements? Um, that would allow us to shape uh, the wavefronts that are incoming. Well, metasurfaces have this unique property that they um, allow you to, with very fine control, modulate the incoming wavefronts. So you have polarization control um, at very, very high um, spatial resolution. We can build different meta elements very close together um, at wavelength uh, structuring that allows us to, uh, in unprecedented ways, modulate the wavefronts that are incoming. And then if we design them jointly together with computation, that can be exciting because then we can uh, design them in an end-to-end -end fashion. So that's really what we wanna look at. Um, and we're able to significantly outperform uh, some of the uh, heuristic designs that folks have coming up in the past, uh, which is the meta service design on the left side in broadband. This is actually still cheating a little bit here because I'm showing you here captures that have been acquired over screen. I'm gonna show you later um, in the wild captures that we also have also have acquired with these meta surface elements. So we're starting to get them to a level where we can um, look at broadband scenes, uh, which has been tricky in the past because they're so chromatic um, as optical elements. So how do we do this? Right. So we basically build a differentiable architecture that consists of two elements, a differentiable forward model, which is our meta surface forward model. I'm going to go into more detail on that. That's really sort of the key. Um, invention here that we made in order to build um, apertures that are relatively large. So beyond five to 10 microns, but larger. So a millimeter or even now a centimeter is what we're building. And we combine that then with a differentiable deconvolution algorithm um, that back propagates gradients via a physical forward model through the PSF all the way back to the design space. All right, so how does this metasurface uh, forward simulator work? Um, so it basically operates by modeling spatially varying point spread functions as um, a representative for the optical functions that the um, optical system is implementing here. And we wanna implement that with a differentiable full wave simulation is not only prohibitively expensive to, um, uh, to compute, but also is not differentiable at all. So the idea is that we work on a sequence of um, processes here. So what we actually um, design over here in the, in the end is this polynomial basis here. Um, so these are just a bunch of polynomial coefficients at um, radii from the optical axis that we optimize over. And so this is a phase function that our optic in the end imparts here. Um, and so we design this for a single wavelength and then we come up with a phase two structure proxy. So how do I get that phase imparted by the lens to a particular metasurface structure? I'm gonna tell you in a little bit what that particular structure is. Then next step, um, I can come up with a model, um, again, a proxy that maps the structure to the phase imparted at uh, multiple different, different wavelengths. Um, I can then formulate a refractive electric field and propagate that all the way to my sensor 
get the intensity and, get, and then get the PSFs uh, that I in the end use to blur my input image, which is then reconstructed in the end with the proper noise model in order to um, recover an image at the very end. And so this entire pipeline is fully differentiable. I'm gonna show you how exactly we do that. So the crux of this thing is exactly this operator here. How do I get from phase? Um, all the rest here is, by the way, Fourier optics. So you read your, your favorite Fourier optics book. You can implement that nicely in a differentiable fashion, but how do I get the phase to a structure of a particular meta surface that you want to design? So I haven't really told you, okay, what our particular meta surface is. We start with a very simple design. So we use uh, silicon nitride um, on fused silica as a substrate. Um, so these are 700 nanometer height um, pillars here that um, we vary in diameter between 100 and 300 nanometers. So that's essentially all the design space that we're restricting ourselves to. And here you see an SEM image um, of that particular optic. And so if you do that, then we can locally formulate um, the meta surface as sort of like a duty cycle with a duty cycle concept. You can just basically say that we have locally a duty cycle, which is the um, uh, ratio of, these, of the pillar width to the local pitch. Okay, so this is something now we can actually simulate. So we can simulate a mapping from phase to duty cycle and vice versa with a traditional method. If you look at a small area, right? So then we can use rigorously coupled wave analysis, WA, to solve Maxwell's equations and compute exactly that phase that is uh, imparted here at that phase, local phase. Phase of what relative to what? Phase, phase of the light that is incoming at a given wavelength, okay. right? Um, and then depending on the particular wavelengths, right? So the multi-wavelength is in the next step. So we can do that. And then we get here a mapping. So this is exactly in yellow, these particular dots that we can then approximate again with another polynomial, right? So just a simple polynomial approximation. And that then becomes a nice differentiable mapping that we can implement in PyTorch or TensorFlow. It's just a few lines of code, right? So you can obviously also approximate this if you have more complicated functions. With the neural network, but because of some tricks that we made in the design, we got this nice, almost injective mapping that we, the, that we see on the right side. We can fit to it and can use it in our design. So this then becomes part of this entire pipeline here, um, and we can differentiate end to end through it. And that turns out to be about 3,000 times more, uh, faster than full wave simulation, and also memory. Uh, consumption is about three orders of magnitude lower if you wanted to optimize for very large elements. So that's sort of the key thing uh, to come up with this proxy, which is not perfectly accurate, but good enough for us to design these optics in an end-to-end -end fashion. So then we combine this with a reconstruction algorithm, right? So for the reconstruction algorithm, lots of different algorithms have been proposed in the past. Um, and as you know, we can use uh, traditional um, inverse filtering methods or optimization-based methods, uh, methods that actually formulate an objective and we try to solve that or approximately solve that by unrolling. Um, but the key thing here is that all of these algorithms are great because they're model-based, right? So we use the PSF in these algorithms and that means actually that we can backpropagate gradients through the PSFs all the way to our design space, which was that polynomial at the very beginning. So that's exciting, um, but at the same time, they're not doing too well because we don't have any learned features. We can't use priors that efficiently. We can't use large, cor uh, large corpuses of data very effectively. At the same time, neural networks are great at reconstructing things, but um, they don't have this model-based approach. So a simple trick that we did for this particular project is basically combining both. So insert um, into um, a neural network, uh, unit-based network, an inverse filter that then operates in feature space and that sort of gives us both. Um, and that turned out to work really, really well in practice. We combine these two blocks here and then we're able to backpropagate end-to-end -end through that entire design and optimize for reconstruction algorithm with um, features that are learned as well as for the metasurface data. And then we fabricate this metasurface in the end and we take a bunch of images with it. So here's the design process of this end-to-end -end optimization approach. So you can see the time lapse of a heuristic design compared to a heuristic design. And you see that um, if you look at these uh, spatially varying PSFs, they get really tiny spot sizes at what you don't see right here because the screen is not that great. Get a relatively large uh, floor here of these, um, of these PSFs. So what you basically turn your uh, deconvolution problem in with a, with a where instead of optimizing for a relatively large PSF, get for a peaky PSF plus a large tail. So it's essentially becoming a dehazing problem, which is what these methods can um, handle relatively effectively. 
So here's some results. Um, similar as mentioned before, compared to a um, state of the art um, neural nano optic that uh, was a heuristic design. And we do that with a relatively small optic here that's uh, much, much tinier than a compound optic. And if we comp compare those two side by side, here um, we can see that we starting to get close um, to these conventional com uh, cameras. But I've been cheating a little bit here because as you see the background is back. So that's relatively easy, right? Because I'm kind of hiding these aberrations in the black background. And I'm taking these captures also from a screen. So what do we do about that? Well, so the next step that we did was recently, hey, look, maybe you can resolve this by A, optimizing over an even broader band. Um, instead of looking at three different discrete wave lengths, we did the entire band and we built an array of these sensors. So these are, this is an ultra thin sensor, just one millimeter back focal length. And you can basically fabricate the optics on the cover glass of the sensor. So you completely throw away your, con your conventional optics and you only have on the cover glass these um, tiny little optics sitting. They don't have any baffles. So this is something in the future that could improve the design even better. But all of a sudden, you get in the wild captures that are pretty decent if you stitch those together. So here's a scene captured with a ground truth reference camera. And here's the reconstruction and the measurement on the left side with this array camera. And you can see that although we have these operations, by stitching them together, we can actually do really, really well. So hopefully, that convinces you that there's lots of juice in these meta optics here. All right, so next step. I promised you that I wanted to do some computation in the optics, right? So can we replace some of the optical stack here? Um, and instead of concatenating it with um, a deep neural network that does object detection or classification, can we move some of that computation into the optical stack? That's an interesting question that we looked at. Um, and obviously optical art artificial intelligence or ONNs have been looked at for a long time at this point, and folks have been trying out various different approaches how to cram some computation in, into the optical stack. So since the 50s, there have been various flavors of how to do that. But if you look at where we are now uh, with optical neural networks, then the most successful systems use um, ensembles of um, deep neural networks of up to 30 optical neural networks or SLMs to do that. Um, so they're really impractical and they don't do all that well, right? So the best approaches that, that we have um, today are, re are reaching roughly about a Lynette um, performance for classification, which is not very good, right? So that's an old network from the 90s. Meanwhile, um, we're still 15% off um, in terms of CIFAR, also traditional metric, right? That the computer vision community has long passed. Um, we're 15% worse than um, AlexNet, which is sort of like the very first modern neural network. Okay, so we asked us, okay, now we have this array design, so can we cram some of the computation into the um, into the array? So we start with the nanophotonic camera design from before, the single meta surface. And then we say, okay, well, we can compute some kernel, some convolution with a, with a given kernel with it. Um, but now we can also build this array here right, and cram a lot of kernels here um, over our sensor. So we can build an, an array, an array and I want to convince you that a five by five array can actually result in 175 especially varying optical kernels. So that increase can be quite significant if you do two specific tricks that are tailored to the optical uh, tailored to the neural network design. So the first one is in the optical domain, we can actually do really large convolutions, right? Um, with almost arbitrary kernels, because we have these meta lenses now, we can tailor them really, really well. However, in deep learning, we want to use relatively small kernels, but a lot of them, and ideally nonlinearities in between, right? Um, so let's consider this seven by seven um, convolution with the stencil shown here. Then uh, we can actually formulate this thing here also as a sequence of uh, three three by three convolutions, K1, K2, K3. So that becomes essentially convolution of, of, of these compounded um, convolution kernels. So now the number of parameters that we see, if we do this simple factorization, it's actually much lower, right? So if you look at the three by three kernels, uh, convolve three times with them, right? Then we end up with 27 parameters. Meanwhile, the full seven by seven kernel obviously has um, 49 parameters, right? So we end up in practice, if you run a simple regression, which I'm showing you here, um, with a lower dimensional space that if we implement this in, in uh, PyTorch or TensorFlow works really efficiently because we can use these small kernels and operate in this low dimensional space. So this works much better and we can get much better results if we factorize our kernel into a sequence of a lot of small kernels, right? So just one trick. Now we can actually make use of the especially varying nature of these operations as well and cram a low dimensional parameterization um, 
it with a per pixel deferring um, spatially varying kernel um, into our PSS as well. So we can make these kernels vary spatially and we can design how they vary spatially um, all over the sensor. So with these two tricks, um, we're able to, out of this five by five metasurface array, to get 25 channels, which then after um, relo, um, which is exactly the first non-linearity non that we want to apply right after, some average pooling, some uh, separable convolutions, um, we get some really high quality results, which I'm sure showing you afterwards. Okay, so now the overall max so multiply, multiply accumulate operations are about 0.1% on the electronic side, and almost everything, so 99.9% .9 um, are done in the optical domain because of these two factorization tricks, right? So the, the kernel, large kernel factorization as well as the spatially variant kernel factorization. So that brings us now with this approach to AlexNet performance. So all of a sudden on uh, blind CFAR, we reach about 75% uh, blind testing accuracy um, in practice on an experimental setup. So it's kind of like the first work that with a single sensor and also not 30, um, uh, ONNs achieves um, really good performance on AlexNet. So first step um, to get there, here's some visual examples on MNIST, which is too easy. And here are the examples on CFAR. So um, this is not perfect, at, but at least we're now at AlexNet performance in the thin form factor um, without these really large ensembles of um, stacks of diffra uh, diffractive tapes. Okay, so last thing that I want to convince you of is that we can do these, uh, that we can use these optical elements to do really cool stuff that I would call superhuman vision. Um, one example would be that we can um, approximately see through um, obstructions, right? And allow us to use the camera and turn it into um, an obstruction aware image. So for this automotive scenarios, we're assuming that we have a camera behind a windshield, so a glass surface and then the camera behind it. Uh, and if you want to capture a scene like this, then hopefully we detect the pedestrians in the scene um, if it's an ADAS system. So now occlusions from soil or ray drops or bugs on the screen make this challenging. And if I now take my favorite in-painting method, I manually even segment these areas, areas because they're difficult to automatically segment, segment um, and I in-paint them with Llama, then I don't get really great results. Um, now, if we learn uh, nanophotonic layers similar to the ones from before, we insert this into the aperture plane then we can actually get really good reconstruction results if we combine this with a um, neural network reconstruction. Okay, so how exactly does this work? Um, conventional camera, here we have a scene at optical infinity. And if there's objects at optical infinity, they get mapped uh, to different spatial locations on the sensor. So now obstructions close to the camera, on the other hand, lead to blur that kind of approximately alpha blended um, as a really approximate crude model um, of the image. So we can actually make use of this blur of objects that are close by and tailor it, design it um, by inserting a nanophotonic modulator. Um, and so if you now combine this with a reconstruction method, similar to the reconstruction method before, that's PSF aware. So that allows us to back propagate through, uh, gradients through the PSF all the way back to the uh, parameterization of um, our optic. Then we can train this in an end-to-end -end fashion together with the network as well as with the, uh, as well as, as well as with, with the optic in a joint fashion. And we do that with simulation. Um, and what comes out is quite interesting. So without any intermediate losses, just saying, okay, we'll try to get the best image out that's as close as possible with a per pixel L2 loss um, to your target simulated image, um, we get these results here. So what I'm showing you here from right to left is from near to far. So far is on the very left side, you see a peaky PSF. Um, and on the top, what I'm showing you is a conventional lens. On the bottom, this um, optimized lens that, that you see. So if you now have an occluder at 20 centimeter distance, then what happened is that this lens learned um, to actually come up with these very large rings here. So it learns to chromatically spread all the information that's close all over the entire sensor and give us these outputs here. So it essentially, again, turns this um, occlusion in painting problem into a dehazing problem, which is what these networks at least can do better than making up information, hallucinating information that's not as accurate as possible. And compared to a random diffuser, this doesn't help us too much. Um, the random diffuser does not really do well for these cases because it blurs over the entire range. So that's not really an alternative. So now we built this um, setup. Here's some experimental results um, in, uh, required in the lab where we have here a reference scene. Now, let's say these are our occluders. So these diagonal stripes here that we place on the 
um, glass surface in front of the camera. Um, now we insert our modulator um, and try to get rid of it with um, conventional in-painting. So the in-painting doesn't do well. So this structurally and semantically is not able to recover the scene adequately. Um, and we can do substantially better by this reconstruction. I'll show you this example here before. So here we get actually the fine structure back. Um, there's still some artifacts, but you can see that um, at least in principle, um, this is working and we can get the fine structure on the mushroom and on the on the, the house eye back here in this example. All right, with that, I'm at my 20 minute mark. So in summary, we looked at neural nanophotonic cameras that can allow us to build ultra tiny cameras, cram some computation into the optical stack. So allow us to do neural network computation, partly in the optics or mostly in the optics um, and aim to what I, uh, what I call superhuman vision capabilities in the camera. I'd like to thank you all. If you have any questions, please come close to the microphone. Thank you. It's really lovely. Uh, two questions. How much power are you burning to put that thing down? To reconstruct the images. Huh? Oh, so, so for the for the later pass here, for the that was on a relatively big GPU. So it run it runs fast, right? But we we do run it on a desktop GPU. So that's a that's a lot of power. Second right? question: Do you think if you randomly uh, toss a coin and select like random things, it would work better? For for what specific design? Remove the optimization you did on the wavelength. And suppose you just yeah randomly at every location put some random wavelength. Well, I mean, so so, so we do we compression algorithm problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So so yeah, exactly. So for the for the broadband optimization, we do actually do sampling um randomly over the wavelength space. Yeah. So that's part of the optimization, but that's folded into the SGD optimization of this design. Yeah. Nice, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Uh, one question regarding the learned optimization, uh, learned uh, optics. Doesn't it um just train your scenes to certain environments where you have trained them. How do you generalize it to outdoor scenes or generally? Scenarios? Yeah, yeah, really great question. So you have to train on those scenes. If you really just do end to end, right, and you don't have any any intermediate loss, then you have to do that, right. One trick that we do in practice, oftentimes, you can also obviously think about hybrid designs, right? So I have one commercial refractive element plus a meta surface and so forth. You can play with those as well. But in intermediate loss, right? If you if you wanted to place a sort of example and a loss on the spot size is something that you can also do if you want to bound it, right? But in practice, we found that um, by scaling your data set large enough and the simulation accurately enough, it, can, it, it, it works well. What you really have to account for is the uh, the, the, the spectrum um, of the scene, right? So spectral responses are pretty pretty tricky to handle with these designs. Yeah. And how does it handle different? How does it handle different wavelengths? So yeah, so this is all broadband, right? So the examples that I showed you, um, the ones with the with the uh, with the flowers that you've seen here, those are captured um, on a screen, right? So that's not true broadband, right? But um, a bunch of wavelengths at, um, at express location. But the outdoor scenes that I showed you uh, with this array sensors, so these were designed and captured in, in true outdoor scenarios. For a basic question, uh, the angular resolution in any case is limited by diffraction limit. Yeah. So if uh, the lens is like small, it's very limited. Uh, exactly. Can, can yeah. Operate. Yeah. So you don't you don't get you you don't uh, this, this is not magic. So you cannot uh, surpass the diffraction limit with it. Uh, so very great point. Which is in fact why we wanted to build larger lenses, right? So now we're at like two to one centimeter uh, designs, right? And we're trying to sort of find a good trade off, not go too big with the back focal lengths because we want to keep it as close as possible to the sensor, but something around one to two millimeters should still work in, if you have an array. Yeah. But you do have to, to live with the fraction of So the occlusion case works because you capture the light field. Is it because it captures from different rays? I know, exactly. So that's that's exactly the intuition, right? So I could obviously also make a very large aperture, right? If I put the light field camera, right? And then I can also see through those occlusions, right? So here I'm trying to do that with the same, um, with, with basically a, a dispersive element, right? That gives me larger angles uh, using that optical element to do that. But it's exactly the same, right? The right motivation. And the rel you saw, is it optical, the nonlinear element, or so the nonlinear element is happening for the for the optical design is happening only right after the readout, so so that's electronic, yeah.
yeah, there's no nonlinearities in the optical stack. Yeah. This is an axiom. There is no nonlinear optic, or well, well, there are approaches, <laughs> but they're really, really complicated. Yeah, yeah. How flexible was this beam? Part of the algorithm is an optical domain, part of the algorithm is an electronic domain. Usually, the advantage of the learning is that you can just program it. Yeah. Yeah. With optics, you kind of frozen, right? Yeah, you, you're stuck with it. Exactly. Exactly. So so that's what we're currently working on. So we can do different approaches. You can train your your sort of think of this as a foundation model, right? Or a backbone that's shown for all different models, right? So that means that you have to train on enough data to build a big enough model to do that. The other approach, which is um a pretty tricky material science problem, is to make these you can actually build these metasurfaces also programmable to a certain way. Um, but that is um, not to the accuracy that we want to have um, for these elements here. How are the materials fabricated? You make a mask and then you guys fabricate the, you guys etch the, yeah. what is it, silicon nitride you etch? Yeah, exactly. So so this is, this is all uh, deep UV lithography. So essentially a standard process. And we only have a single, we have a single layer. Um, so this is done with collaborators in a um, in in um, in, in a fab. Yeah. More questions? <clears throat> okay. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh yeah. So our next speaker is uh, Aaron Glover. He's from IIT. He actually did his PhD at QUT, I think in the group of uh, the labs led by Peter Ford. Uh, and then he moved to Italy and he's working in the group of Chiara Bartolozzi, which have a long tradition of uh, event-based or event-driven processing. Uh, with the iCap robot, they do nice demos where they have real time tracking with the eyes of the iCap and they try to do fast uh, computation to make it interactive with the iCap robot. Yeah. Good. Okay, thanks, Guillermo. Um, yeah, so at the uh, <clears throat> uh, event driven perception for robotics, um, we're the home of the neuromorphic iCub. Um, so the idea with this, like a long term goal, is we're looking to do neuromorphic uh, sensing, uh, neuromorphic processing, and, and neuromorphic actuation. <clears throat> so obviously, we have uh, the event driven cameras, which we've all seen today. Um, we're also looking at things like event driven touch uh, and combining uh, with uh, neuromorphic chips for processing, such as low here. Um, <clears throat> so that's our end goal. And short term, um, we're looking to also demonstrate the advantages of, of event driven cameras for robotics um, with the um, vision algorithms. So when we're developing uh, vision algorithms, um, we're really looking to keep criteria to, for something that will work uh, on our robots um, live. So we want the camera running live, we want an algorithm running um, and being able to do closed loop control on the robotics all in, in one pipeline. So let's say less offline processing. Um, for also this case, we've got moving cameras, we've got moving objects and we've got unknown speeds that we want to deal with. And if you work with event driven cameras, you know that this is not always uh, easy. So I'll show you some work that we're working on. Um, disclaimer, not all of it has all the criteria that I've just said, but we're designing our algorithms um, in this way to make sure that they're you know, extendable and will eventually run on, their, on the robot. Um, and the second half, I'll go through some of these kind of common methods we've used to deal with um, some challenges we have um, for all these different methods. Uh, so here's a... Um, um, a panda robot doing uh, tracking of this star-shaped object. 
Uh, it's got, um, you can see the Atis Gen 3 camera on the um, end effector there. And the robot's just controlled to keep um, the, the star in the middle of the, the view and also keep it the, the same size. So we're tracking in four dimensions. Um, uh, so here the, the robot's moving, the, the shape object's moving quickly, the uh, camera's moving quickly, and we still need to do the tracking. We've got a cluttered background, um, which means that we can't just track this object by like clustering events uh, because we get a lot of like events coming from the, from the background. Uh, so here's a picture of kind of what the camera is seeing. <clears throat> um, you can see here we're projecting where we're tracking the star shape object um, onto this uh, representation. So this uh, representation here is a, is a surface that's representing uh, where we expect edges in the in the scene uh, right now. Uh, the one on the left just shows you some of what the background is. It's not an easy, let's say, clustering task of events. We really need to look for this shape in the um, on the surface. And on the right, you can see this is the one where where the robots um, live control. So you can see here uh, the robots now moving that star to keep it in the center of the image, and it's moving quite quickly. So we're we're moving uh, things quite quickly. Um, when uh, Luna gets back to uh, Italy, she needs to strap on an RGB camera at the same time to show that, like, if you run this kind of thing, this with a, an RGB camera, that it's going to fail. So we really want to show the um, event-driven camera's potential for tracking here. Um, some applications for this kind of tracking, we're looking at doing, uh, you know, air hockey with uh, the iCub robot, um, being able to track the, the puck moving really quickly on the table. <clears throat> and also looking at uh, some eye tracking. So here's some challenges of tracking the iris is that we have blinks um, and fast moving saccades. So we want when the person looks from like left to right really quickly, we want to have use the event cameras to be able to track that kind of motion. So do you do tracking or you detect uh, the star? Um, this, these ones are tracking, we're assuming the previous position and just looking at uh, an area around that previous state of our, of our target. Uh, we can combine that with a detector so we can kind of initialize and recover from failures. We're also doing uh, hybrid um, frames and events for six degree of freedom tracking of objects. <clears throat> so the top right here is uh, the dope um, object uh, detector running on the frame-based camera. It's got like a 10 Hertz maximum kind of frame rate. So when we move the object quickly, you can see that it, we're missing a lot of the motions. <clears throat> uh, what we do is we've also got the event camera. Um, we are measuring the velocity of the object with event, uh, in the events and combining that in um, a double, like two common filters, one for the velocity and then one to integrate new um, detections from uh, from the dope um, pose detector. And you can see the bottom right is the integration of this information. So we're getting um, not perfect, but much smoother uh, tracking of this six degree of freedom object. <clears throat> also looking at uh, doing this kind of uh, six degree of freedom state estimation with just events. Uh, so here you can see I'm holding uh, this toy car uh, in front of uh, in front of the camera, uh, we've scanned that uh, toy car in with um, um, like a, a 3D to create the 3D mesh of the car, and uh, looking at um, estimating. So I'm here projecting where we estimate the car on in the image plane on the um, on the image, and here you can see we're using the same uh, surface uh, as for the other tracking. Um, you can see that uh, at some point, you know, here, this is a work in progress. You can see where, where we start failing and you can see, you, you know, the car here is estimated in the, the wrong 60 poles compared to where the events are coming in. Uh, hopefully you managed to see a poster we prevent, presented uh, downstairs um, earlier. <clears throat> so this is work we did on uh, detecting uh, trajectories. Um, the idea being that uh, we want this uh, robot to intercept the bouncing ball 
how we want to use the event camera to really very quickly in the first few pixels, we can see the target. We want to be able to have an understanding of where the target will end up, where the robot can intercept the trajectory. Um, and uh, to do this, we did some training of a LSTM and uh, from a lot of uh, simulated data uh, with a physics model and then uh, fine tuned on some, some real uh, trajectories. Uh, so the typical results we see here is that um, for this kind of um, task, the ball's uh, moving fast enough that something like uh, the real sense at 30 Hertz, um, just the tracker failed because there's too much motion blur in the scene to really get a good track of the object. Um, at 60 Hertz, instead, the RGB camera can contract the target. Um, with the event camera, we still get an advantage because, um, because we get to see the target um, like moving in the first few pixels with a much lower latency. Um, and so the LSTM can more quickly uh, understand where it expects the interception point to be and the robot can move um, earlier to, to, the, to the interception position. We're also looking at a human pose estimation. Uh, so also this was a poster hopefully caught downstairs. Um, here we're using this um, the same representation the, it's called we call the Eros. Um, and we've trained uh, MoveNet, so uh, which is a lightweight uh, frame based um, network for doing human pose estimation. And we've adapted that to events. And how we've managed to do that is by um, exploiting really big frame-based data sets. So in a frame-based data set, you've got the ground truth, but you've got a frame. So if we run on the top left, you can see um, an image with canny edge detector applied to the frames. Um, and on the right there, you can see the output of what we're seeing um, from, from Eros. And so because these are not exactly the same, but they're similar enough, what we can do is we can train uh, whole, um, using like MPII, big frame-based data set to pre-train our model for like edge-based uh, detection and, um, and then fine tune on the, our actual data we're getting from our Eros representation. And this has given us a detector uh, that works well on, on frames, uh, on, uh, on the events. So <clears throat> then we've also combined it in a similar way with the six degree freedom object tracking with uh, velocity estimation per joint. So for each joint, we're also estimating at a very high frequency. So one kilohertz or more, we can estimate the velocity of that joint. And again, in a camera field to integrate all that together. So we get a, um, uh, and a one kilo, kilohertz output of the, of the human pose, uh, combining the move net and the velocity estimation. So this is uh, some of the work we're working on um, at EDPR. And then the second half, I wanted to kind of go through some of the, the challenges we have for robotics in a more general sense. So um, event-based cameras have great for robotics. They've got great potential. Um, and uh, some of this comes from the fact that, you know, we communicate just like a one event at a time. In reality, it's going to be a packet due to you know communication overhead, but we can communicate a small amount of data with a very low latency, and then this data has a high temporal resolution. Uh, these are great for um, for robotics because we can achieve do late, low latency. We can do uh, good tracking because we've got the full track of the of the object moving. We don't have these frames that are taken at different points in time, but they also bring challenges. For, for robotics. So if you have a high uh, temporal resolution, I'm not sure, yeah, okay. So here, if you imagine, um, you, you have also have this ambiguous temporal association. So you might have two events in this girl waving her hand, which are really close uh, spatial temporally, um, but they're of the hand at two different locations. One, the current location, one, some point in, in the past where the hand was previously as it was waving. So this is some we want to we don't want to tie these two together because they're two different states of the of the person's hand. Um, on the other hand, the foot hasn't moved for some seconds, five seconds or so. There's not much data, but we still want to keep some information about that foot 
um, to be able to associate it with the current position of the hand. So we've got a very, very low, uh, very close uh, spatial temporal data here we want to reject, um, and a very long, uh, long temporal period here we want to kind of include. Um, so this is one problem we need to solve uh, for robotics when we're using event cameras. Uh, event cameras have a, a low latency, um, and that's because we're sending these events at a, a small, with a small time period. And the downside to this is we don't know how much data is coming through at any point in time. Um, we don't have a frame, which is always the same amount of data. So here in, the, in this um, image at the bottom, you can see that the, the camera is on a robot. It's moved a lot. It's stopped. And then it's moved a lot again. So we've got a lot of events and not many events. And then another, again, a lot of events. So to keep things real time, we've got a, a closed loop um, control with the robot. Um, we need to be able to process this data when a lot of events come in, um, in the time that they come in. So we've got to be able to manage to process a lot of events. We can't have, you know, to keep things real time, basically. Um, so I'll go through the two solutions that we have there. Um, the first is, uh, I've mentioned a few times, is our uh, Eros, which is a speed invariant uh, surface. <clears throat> so each element in, the, uh, in this 2D array indicates the likelihood that we see a spatial, a spatial gradient there. It's a bit hard to see, sorry. So um, uh, the, this surface is updated asynchronously. Um, so we can push through events at about 10 million events per second, which is pretty nice for our, our, our work with robots with the Gen 3 cameras. But if you saw the data set um, uh, posted today, they're pushing up to 100 million or 200 million events per second. So there's still uh, problems that we need to deal with there. Um, but for our current camera and technology, this is pretty nice. We can um, update this Eros with 10 million events per second. Uh, these, uh, there's no temporal decay. So we uh, keep persistence. The foot, which is hard to see, will be persistent for the whole time and let, until the foot moves. Um, so these design decisions leave behind some artifacts and some noise, but we hope our algorithm will reject them. Um, so this is also related to uh, what Riyadh was talking about earlier. Um, if I was going to discuss with him, I'd say that possibly uh, he's saying that time is important for, for, in, for these things. Um, but I'd say that possibly some tasks you don't need time. If you're doing recognition of an object, there's, there's not so much time associated with this. Um, but I would say what's interesting would be the order of events. So this surface is updated based on uh, keeping the order of the events uh, very, um, very clear, but we don't necessarily care about time. Uh, so this is a surface you would use for any applications which don't have, don't require time in the, you know, the task you're trying to do. Velocity estimation, you want to have time in there to be able to estimate the velocity, right? Uh, the second uh, thing we do is a hybrid um, processing architecture with synchronous and, and asynchronous um, threads. So basically to be able to push through 10 million events per second, but then also update a complex algorithm, um, we need to split in uh, into two threads. So the first thread is just our asynchronous event-driven thread. And all it does, read, date, read the events and update uh, the surface, uh, giving us, you know, the current estimate of where we expect gradients at this at this point in time. Um, this is speed invariant, the way we update it. Um, and yeah, so the, we can then, with a second thread, perform our complex uh, vision algorithm, whether it's you know tracking or camera pose estimation. And we can just run that. I say synchronous here, but really you can just run it as fast as it can possibly go. So here, this thread is not dependent on the data coming in. It's just trying to run as, as far as it can. If you've got a really complex algorithm, you can, might run it, you know, 10 hertz. But if you um, can do maybe a lightweight algorithm, which we do, we try to run this, this at like one kilohertz for our tracking tasks. Um, so in this way, this two-threaded where we're, we're working things this way, we uh, can get a lot of events through, but also update our algorithm as fast as it can possibly go. Uh, the, the synchronous thread is just going to sample the latest of, um, of our surface at the current point in time. So just the context of these solutions for the, um, the algorithms or the um, applications which I showed at the start. So for tracking the either four-dof or six-dof, 
what we get with using the arrows is a consistent appearance. It doesn't matter if the camera is moving or the object moving. Um, we're getting a consistent appearance of what the object looks like. Um, the hybrid synchronous asynchronous allows us to read a lot of events and, and still do a one kilohertz a kilohertz update, keeping things real time for our closed loop um, robotics situation. For human pulse estimation, um, we get uh, the else is giving us a constant appearance. Like there's a particular case here for for human pulse estimation, exactly when somebody's like waving their arm, and if um, and the legs kind of disappear if you're just using a temporal window or something like that. And uh, so this error allows us to kind of keep a uh, persistent of limbs that stop moving in this case, allowing the detector to get more information about the foot is still in the same location. Um, and yeah, it also allowed us to like train our, um, our detector on a lot of RGB imagery with all the, the, ground, um, the ground truth and annotations. So it gave us an edge there. <laughs> Okay, thanks, Toby. Um, <clears throat> so this one I just threw in, uh, it's a corner detection algorithm. I uh, just threw in to say that you can, using this um, hybrid structure, synchronous asynchronous, you can still get an asynchronous output. So in this case, the top line is our thread that's doing our asynchronous. And what we do is we update our, our representation, our surface, and then we immediately, for that single event, we also like have a lookup table where we can say at that point in time, was there a corner here or not? Um, the difficult thing, okay, well, how do we generate this lookup table saying whether there's a corner there or not? And that happens in our second thread where we're running as fast as possible, um, generating a lookup table from uh, our surface. So that's just giving us this, this second thread is giving us where we expect events to be in, on our surface but we can still sample that asynchronously with the events to get an asynchronous output. Uh, so conclusions, um, we've been looking to design uh, event camera algorithms um, under real closed loop uh, robotic constraints. So we've got these constraints and we want to run it on the robot. Um, we have shown some challenges we get, like the event cameras are great for robotics, but it adds these challenges. So we need to solve them. And we've done so using the, these two methods. Um, so for then bigger in our in our group, we're looking at um, developing, um, hoping that some of these algorithms that we make that actually work closed loop on a robot can shed some light on how biological algorithms might be working. For example, we know we can um, we can implement the Eros in a spiking neural net network architecture. It's not, it's not so difficult to implement, um, but an interesting question could be like, is that the location in the brain that uh, persistence is achieved? Um, so the, like, is, the, is that where kind of um, that kind of processing is happening kind of a lower level or is it something at a higher level? Uh, so it'd be interesting for us to also like look at those kind of questions. Uh, thanks very much. Um, questions? If you have, please come to the microphone. It's better for everyone here in front. Yeah. Thank you so much, Mr. Paul. Uh, I have a question, actually. Um, first of all, uh, how big is the volume that you use to generate the pulse estimation? So we don't use a volume. We're using the um, uh, the this Eros, which is a two D array. Yeah. So we just have the uh, it's it's the same size as the as the so sensor, so six forty by four eighty. How many events uh, are in time? So. Uh, so the the way that the Eros is updated is it's updated in asynchronous. It's like a, it's like an SAE or something like that. But the update step is not just keeping the latest timestamp. There's a little bit more to it. Uh, so when every event arrives, we update the surface. Um, and so at any point in time, we have let's say just the surface we use. So there's no there's no temporal parameter there. So we just continue as the camera streams. We just continually update our surface uh, whenever we do a. a a human pose estimate, we grab the most recent surface and, and perform the estimate on that the so detection. I was wondering what would be the frequency 
Uh, the pose generates depending on uh, the hardware you have. So if we've got a GPU, we can get up to 100 hertz. If we just want to run on a CPU, we can run, the, it's a network, uh, the MoveNet uh, architecture, so we can run it at 30 hertz on a CPU. Um, and then we just sample whenever we, whenever we finished one detection, we just grab the latest surface that's being updated in, in, the, in the other thread and use that to create the detection. Actually, my initial question was related uh, if we have used the volume, it wouldn't have been better to generate out of that volume the, the grayscale version of the events. Uh, there is an option to go from events to the grayscale image. And based on that grayscale image, we do the detection of the positive. Yeah, you can use like E to vid kind yeah. of network to generate the grayscale yeah. image. Um, we did this like also with running open polls on, on things, but it seems I, I I don't think you need to do that. I'm asking you if you like, take the slides and then you get the grace color and then you have the post. I don't know how much you how much volume you need. That, that was the question. So how much volume you need to generate a good grace color is absolutely you can get the post detection. But it depends. So I mean this is the like downside uh, of using it vid. Like if you're moving quickly, you might get a different appearance yeah. than if you move slowly and there's then not many events occur. So this is an advantage of the way we're doing it because we don't define the volume. Yeah, but I also do look at some channels to see, yeah, not detecting that well sometimes. Yeah, yeah. It's a bit off sometimes. So that's why I was asking you. Yeah, I okay. I've also some other options. I think we need to get an updated video on this actually because there, there is some <laughs> points that it uh, looks like it's not doing so well. It's not always perfect, but uh, yeah. Okay, well, thanks a lot for the questions. Yeah. Thank you for your talk. Um, so, you mentioned towards the beginning that one of the problems with these cameras is that you can sort of break the real time constraint uh, if there's like a ton of events that come in. Um, does Arrows or any of your systems really address that yet, or is that still a problem? Um, I mean, the, the only way that we can address it is to try to have something that can process as, as many events as possible. So basically, we want a really lightweight update that's done per event. So whenever any event comes in, we can't run the complex algorithm. We can just do a very small amount of processing. And this allows us to process more events, right? It's just the inverse relationship. Okay. So basically, with the event camera, I mean, I'm saying it runs real time, but I put a limit on how many events it can run real time for, right? So as long as we're under 10 million events per second, we can update the Eros in real time. Um, and that allows everything to run real time. If we go over that, we're not, we, we, um, the Eros doesn't update in real time. We, we have, we experience latency. But you don't have like a, a control system to guarantee a certain latency? Uh, in this work, no, we're just, uh, like for the, um, applications we have and, you know, our, our cameras set up and, and things, which are we just like kind of know this limit. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Can you just explain this video why sometimes you get a bright green and other times it's snow? <laughs> right. So the bright green is the just events that is visualized uh, in some time window. I think it's a uh, 100 milliseconds or something like that. Um, that's the events coming in. Uh, the red and the green are the detector and the um, velocity estimation added to the detector to kind of predict ahead um, of the detector where we will be. Um, when we go dim, this is very hard to see, actually. Um, the, the Eros representation. So this is our surface we're using to do the detection on. How was that Eros initialized? In the beginning, it's blank, right? Beginning, it's blank. Um, we can go through the technical details. It's not a tough algorithm, but whenever an event comes in, we update the arrows with a 255 value, and we we have a small region around that. Uh, we subtract one from all of those values, and so what this gives is basically any value. Uh, oh no, so, sorry, that's a, an old reference. We actually decay exponentially. So we multiply all the old values by a very like a 0 0.99. And as more events come in, all the old values decay. But they decay because we have uh, new events coming in, not because of some temporal factor. Mm -hmm. So this in this way we get a bit um speed invariance. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks.
Oh, we haven't trained this model for two persons, but uh, you know, there's there's models out there that do. So we would need to then go ahead and do more retraining for for, for two persons and multiple persons. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, so let me. Um, we're having here. We have the three dots. All right. We're just here for a few minutes. Well, you you have to suffer through it. Okay. All right. I wanted to do this is a shared time between the organizers. And I wanted to advertise first something that some of you may not know. For the neuromorphic community in general, we have an NSF grant. So go to neurobuck.info where we created a web portal. Okay. Um, well, so we turned recently this web portal into any information on neuromorphic, the success of Neurotrack that Julia was running. So you really can go there, you find what in the community resources, what events are going on. Thanks to Stephen. You can look up resources and tools, videos. We also hold seminars. They will continue in the fall. We had two so far of, uh, panel discussions. And we are organizing the workshop that takes place in Telluride every year. And we are giving fellowships. And that's why I'm here. You're really encouraged. This is for students, researchers, up to six months. Apply with a short proposal to us. So you can work, start a collaboration from anywhere in the world to the US, right? Or vice versa. So take advantage of it and send us a proposal. Okay. So neuropark.info. And now I'm going to use a few minutes on a small result, on a small pro on a project from our lab. From our lab. Well, Okay, so we have been discussing new, <laughs> where are neuromorphic cameras really good for. You heard special special applications from Andre. We are still suffering in in structure promotion applications, and then there has been, of course, action recognition. But are we really doing better? Most actions that we have in the computer vision are really based on static classification. You see the objects and you know already what's going on. And our classic video cameras are very good at that. So, okay. What we have been looking at is now some actions where, it, um, where really the motion matters. So, and why would this be good? in situations of human robot collaboration where really milliseconds work to close and shorten the delay in the control loop between perception and actions. And we looked at actions 
we recorded this a while ago in Telluride and now processed it, where people grabbed the, an object and then did different scenes on it. So here you see the famous Professor Andreas Andreas to picking up the stone and either scribbling with it, playing with it, um, drawing with it, different actions with the stone. And so we did with other objects, spatulas, glasses, and um, we process, um, a paper has been out already where we process this on RGP videos a while ago. And now we compare it with the newest architectures, event vision against video. And guess what? Here really event vision matters. Mm -hmm. So you can get the intuition already here in these actions, for example, actions with a spoon or actions with a cup. Event vision doesn't see the object before the hand doesn't come in contact with it. And video features, as you will see, actually get very confused because those video features pick up a lot of stuff. They pick up the texture and so on. So the architectures we have trained uh, from the literature, uh, there's a recurrent neural network, a GRU network that receives as input time surfaces. So the thing that Riyadh has been talking about, slices of time surfaces, or a 3D convolution where we put them, the whole block, those architectures have to see the whole block. So it's standard, but we compare. So in, in the one case, you get them individually. In the other case, you get them as a whole block. And then, of course, now a transformer architecture here, a mobile net transformer architecture that's very efficient which also receives time surfaces and it builds the whole attention models. First, uh, just a check, how does it compare to other architectures? This uh, on the DDS, famous DDS gesture set about uh, comparable, the efficient GRU beats on this data set. And now let us look at this event architecture. So here, as you get the event visualized um, here over two seconds, in this sequence, so we assume we're only looking at the actions on the same object. Yeah, so after about quarter of a second, you have a low confidence after one second, the action gets already up to 44.9. And after two seconds, what's ending here, you have already a confidence of 92.8%. When you compare this to video, it's much lower, 28.5% only, because it gets confused by other things. And here at the end of the action, what's usually done in computer vision, we're still quite here in this, it's still quite ahead, the event vision. Uh, as opposed to the action vision. So if you compare it, there was a whole data set and multiple objects compared. On videos, you do much better if you say, categorize all the knife actions, all the cup actions, all the stone actions. You have lots of confusion on the events. But assuming that we know it is that object, event vision really can pull out the motion features. The work which has been done in Francisco Barranco's group with his student, um, it also includes a tracker which showed some advantages in efficiency, but not real advantages in performance. So uh, event vision really has some advantages on actions where motion matters. That's the conclusion. Thank you. Any questions for Cornelia? Yes, I need embedding. You can explain just the embedding a little bit more. Okay, this is a standard thing in computer vision. You, uh, you basically uh, project on the subspaces, you pull out the most important subspaces and there you do a clustering. But what was the difference between the two sides? Uh, so um, the, 
you you try to cluster in a lower dimension subspace. That's for visualization. That's a standard way in deep learning use. So all together, there was a data set that had multiple objects, like six objects. Under each object, there were five different actions. So if you try to classify the object category, so the super category, then you have confusion when you do with the events. It, um, it, there's a much cleaner separation in the video because it picks up the spatial features, which are the objects, yeah, which you don't see in the events so well. Mm -hmm. Yes? It, it was 240 and it's a it's a data set that we actually collected at this Telluride workshop a while ago and we first processed it. Yeah, it is a well, this has not been tried and it also could be tried on much larger data sets. I think there's work to be done much larger data sets. Um, yes, no, this has not been done. It's a rather small data set. Well, the resolution, I don't think it matters. It's not the resolution, but the data set could definitely be larger. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's really, we also looked at it. It's really the, um, video picks up a lot of the texture in this case and that makes it perform worse mm -hmm. all right thank you mm -hmm. can i have another question yes so it's good that you pointed out that uh, the advantage right i was just wondering um right now which is trying to struggle to find uh, if we have like a fast speed camera and like what other applications is it like have to be like versus you know, fast speed camera? Like you know, Wait, if, if you're like it's 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 into like a product, right? So like well you have to you justify. <laughs> what you ask me in general, but this is exactly what we are after we have one applications definitely have seen specializations when in the macro domain space in the micro domain with the Excel. Um I think it's I, I I bet on it. It seems where we with the motion matters uh, and, and in the short term with the control. Here also it's it's very short term. If you can like I show this motivation and interaction in the robot domain. Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to find the, some of the applications that we can use, like in gaming and industrial sense, for example, low, oh, low yeah. power. Oh, yeah, you, de you definitely also have the advantage when you track because you're a little bit faster in tracking the people and then yeah. yeah. the you want to know. You want to have the great user experience, so there it really matters. And it's always, I think, the company after looking at the hand. In general, in general, when the yeah. when the and perception needs to be, yeah, you know, when the perception needs to be activity driven, when it benefits to be activity driven, mm -hmm. instead of the constant capital rate. Well, you can mention it. What do you mean? What you say? No, yeah, it's better. It's more usual. Put this away. All right, I think we are ready for the next one. So, um, next speaker is Daniel Garrett. He is about to graduate at Davides Lab. He has uh, uh, quite a few contributions, starting already from a future tracker in ECCB 2018. And maybe he's now talking, working more on object detection, I guess. Mm -hmm. So, right, thanks for attending the talk. So, today I'll talk about a bit of research that I've been doing uh, on geometric deep learning for event cameras. Um, so the main motivation for this work is uh, we all know there's a lot of papers now that you know use uh, dense representations of events, process them with the CNN, and then uh, basically generate some output. So these achieve very high performance, but uh, as you all kind of admit, uh, it's not the way that we should process events. They're dense. We're processing kind of 
um, artificially uh, generated zeros, right? Like, so for example, one of these event histograms is very sparse uh, and also they're very sparse in time, in, in time, right? So um, what I've been uh, investigating is, can we actually co-design the neural network and the, uh, the event, to the events um, so that we can get simultaneously very efficient, but also very powerful processing. And um, uh, actually, before we go here, maybe I want to go into kind of a, a small tangent explaining why we actually have to care about efficiency. So imagine that you have this scenario, you want to detect something very in very low latency. It's one of the use cases of event cameras, right? So imagine there's a pedestrian, for example, walking onto the street. Um, what is the worst, worst case latency that we can expect from a vision-based algorithm based on images? So the way that uh, I basically go about this is I, I say, okay, um, this happens just when we la had the last frame, and now we are waiting for the next frame to actually get this information, and then we have to process this frame. So how does this total latency then stack up? It's basically half of, it's, it's actually once the, uh, the interval plus whatever computation time you needed in your algorithm, right? Um, so I hope that's kind of non-controversial. Um, here now is the use case of an event camera. So because event cameras can actually maintain data in a rolling buffer, they don't have to uh, wait for the next frame, right? They can just trigger processing as soon as the last um, step is done. And it means that essentially uh, your worst case latency is actually just waiting for the last processing step to finish and then execute another one. And what, what you can see is that pretty interestingly in this low range of uh, computation time, event cameras are significantly better than frame-based cameras. So we actually have an interest in reducing this computation time significantly so that we can actually go and then leverage the low latency of the of the camera. So for this reason, I've been interested in uh, in developing a, a kind of new class of asynchronous neural networks. Um, it's kind of a line of work that uh, started with submanifold graph neural networks. Now it's uh, graph neural networks. The key idea is that you, on the left, you train a neural network which processes event graphs, graphs that are generated from events as nodes in the graph, and you uh, output you you process them with a, a standard graph neural network. You train it in a standard supervised way, and then you deploy this network in a synchronous fashion where it has exactly the same output, but essentially for each new event, you, you propagate changes throughout the network. So what you see here is like light green parts of the network. They're basically nodes that have to be recomputed based on the receptive field of each event. And um, <clears throat> uh, this has two benefits. One of them, it, it maintains the sparsity in the events. When there's no events, there's no graph, there's no computation, right? Uh, and also, uh, when there's new events, we can efficiently insert events into the graph. Um, there's a very fast kind of CUDA impl implementation that that does this, uh, that I've that I've written. And um, and here I'll go a little bit more into detail on what what's exactly happening. So imagine you have this event graph on the left. Um, you have some processing stages. Now imagine we get a new event. We insert this event into the graph, so we have the new edge and a new node. Um, and then as we go deeper into the network, we basically have to update uh, K-hop neighborhoods of this, uh, of this new node. And what's, what's interesting about this is that compared to having to reprocess everything, this is a very significantly smaller subset of the nodes that we have to reprocess. Um, and so we can actually uh, plot now these models in a kind of a 2D plot where on the bottom, uh, on the X-axis, I have the flops per new event. So you insert a new event, you compute how much, how much, uh, how many uh, flops do I need to process uh, the event, and on the y-axis you see the the accuracy, and uh, we see on the right side we see these CNN-based methods. They're very accurate. They're quite high, but they're also very far to the right, so they have high computational um, uh, computation demands. Um, by contrast, now we have here these stars, which are kind of the new asynchronous methods, starting with the AZNet. It's the uh, submanifold graph neural network, uh, uh, sparse convolutional neural network, and then uh, now culminating in these EAGR, um, which are the kind of um, asynchronous graph neural networks. Um, so we see we have a, about three orders of magnitude fewer computations, but still we're missing a bit in terms of uh, in terms of accuracy, but that's it's kind of ongoing research. Um, recently, I've been interested in now how can we actually combine this with images. So we all know that images do have some information that we can still use, uh, notably texture, color information, a lot about uh, the, the background. 
And uh, here I've actually uh, developed a method which uh, can, with a CNN, process the RGB image, generate some detections, some kind of bank of features. And then this, this bank of features can be reused uh, very efficiently to uh, redetect the object uh, throughout time by adding in, in individual events. So what you're seeing here now is the time window going um, increasing in time. So you, it's, uh, the, the time is moving forward. And in this way, we can simultaneously track, feed, uh, track objects, although we don't have the ID. Um, we can also read it, uh, detect new objects, and we can also forget about objects uh, in an event-by-event event, uh, fashion. Um, there's also kind of a more fundamental um, uh, motivation for why we should actually combine events and frames. So here, I want to show you the bandwidth latency trade-off. So of course, we could always say, well, we could do any of these tasks with a high frame rate camera, right? But uh, and to reduce the latency. But this also increase, increases the bandwidth. So what we actually achieve by combining events and frames is to significantly reduce the latency with a small um, penalty in terms of uh, band bandwidth. Um, here, I'm just showing you kind of uh, how it looks like. Uh, this is part of a new data set that we're releasing, which has RGB images, events, and, um, and, uh, and, and object detection labels. It's kind of a labeled version of the DSEC. Uh, and here's again kind of a visualization of what our uh, algorithm actually outputs to these kind of um, spatial temporal object detections. Um, here I'll show you uh, kind of the one of the advantages of using such an approach. Um, by adding events, we can essentially um, see into the future at least uh, more at least one frame uh, and detect uh, potentially uh, traffic participants. Uh, running onto the street earlier than if we used, for example, an image-based method. Um, uh, this is a little bit more apparent here in this dash cam video, uh, where you um, you actually don't see the car, but you actually see the events of the car. So now we can detect the car um, crashing into the into the right car much earlier. Uh, here's another use case in in low light scenarios. So, I mean, we can still use the advantages of the event camera to detect the pedestrian that's standing over there. It's maybe a little bit hard to see. And uh, here we have this uh, a scenario where we're exiting a tunnel and the auto exposure of the camera is, uh, is causing some issues. So we can actually detect the, uh, the car uh, more easily with the events than with the RGB images alone. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Uh, here's a link to the data set uh, if you're interested in uh, continuing this research. Question? Yeah. The, the object detection itself on the graph it is translational invariant, probably, right? Because do you use the coordinates of the x, y, so uh, it's the difference of the coordinates? Yeah, it's not entirely translation invariant, I think, because it has these cells. So the object detection head traditionally it's it's based on YOLO X, which has like cells, and every cell encodes the relative position of an object detection. And so if you shift the input a little bit, like the cells change that are associated with an object detection. Does that make sense? Yeah. Thank you very much for the talk. I would like to ask, uh, you mentioned that you had started with a sequence convolution neural networks and then moved on to the graph neural networks. Yes. For sequence updates. Mm -hmm. um, can you uh, give uh, somewhat of a uh, theoretical comparison between these two in terms of uh, why did you uh, turn to the graph neural networks and see a more promising direction? Um, so, so the first work, um, I don't have a slide of it, unfortunately, but the first work was essentially um, a sub-manifold uh, convolution. So what it was doing was it was generating a 2D histogram. And now you can imagine that maybe only lines are present in this histogram and the sub-manifold convolution can identify these sub-manifolds and only process along them. And that makes it sparse. Um, but uh, because it has to have a histogram, it, it discards the time information. And now with the graph, we actually have a full 3D graph, like spatial temporal graph, and we can actually leverage the relation, the spatial, uh, the temporal relationship between the events. So 
I think that's why it can extract maybe better features from the events. Cool. Right. The follow up question in the uh, graph neural network: uh, you have a, a time constant, a time such that you start to forget events, or uh, yeah. So you can simultaneously insert new events, but you can also discard, take out events, and it would uh, give you a similar kind of update rule. Uh, in this case here with the RGB image, we actually have a, a, a filling buffer. So we start at zero and then we insert events, 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 and we don't discard events at the beginning of, of where the image is. And then when the next image arrives, we can again refill the buffer. Um, yeah, I think other strategies are also possible. Thank you. Um, thank you for the talk. Um, the question is about uh, did you try any other tasks? Um, I don't know, object detection, and did you find like which task is more suitable kind of for this mm -hmm. general things? Because I used to try this for uh, general, some general or one. That's okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, we actually uh, we also tried out um, classification. Is a little bit simpler than this. It also worked quite well. I think what's important is that you have an encoder structure. You don't have a decoder because as soon as you get the decoder, you start updating all of the decoder, which is maybe you discard some of the benefits of, of the sparsity. Um, but I saw a workshop paper, this Hugnet, that does optical flow with graph neural networks, and it seems to work pretty well. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Thanks very much. I'll, I'll trade places with uh, Ken. Then Ken will come. I will try to be brief. Uh, right. Daniel, you need to log out. Daniel? Oh. All right, so I have five minutes. I would like to talk about things that are happening in my lab at New Berlin. So I chose two topics. One is autonomous uh, systems, so event-based for autonomous systems, and the other one is animal observation. And the first one is about motion estimation. In my lab, we do a lot of uh, estimation of motion, ego motion, and optical flow. And here, basically, I just want to briefly show that we have uh, quite some results on extending contrast maximization, which is a framework for processing event data, to compute things like optical flow, SLAM, and uh, help image reconstruction. So this is extending contrast maximization to the slam. This is work of Shuang Wo, who is also here in the audience. And um, we are trying to basically um, do a full slam in the sense that we will have a front end and a back end. We are refining with contrast maximization both the trajectory of the camera and three degree of film. So we have a rotating camera and the map. This is with a DB Explorer with VGA resolution. And once you have the trajectory, you can, if you want, obtain the panoramic images that we all know in grayscale. The method works quite well, even when you have the sun and the field of view, you have this glare effect. The optics works quite nicely with 360 degrees. And the nice thing is that we try to do this in a principled way so that we can apply to other scenarios like sky mapping or star tracking. The second one is the work with Schumann Gosch, who is also here. Um, we do stereo. So on the last column here is the the output of our stereo method, where we are extending the monocular one EMBS, and we are comparing with the ground truth from the LiDAR and ESBO. We see that we obtain better completion, um, and we can even get depth when the LiDAR doesn't provide us with that. Compared to previous methods, we get more 
um, recovered points. And the good thing about stereo is that you get more accurate depth estimation, faster convergence because you have a spatial baseline, and you can also get rid of outliers that you will have with monocular methods. The code is available. Yeah, you can try it. This is the previous one is a sequence from the DSEC data set. This is from the one megapixel uh, ring camera data set from TU Munich. Here, there is no ground truth depth, so we cannot directly compare with uh, ground truth data. Um, the method requires the poses, and in this case, the poses are provided by a motion capture system inside the room. Outside the room, we get the poses from another visual or odometry method, then we can still use it to try to obtain depth in this kind of complicated scenario where you are moving forward in a kind of narrow corridor. It also work outdoors. Um, yeah, the goal is really, the question was how to use the data from yeah. the two stereo event cameras and we don't do any data association or correspondence between the events. We basically build disparity space images and we fuse them with some harmonic mean, uh, which is quite a nice theory. Um, the third one is uh, contrast maximization for dense optical flow. This is the work of Shintaro Shiva, who is visiting from Keio University. And the last column shows uh, the estimated flow and the image of warp events that it's supposed to be as sharp as possible. Basically, we try to estimate the flow that gives us the sharpest image of warp event um, because we are achieving event alignment. We compare in this MVSEC data set from uh, Costa's lab. Uh, we compare with uh, previous solutions like EB FlowNet and, and supervised method. Our method is model based, but once we know what we need to optimize, then we can transfer it to the unsupervised domain. So basically, we uh, try to investigate what is a good loss function to do optical flow and then use it for training. And we tried it on MVSEC, and it also works quite nicely on, uh, on the DSEC data set. Here, this is the data from the DSEC from David's lab. And um, we compare with other solutions like supervised method ERAF. The data set doesn't contain the independently moving objects. So our method doesn't rely on any labeling. So we are still able to get um, accurate flow and sharp images in those independently moving objects. Okay, the next idea I want to show is that once you know optical flow, it can facilitate image reconstruction. So typically you will see many of the image reconstruction methods work like this. They convert the events into a voxel grid and then you pass it through a neural network like E2Bit or other FireNet and so on. Um, but then we don't know what's happening inside the network. Instead, the, if you know the events depend on the motion. So motion and brightness are intrinsically related in the events. And uh, what we kind of advocate for is another pipeline that will have a bit more modularity in it. And out of the two problems, if you have to compute from a single event, from the events, both things, the optical flow and the brightness, computing the optical flow is much more difficult. And once you know the optical flow, you can compute this image of warp event and go into the absolute intensity, it's basically solving a linear system of equations. Uh, so that's kind of what we do in this one that was recently accepted at PAMI. And when we compare our solution with the previous one, we see that they are on par. You know, the, the metrics are it's difficult to tell um, because they are biased, but just wanted to put it forward. And then animal observation. This is the work of Peter Hammer, who is part of the Science of Intelligence Excellence Cluster. We have in, in Berlin, we are trying to um, analyze natural intelligence, understand it, and replicate it with a synthetic agent. With this, uh, currently, what we are doing is we are recording with a co capture system that has both frames and events, as you can see on the bottom left. We are recording fish and we are recording mice and uh, other animals like birds. And we are the first step is quantifying animal behavior. This is something that uh, I think Costas is also working on in the UK and aviary. And that's it. So if you want to know more, I hope you have the chance to talk to the students at New Berlin. Thank you very much. Any questions while we change speakers? Daniel? Yeah. I was wondering, so the, the image reconstruction work, 
we said that the uh, events of the information, but what happens if the content of that? Can you repeat the question? Yeah, the question is, um, I was the the pipeline that I show is when it um, basically for events that are triggered by motion. The question is, what happens if you have events that are triggered by blinking lights? Right. Well, in that case, uh, the method doesn't work so well. I mean, that's one of the assumptions of the method, right? And if if you don't satisfy the assumption, then uh, it it's not so great. Um, I mean, basically, now we are exploiting the um, as the constant bias assumption, right? So, if you have good flow, and basically the the blinking lights, what it's uh, destroying is the flow, right? But if you have the flow, no matter if you have blinking lights or not, I think the initial construction would be better. The idea in that paper is not so much the the, the link lights, which is definitely a problem, is to put the idea that if um, if you have two problems, one of them is easier to solve than the other one. And currently, we are doing this end-to-end -end, uh, estimation from events to images. Uh, but you would like to have more than the image, right? You would like to know the motion. If possible, we should try to aim at doing both. I mean, it's something that um, it was kind of done a long time ago. Uh, remember this paper at CDTR 2016 by Andrew Davison, and he was using the image intensity to help estimate flow, but we cannot depart it from that. Afterwards, we we were taking these two separate problems. All right, thank you very much. I think now we are ready for Ken. So Ken is the student at uh, Costa Stanley Linux Lab, and uh, he will be presenting next. So I wanted to go over the M3ED, the multi-robot, multi-sensor. Oh. Uh, okay. I did not know that. I'm sorry. Did you know that? Never mind. Let's go ahead. Uh, the screen's not shared. I was no. told very last minute. I apologize. Okay. Um, so this is the new event camera data set that our group has come out with. It's a collaboration amongst uh, Costa, CJ Taylor, uh, Vijay Kumar, and Annie Shea, um, along with uh, Fernando Cladera, uh, Claude Wang, and Anthony Vasolko. So we wanted to motivate why another event camera data set a little bit. And so Two of the big players in event camera data sets are MVSEC and DSEC, and we all know and love them. And we wanted to really address some of the uh, core issues and also just update a little bit. So in MVSEC, it's fairly old sensors is primarily what we're targeting. With DSEC, it's primarily driving sequences, which is what makes it great, really nice, smooth uh, highway and you know, really nice streets that we're driven on. And that's absolutely wonderful. But uh, like Philly, for example, does not have wonderful streets, um, <laughs> for example. <laughs> so, and one of the other components is that we really want to have an impact on the robotics community by addressing edge cases that are more and more being uh, studied and addressed uh, in these larger systems, like what Vijay Kumar's group really does. And so, Within that, um, in the event camera world, we wanted to address some more of the IMO issues, high bandwidth from new, newer generation sensors, and also high amounts of vibrations that we see in certain platforms. Does this work? Okay. Do we have internet? Do we? Is it working? It might be. Okay. So. <laughs> Okay, I'm not, I'm going to give up on the video and just let <laughs> Fernando go over the systems, I apologize. Okay, uh, so this is an overview of the system that we use. Uh, as you see, it's a very compact uh, platform uh, in which we are integrating all the sensors all together. Um, and the interesting approach is that uh, we are using the same uh, hardware for the different platforms we're, we're running on. So there is no need of major updates when changing between platforms. Um, the system is composed of an Auster OS1 LiDAR. It's an automated grade LiDAR with 24 channels. 
uh, there we see that it's an in-house uh, computer uh, vision sensor that we developed in our lab with open robotics that has a stereo pair uh, plus uh, um, military grade IMU, uh, high quality IMU. Um, and we have the um, uh, two event cameras, high resolution event cameras from Prophecy, and we also have uh, RTK GPS. We use the same platform in three different, uh, um, the same uh, sensor stack in three different platforms, the Falcon 4 UV, a car and a Boston dynamic spot. And we have three environments, forest, indoor and urban. Um, so these are the platforms that we, I just mentioned. Um, so you see that the sensor stack is the same one among uh, all of them. Um, quick overview on the uh, hardware uh, part. Uh, we focus on having hardware synchronized signals between the different uh, sensors. And the key for doing this is the OVC that can generate from the um, high resolution uh, IMU uh, pulses uh, that we have can decimate uh, trigger signals to different sensors. Um, with these trigger signals, we're feeding uh, the, uh, grayscale, uh, the grayscale cameras, the RGB cameras, the OUSER, and also the uh, event cameras. Um, and it's important to know that uh, all the uh, processing uh, of the events is done after the fact. So we're collecting raw data and we're processing, processing that afterwards. And this is a key uh, part of our uh, platform because something that we're observing with high resolution event cameras on highly textured environments is that the event count can go quite high, up to 200 megabits per second. And doing the processing of those events uh, in real time is, is one of the challenges that, that we're showing with, with this data set. Um, so we are collecting all the data and we're processing it uh, after the fact. We did some uh, improvements on uh, how to collect such a huge amount of data. As I had mentioned, we are uh, recording raw um, uh, data from the different sensors. Um, and we are trying to not mess with the uh, parameters of the event cameras. We're disabling the uh, event ray controllers so that, so that these um, systems do not affect the data we're getting from, from the event camera. Um, some statistics of the data set around 130 files, uh, some of 66, 65 of them are useful recordings. We have a, a few bunch of uh, calibrations. And these are the numbers we are uh, talking about when we talk about high resolution event cameras in very, um, very uh, highly textured uh, em environments. So one of the challenges with uh, creating a data set like this is uh, just doing the event camera calibration itself. And so uh, we found that approximate image reconstruction is sufficient for April tag grids. And this was uh, work that was done by Bern Frommer, who was a former postdoc within Costas's group. And uh, this is the wonderful uh, reconstruction library link down here. And we follow a standard uh, caliber pipeline after we do that reconstruction. For ground truth pose, uh, we leverage faster LEO uh, so that we can have the same quality of the pose in GPS denied environments, uh, such as the forest indoors, or even Philadelphia city center, where you have uh, large sky rises. Uh, and you get multi-pathing of the GPS itself. And just uh, qualitatively, we observe about a one meter drift uh, for the longest sequence uh, that we have, which is City Hall, uh, that single loop. Let's see if this video chooses to work. But on the left, you can see the uh, art museum, the map that we were able to generate uh, from, from the Philadelphia Art Museum of Spot walking up the steps. And from uh, ground truth odometry and uh, a ground truth map, we're able to generate a ground truth depth for our static portions of the scene. Okay, continue. Um, and one of the core things that we found out while we were uh, working on generating the ground truth depth is with the higher resolutions, uh, you often see through objects because the point clouds are sparse. It's a small detail that wasn't uh, needed to be addressed in the original MV sec just because the, uh, the resolution was significantly lower. Um, and so we actually dug a um, method out from a little while ago, um, just doing the hidden point operator on the point cloud itself gives us only the points that are directly visible from the current viewpoint. 
And then for semantic classes uh, for the data set, uh, we warp images using the calibrated camera geometries, and we get a class label uh, for every image frame uh, with intern image, uh, and it matches the cityscape labels. And for where to grab the data, uh, we have a QR code and um, pretty, e we think, easy to remember uh, URL, m3ed.io. <laughs> What's that stand for? M3 ED, so we remember. Multi robot, multi sensor, multi environment. Multi multi multi. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, when you were recording with the one minute extreme cameras, mm -hmm. uh, did you uh, notice any data drops or timing issues with the events on the loop? So we did not run into any data drops after we migrated over to the EVT3 uh, recording directly. Um, the area that we saw data drops early in data collection uh, was when we were trying to do a live decoding of these packets. Uh, and that was the portion of the system that couldn't uh, really keep up. Uh, because if you're talking about like one, one gigabyte per second of events uh, per camera, you have to push that data into RAM and out of RAM multiple times and also into an NVMe drive. And so all of this uh, memory bandwidth uh, and drive bandwidth uh, just wasn't uh, working with trying to record raw events. That's why we switched over to the EBT3 uh, packet recording. Um, we verify some of this uh, just A, visually, but B, we also look at the accuracy of the uh, pulse per second timestamps, which gets injected into the event stream itself. And we, uh, uh, we specifically look at any uh, skew or abnormalities in the pulse per second trigger that gets sent into the event cameras. Um, and I mean, we were very happy that uh, we, we saw excellent results well within um, the, the clock's accuracy. Um, so, yeah. How big is the thing? How big is the module with your hands? Um, I want to say it's like that big or so, some somewhere in there. Um, I and what computer is inside there? It's just a standard Intel Nook, tenth generation. Um, it was the latest generation at that point that um, Vijay Kumar's group was flying with, uh, and they go through an extensive validation process to make sure they aren't going to fall out of the air. Um, so. Mm -hmm. It's more out of curiosity, but mm -hmm. how, how do you control spot robot? Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah. So uh, the spot robot, um, you get a little uh, uh, joystick and a screen, um, and you can just walk them around. You can put them into stair mode to go upstairs. Um, so we actually do a good number of stairs uh, later, we were told. Potentially, we shouldn't have, um, but we have the data now, so that's the important part. <laughs> but how does Spot see the stairs itself? Oh, um, Spot has, uh, I believe, it's uh, time of flight sensors on the front, sides, and back. So it's able to estimate the parameters of the step going up and coming back down, uh, and it actually walks backwards down the stairs if, um, for those curious. So we don't have any data of spot walking forward down the stairs because uh, spot will flip if you do that. <laughs> Definitely not from experience. We didn't test that yet. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. We have a break now. No, we are having Boxin Xi online because he couldn't get the visa to come here. Oh, 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 oh. Uh, wait a second. Hmm? Boxing, can you hear us? Yes. Yeah. 
Yes, I can hear you. <clears throat> mm. Have the, you, you, yeah, I can hear you. I can hear you. Sound. Uh -huh. Maybe he logged out on his canoe. Okay. Oh, there, yeah. But is Penny on mute himself? He's, he's, he's yeah. you ask, on yeah, let me try. Is the volume? You have to be some other guy. Oh, that's you, all right. Somebody else. I can hear you, but there are big echoes. <laughs> So you can hear me now?
check, check boxing. This is the view on the Yeah, I think it was much better. Okay, now it works. Can you can you speak boxing? Fine. Sure. Can okay. you hear me now? Yeah, now it works. Okay. What so, happened? <laughs> should I try to share my screen? Yes, please. Uh, wait a second. Uh, Can you see the slides? Yes. Can you go to the next one to check? Yes. Yes. Okay. 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 So as, as we said, we swap your talk with the break. So people will be back here at quarter to four. Is that good for you? Sure. It's like 15 minutes later. It's in, yeah, in 15 minutes from now, more or less. Okay, yeah, I will stand by, yeah.
Hey, boxing. Hey, hey, hey. Yeah. Hi, boxing. Let me introduce you. Sure, please go ahead. Yeah, I can hear you. Great, thanks. So welcome back. We now have to resolve these technical issues and we have on the other side of the world, uh, Professor Boxing Chi, who is leading the um, um, uh, Computational Photography Laboratory at Peking University. And he is uh, author of quite a few uh, contributions in CVPR, ICCB, ECCB, and uh, works a lot on uh, computational photography and also event processing for video synthesis and image reconstruction. So we are very excited. Thanks very much for joining online, and waking up early to deliver the talk. We're sorry that you could not come here in presence, but uh, we'll hope to meet you soon. Okay, great. So our thanks to organizer for the invitation and the introduction. Uh, yeah, this is a pity that I, uh, due to the visa issue, I cannot uh, attend the conference in person. So I'm delivering my talk uh, online for the event-based vision workshop at CVPR 23rd, uh, which is entitled New Cap, Neuromorphic Camera Aided Photography. Here, uh, for the word new, actually it has two meanings. One is for the NEU stands for neuromorphic, or I think people should be aware of this concept after listening to so many wonderful talks in this workshop. And it also has the same pronunci pronunciation of the new NEW, uh, which means uh, by integrating the neuromorphic cameras into the conventional photography pipeline, I hope to uh, bring a new experience to the digital photography or that, that is really to um, enhance the uh, traditional uh, photography uh, experience as pipeline. So actually for the audience, uh, for the audience, uh, on site, can 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 they see see the, see the screen of my slides? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So actually, we know that the problem-based cameras they are problematic. Um, we have been using it for so many years, uh, but they they are slow. Uh, they capture a lot of redundant information. And all the information between each adjacent frame, they actually get lost. And also uh, they have low dimension range. And if the neuromorph vision or particularly the event-based camera actually can uh, provide a good solution to many uh, problems that we have been encountered during the uh, traditional image pipeline. Uh, so people are familiar with the event cameras. It has a lot of advantages in terms of low latency, high dynamic range in terms of our, for our capturing images. Uh, here are a few examples. So I, I will skip this very quickly because uh, we have been listening so many wonderful talks are for in the workshop. Uh, very quickly, I also want to mention our another type of our neuromorphic camera, which is called the spy camera. Our, it works in an integration manner that for a pixel, the light intensity is ac accumulated. Or if the accumulated intensity reaches this past threshold, a spike is fired and the accumulator is reset. So the viral signal is represented as zero and one. Uh, Maybe here is a more intuitive example. Uh, the first spy camera uh, is designed by uh, the group uh, led by Professor Tiejun Huang in Peking University in 2018 uh, with a special resolution of 100,000 pixels and a temporary resolution of 40K uh, frames per second. So here is, a, uh, we have captured the, uh, we, ha we have captured the high-speed train in China uh, actually, the train is moving at 350 uh, kilometers per hour. We are capturing the data by sitting on the train and watching the, 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 the other train uh, from the other direction. So actually, the relative speed is 700 kilometers uh, per hour. Uh, for, from the spike raw data, it looks like this. For one second, we have four PK planes like this. And for each of the planes, for each pixel, we will have the, either the black or the white pixels. 
And when we do some integration or the reconstruction method, we can get the uh, image, the clear image of how a fast scene is, uh, is moving. So comparing to the event-based camera, the spy camera, it has uh, more data has to be required to record it. But one of the good thing uh, or the property is that the rich texture information will be captured as well, because when there is no motion, uh, the spike signal is also uh, accumulated or recorded uh, when it uh, reaches the threshold. So actually in today's talk, I would like to, sh to share some of my uh, recent progress in my lab uh, from, the neuro from, from this direction, that is a uh, neuromorphic combining the conventional images. And in our lab, we also do some uh, computational photography research for other type of non-conventional sensors and some interesting problems in computer vision as well. Our and the website is camera.pku, which is very easy to remember. Uh, as the title suggests, uh, we want to introduce our new pipeline uh, with the neuromorphic aided photography. So maybe let's look at look take a look at the pre uh, conventional ISP or the camera pipeline. Uh, people should be very familiar with this one. But when we have in this pipeline, actually there are some bottlenecks or some problems that we encountered uh, when we capture the photo. For example, in front of the lens, uh, due to the conventional design of the lens, we might have the autofocus problem. And due to the limited well capacity and the exposure times, uh, too short, we have the uh, dark images and too long, we will have the bright or saturated pixels, which is the LDR, the low dynamic range in, uh, image. And also, uh, because usually for a chip signal sensor, the signals is read out row by row, uh, we will encounter the rolling shutter artifacts. And there are the no noise issue and tone reproduction, which also affect the dynamic range and the frame rate. So let's look at the problem one by one. For the autofocus problem, if we introduce event camera to capture the event focal stack, we will have an all in focus image experience. Uh, this is a work in this year's VPR, and uh, we, will, we have a poster and probably a courtesy presentation in this workshop as well. Uh, but I, so I, I will briefly introduce a big key idea of how we use event focal stack to conduct the all in focus imaging. Uh, when we capture the scene using a conventional camera, usually uh, we can only uh, focus on the one depth plane. So there's only one depth, which is in focus. Uh, of course, we can capture multiple images so that we have multiple depth in focus. But usually this is done in a discrete, discrete manner. But if we have the event signal and we, when we rotate, for example, the rotate the, um, the focus ring of the, of the lens, we will have this kind of all the depth information and focus captured by the event focal stack because this one moves very fast and it records information of the depth, change, depth changes with, with, with respect to the focus in a continuous manner. This is what we call event focal stack. Uh, of course, if we want to get an all in focus image, we can de-blur a defocused image, but this is a very uh, uh, highly ill post problem. Uh, and we can also do image focal stack, but this requires careful operation and consumes a long time and usually collect in a discrete manner. We can also do the focal sweeping by sweeping the focal plane, focal point in a single exposure. The information is collected from all depths, but the depth information has been lost. So comparing to all these previous solutions, uh, we, when we do the event focal stack, the intensity, uh, the latent intensity frame changes as the focal uh, point moves and the events uh, it actually encodes the logarithm changes of the intensity. And it builds a connection for the uh, latent intensity frames in between, for example, for the epsilon D1 and D2, this kind of continuous information uh, about the focal changes has been recorded in the event stream, uh, of, of, also for D2 and D3. That means if we have an, only one image for, uh, without losing general, that, uh, generality, let's say we have the ID1, then actually we can, uh, this is a defocused image, uh, can this focus on any unknown uh, focus distance. When we have the event focal stack, we can actually reconstruct the latent image focused at any distance based on the relationship here. So based on this principle, we can develop uh, a pipeline that solves the problem. When we take in a single image plus the event focal stack as input, uh, we can conduct a golden search uh, method for the rig focus timestamp, and then for the reconstruction uh, about the image focal stack. And finally, we do the merge to get the all in focus image. Uh, let's review the pipeline step by step. For the first step, uh, we do it in a patch wise manner. Uh, let's say we have n times n patches. And for each patch of the image, uh, we use the golden 
read through the algorithm to find the moment when it was in focus. Uh, and then in the second step, for each refocus time step, uh, we develop a very simple neural network called EV focus net to reconstruct the refocused image from the input images plus the event focal stack. This forming an event uh, focal stack as we uh, here for ID1, D2 until DN, we can get the image focal stack. And in the third step, we can predict the merging uh, weights uh, with another simple neural network called the EV merge net. Actually, this can also be uh, calculated in using traditional method. We just find that the uh, simple neural net network can uh, do this problem in a uh, more noise robust manner. Uh, then, of course, if we do the weighted average uh, according to the calculated weights, we can get an only focus results. Uh, we use Blender uh, to render th uh, the high frame rate focus with videos by randomly scattering the objects. And then we can use our event simulator to get the event focal stack. Uh, this is for our training test, uh, for uh, training data set. For the testing, we can build a hybrid camera with the event camera and the machine vision camera uh, synchronized by the beam splitter uh, as a real test data. So, for the first part of the experiment, we would like to test whether our method can effectively remove the out of focus blur. Given an in defocused image and event stack, uh, we can see actually for the all in fo focus image, we, uh, our method is clear on almost everywhere with respect to the ground truth. Well, uh, using single image based method to remove the out of focus blur is, is not an easy task. So uh, existing methods are, might fail on, in some, some regions. And this is a result on the real data without the ground truth. Yeah, you, we can see that how our method get clearly uh, observation, clear observations on in all these patches. Um, we can also easily do the refocusing uh, given the input event focus stacks, uh, one image focus at an arbitrary distance. It actually, it's blurred everywhere. And we can click on a point to get the refocus. Actually, I like this video very much. So. You can feel how the event flows with, re with respect to the uh, changing a uh, change of changes of the focus distance. Actually, all this kind of in useful information along the edges uh, at which distance it should be clear has been recorded continuously. This is another example. A third example. This is on uh, the previous two are on synthetic data. This is a uh, uh, the result on the real data. This is another example. Okay, so when we solve the problem uh, about the lenses, let's move a little bit further into the camera pipeline. Uh, when the well capacity reaches uh, its maximum, our, uh, usually we get a saturated pixels. Uh, this is what we want to solve using the HDR imaging. Uh, this is another paper that we uh, presented this year, CVPR, uh, because we know that we are, uh, the human vision is very good at sensing the high dynamic range and we are living in the real world with very high dynamic range. But uh, when we do the digital photography, uh, your uh, traditional method is that we need to merge uh, multi bracketing images, but this cannot sense moving objects. And if we want to do it in a single image manner, uh, like the inverse tone mapping, uh, this is very ill posed problem. Of course, we can, with the event based cameras, we can do the integration uh, from the event to images, but this is still uh, has limited resolution and color appearance uh, representation power. Uh, so actually, uh, in CBPR 2020, uh, our group is also the first one, to, uh, the first to propose to build a hybrid camera system that combines conventional cameras and event cameras for HDR images and videos. Uh, the, our previous solution is like we first integrate or do the reconstruction uh, to get the luminous part of the high dynamic range of the scene. And then, of course, this part is, is saturated in the conventional images, and we ca calculate the weight to comp comp uh, complement them. And after, uh, after the uh, fusion, luminous fusion, we add back the color. But this pipeline has some problem is that actually this part is very difficult uh, in, from the event to the luminous integration. It might introduce some artifacts. So in this work, we try to propose our solution in the shared space, uh, the feature space, uh, and to solve the problems to, to better complement the features from these two are uh, modality of data uh, to enhance the uh, temporal consistency of color appearance of the HDR video. So our motivation is that we want to avoid explicitly uh, reconstructing our the event 
to the intensity first to avoid the artifacts. So this is down our, to, to solve this issue, uh, there are two questions that need to be answered. So how to represent events and LDR frames in a shared latent space and how to extract the uh, common and complementary information uh, for HDR reconstruction. This is achieved by a multi-model representation alignment strategy. First, for the upper branch, uh, we perform the intermodality reconstruction. Uh, it is still, we, we still need this kind of conversion, but we put it in, in this space. And for the bottom branch, we perform the intermodality reconstruction. Actually, this is convert the LDR to the HDR. And the decoder is, is fixed, and it's shared in uh, between uh, these two branches. Uh, then what we need is a shared representation space that complement the, these two different modalities of data. This is achieved by designing some confidence map and the fusion is actually in two dimensions. The other one is one, one is a, uh, this kind of a channel wise. The other one is a spatial wise. Uh, we designed this kind of net network architecture and to fuse this kind of shared information are in the FH to better unify these two uh, different representations. But still, uh, if we look at the videos, we will uh, encounter the flickering artifacts. This is brought by the uh, inconsistent textures, especially from the LDR frames. To solve this problem, we further propose a temporal context encoding uh, to introduce the temporal correlation to further uh, alleviate, flick uh, alleviate flickering and reduce the noise. Uh, this is also verified on a, this kind of a hybrid camera system. Uh, for the quantitative evaluation using the synthetic data, uh, we will easily observe the set large area of separation in LDR frames, but the event actually has a lot of useful information here. And this is ground choose. This is our result. The number here is HDR VDP score. Uh, and this is our comparison to the hybrid method uh, using event camera. And this is single image based method. And this is our E2 VID uh, for using the colors uh, color, color event from the David 3, 4, 6C camera. Uh, still, you can see this kind of, uh, although we, by reconstructing the events, we get the HDR information, but the color appearance is still not satisfactory. That's why uh, we still need the LDR images uh, with better color appearance. And this one is from another method which used, merges two exposures. But this one, because they do not provide the linear data, so we cannot calculate the score here. This is evaluation of real data. Uh, for the image, the hybrid method, single, E2 VID. Uh, this is another one that tried to denoise and super dissolve the images, but this one does not have color information. And this is a um, qualitative result on the synthetic data for videos. You can see how uh, our result, actually, let's look at it again, um, has smooth uh, temporal uh, uh, performance as well as a uh, uh, good color appearance. And this is a result on the real data. Okay, so when we, in this part of the camera pipeline, actually we also have this kind of rolling shadow effect. It's because for a cheap CMOS sensor, usually the signal is read, uh, read out row by row. Uh, actually, this is last year's CVPR work. Uh, so I, I, I just used two minutes to uh, review it very quickly. So uh, this video demonstrates the rolling shadow artifacts. Uh, it distorts edges of this moving fan, the rotating fan. And also because of occlusion, the, the text of CVPR 2020 uh, get lost uh, for this in its rolling shadow image because of this kind of uh, uh, row by row reading out mechanism. But when we have the event information, it actually continuously record uh, a lot of rich in temporal information about the hidden or the occluded scenes and also the correct motion information about the rotating fan. So our idea is why not we just combine the row RS images with the uh, events uh, for both the motion estimation to this undistort edges, and also use the event to image reconstruction to uh, bring back the occluded regions. So at, a, at that time, uh, we proposed EV, EV and RO, which was the first uh, trial to combine the event signals for uh, correcting the rolling shadow artifacts. Uh, after that, I think there are some follow-up works which already have even better performances. Uh, and in last year's CVPR, we also built a hybrid camera for test, the real test data set, and because we do, we have the event signal, the output uh, video, it, it is not only global shutter, uh, but also uh, it is high frame rate. Just to quickly look at some results. 
or you can uh, see comparing to the rolling shutter ones, how the shape of the train get undistorted and how it looks like a uh, uh, high frame rate continuous video. Okay, so the last work I would like to share are, it's also about HDR and also we try to in increase the frame rate at the same time, but this time we are using a spy camera uh, to achieve the 1000 FPS HDR and a high frame rate video. Uh, actually, using the tra traditional frame-based camera to capture HDR video is very challenging. If we use very short exposure time to increase the frame rate, uh, we will encounter a lot of noise. But if you use long exposure, there will be severe motion blur. Uh, we can use exposure bracketing by combining the short exposure, uh, the middle exposure, uh, and the, the long exposure to complement their advantages. Uh, this is a good way to do HDR in video domain. Uh, but the thing is that there are a lot of time has been wa wasted for the read time, for the readout, and also for the wait in between the frames. This is our, actually the, the key problem of frame-based uh, cameras. But when we have the spy camera or uh, uh, similarly the event camera, actually it captures continuous fast motion in high dynamic range. This is raw data of the bike, uh, this kind of one zero one zero signals in a fast continuous manner. Uh, this has the potential for achieving both the high frame rate HFIR and HDR video. And we also build a uh, hybrid system by synchronizing these two types of cameras. And also we use the alternating exposure uh, from the RGB uh, from the RGB cameras, try to uh, encode both the uh, motion and also the uh, 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 some frames with less noise. And of course we have the spike trains as input. And hopefully our output is HFR and HDR video. So here is the idea. Uh, we have the spike signal. It has a continuous motion information. We can build it, but by simple integration, we can have the spike frame and accurate optical flow information. For the shot exposure images, uh, it often contains noise, but we can use the spike frames uh, from different from uh, to warp the middle and long exposure uh, images back to reduce the noise for it. And for the middle exposure, of, of also uh, we can we hope this can a spike frame can help to do the deep blur, uh, which happens to the long exposure as well. Of course, this one has the uh, fewest no uh, the the less noise, but uh, uh, most severe motion blur. So we hope the alternating exposure frames they can complement each other, guided by the spike frame. Actually, the spike frame and the accurate optical flow information from spike frame it. it works as the guidance to interpolate and to warp to align all these frames. So there are three steps. So for the first step, we do some pre-processing for the spike frame to estimate the optical flow and to reconstruct the, reconstruct the spike frames. And for the RGB frames, uh, we need to deblur it for the middle exposure as a reference and use the spike frames for its calculated optical flow information to uh, as a guidance for the deblur operation for the middle exposure image. And then we we'll warp the adjacent shop exposure images to align with the spike uh, guided by the optical flow. This helps to reduce the noise in the shot exposure information. And also uh, because this one has relatively uh, less motion blur, um, so the color appearance of these two different uh, expo exposed frames will be merged with each other. Uh, so, and the sub spike frames also helps to uh, interpolate the four like, like in our setup the middle exposure has four times uh uh longer time than the uh, short exposure so it will be interpolated to four shaft frames and the long exposure will be interpolated to 12 shaft frames and but there are still some in, interval time this is not recorded in the frame based camera but the spike is much is continuous signal comparing to these uh discrete frames so this kind of information, the color appearance between them is also guided by the optical flow uh, to bring the color information from these uh, frames uh, to the spike frames. And by combining them, we get the high frame rate. Uh, uh, there are some other merging modules as well uh, for the refinement of the signals by taking input of the interpolated color frames uh, and spike frames um, by using different uh, encoders uh, for feature extraction and a decoder to reflexively map the deep features uh, back to the current output uh, in the HDR domain. So this is the result. This is on a real synthetic data, meaning that this HDR, the, the RGB are real and the frame spikes are synthesized. 
Here, actually, this is a good example to a uh, very intuitive one to demonstrate. This is short exposure, middle exposure, long exposure. Uh, you, you can set how the short exposure ones with the correct uh, motion, but this one gets blurred, uh, but better color appearance. But this is still like we are playing the slide. Uh, it's not continuous motion. But with the spike information encoded and uh, well fused, we will get this kind of smoothed and uh, high frame rate video in the HDR domain. This is on the real data. We can compare with some uh, camera phones uh, commercially available. This is our result. By comparing with those phones uh, commercially available, uh, they cannot sense that fast motion uh, compared to the spike guided uh, video reconstruction. This is another example. And the final comparison is with a conventional high speed camera, but this one is a still frame based one. Uh, in order to achieve a frame, high frame like this, uh, in a very short explore time for each one, for each frame. So the color and piece looks a, a little bit strange. And this is our result. Right. To wrap up, so when we solve all this problem where we integrate the neural market cameras, it can be a spy camera, it can be an event camera into the conventional IP or the camera pipeline. We can solve the autofocus problem uh, by conducting event by uh, by capturing event focal stack for only focus imaging. We can also uh, work in a shared latency feature space for HDR video reconstruction to remove the uh, rolling shutter artifacts and do the high frame rate and high resolution imaging. So uh, let me go back to the title, the new calf. Uh, we have shown some very initial results by integrating the neuromorphic camera that really aid the traditional photography to conquer the some bottlenecks, like the frame rate bottleneck, uh, like the uh, low dynamic rate bottleneck. But this is just to, to hope, we hope, or I hope that this can inspire the future research. And finally, I think there are still great potential like the, for either the event camera or the spy camera, the time, time, temper resolution is actually at a microsecond level, but the high speed video we are uh, recording using this kind of hybrid system cannot still, still cannot reach that level. Meaning there is still some gap between the super photography and hopefully uh, one day we can put the word here, uh, like the neural uh, new cap becomes like uh, really the super uh, photography that conquers some so to bring some invisible or some ex photo digital photography experience that can never be uh, experienced using the conventional photography. Yeah, that's that's pretty much of my talk. Thank you very much. I'm ready to take questions. Thank you very much. So, any questions for Boxing C? So we can come close to the microphone. Yes. So uh, for the all in for the all in for transmitting, so uh, you use a hybrid camera. So this share the two camera share one lens, or they have different lens. Ah, oh, okay. Yeah, this is actually we use a hybrid camera system uh, to synchronize them. We uh, we use a beam splitter to uh, synchronize the camera. Uh, then we rotate the. Uh, the, the the zoom uh, not not the zoom the focus ring of the lens. Uh, so the kind of information is kind of are synchronously captured by both the event camera and the uh, and the RGB camera. Okay, my understanding is you doing the really in focus in the post post right? Uh, just search the best focus. Uh, sorry, I I had a kick. So you are doing the really focus, focus in the post processing. Mm -hmm. uh, any focal distance or just certain for the best focus? Oh, it, it, can, it can be in any focal distance. Yeah, because the event uh, event focal stack is capturing all the uh, depth information with respect, uh, all the focus information with re respect to different depths. Okay, all right, thank you. Thank you. Any other question? Well, if not, you can always write an email to Boxin or contact him. Thank you very much. Thank you.
করে Okay, so our next speaker is uh, Yulia Sanamizkaya. She's kind of very well known in our um, in our field. She has also participated in previous editions of the workshop. And this is, I guess, a joint presentation with Andrea Swan, who couldn't come. Um, yeah, kind of, Yulia is now in uh, two places, right? In yeah. Munich and yes, yeah, sure. <laughs> Okay. We love to. Yeah, thank, thanks a lot. Yeah, thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so I'll put my Intel's hat here and we'll represent Intel's near multi computing lab. I also have a new university position at the Zurich University of Applied Sciences, but here I know all, all Intel. Um, I'm jumping in for Andreas Welt, who could only join remotely, and we thought a live participant might be better for you guys, even a heavily jet lagged one. Um, so I will talk about visual processing with Loihi 2. Um, so I will present tools and systems that we have developed so far and are developing now for you to use Leaky 2 for visual processing. All the motivation trying to convince you, great, I assume you all know that. Um, I will also save you from just boasting about our results on Leaky 2, so it won't be about that. Just a quick update of where your Morphic Computing Lab stands now on, on tools and systems that you require for visual processing. That being said, for those of you who don't know Loihi, a couple words on what that is. Um, so Loihi is a, um, it's a system, uh, it's a multi-core system that uh, guarantees minimal data movement by tightly integrating compute and memory. So it's a multi-core system with uh, a lot of memory associated with every core and with asynchronous processing in these cores. So it's a massively parallel system and supports event-driven computation and communication. Um, we have systems that you know, one can try out and use um, from on a scale from edge computing to large scale computing like data center computing. Um, and, and this device is you now part of the event-based family. And we are now working on event-based vision applications uh, that Loihi will support in the near future. Uh, and, and that's shown like in, in a second thing. So we have uh, input output exposed through Goldfinger connections that will allow to use um, this system, Loihi system for uh, low latency applications. And we're also working on tight integration between event-based cameras and, and Loihi chip. And then hardware is of course great, but hardware is only as good as the software that is out there that enables users to use it. And, and Intel now invests a lot in developing software framework, software tool chain uh, with the core component called Lava. So that's the software framework that goes all the way from um, you know, talking to the hardware, so having a compiler and the runtime um, that supports different backends, CPU, GPU, and Loihi. Um, conceptually, we could support other neuromorphic platforms as well, but we, of course, will rely on the community developing you know, compiler and all the low-level software to support different hardware systems. And then we have the, kind of the user interface, the API, Lava, uh, that allows you, you know, using high-level Python language draft the networks that you would like to put on Loihi. Uh, and its uh, framework is event-based, multi-parity, multi-abstraction, multi-platform, open source, importantly. Um, the core element of this framework are processes. So we say everything is a process. The neuron is a process that runs over time, can communicate with other processes, other neurons. If you have a layer in your network, that will be a process. And you can combine multiple such layers in a you know, large system that can run on heterogeneous platforms. So part of it can run on a CPU, some can run on a GPU, and some can run on Loihi, and they all communicate with each other in this event-based paradigm. Um, and then we also develop a layer of uh, libraries or algorithm libraries. So these are different frameworks with which you can configure neuromorphic hardware or Loihi in, in particular. And deep learning is one of these frameworks. We have another one for optimization workloads, um, another one for you know, attractor dynamics or vector symbolic architectures, and, and more could come and be added to them to the list. So the systems that we offer now um, for users, so the one system is called Capoho Point. It's the credit size card um, type of a system uh, with eight chips on it. So there are four on one side and four on the other side. 
Um, you can have uh, networks with up to 8 million neurons, um, like almost 1 billion synapses. Uh, supports different interfaces, and I'll talk a bit more about this in a second. The dimensions, like I can show it like, like this. Uh, so pretty compact system, and it's stackable. Um, so you can, you can expand it, it's scalable. Um, okay, so the system architecture. So this is the Loihi board. Uh, we interface this with this, something we call host computer. It's a Cyclone um, B with ARM core processor, um, which mainly supports the gigabit Ethernet interface into Loihi. There also will be a 10 gigabit interface going directly into the chip. Right, so it looks like this. And then additionally to that, we have another board that is there to support direct interface to event-based cameras, to event-based sensors with an FPGA just to make that efficient. So another view on, on the whole system. Um, so Loihi can be configured using a host computer, host CPU, you know, with all the system memory. Um, you can use a number of interfaces, you know, PCI, Ethernet, you know, USB or maybe your favorite interface to connect to different sensors. And we are now looking into standard RGB camera, RealSense, uh, RGBD camera, a DVS camera. A DVS camera will additionally have a direct asynchronous hardware interface for low latency applications uh, to low EC accelerator. And then you can also have other accelerators in the overall system. We are currently working on example application that puts together an RGBD camera and an event-based camera. So we're developing software to do pre-processing of both event stream and RGBD stream on the host computer. Um, and then, um, so we are now working on enabling the hardware support for fast input-output interface uh, that will allow you to have really low latency applications on the EHIM. And then on top of that, they have all these uh, algorithms that can be you know, deep learning based algorithms or other ones. Um, so this under construction bit is the very important one. So I'm, I'm also waiting impatiently for it to be ready. And it um, like officially will be released to our users uh, in the community in Q3 this year. So how we, uh, or how our partners and, and us use the neuromorphic uh, chip today for vision applications is in this pipeline. So most people still like to use deep learning because you now that has a clear framework and easy way to design algorithms. Um, so here in the pipeline, you, you have a kind of one pipeline for training the network and then you can use different tools to do that. We, we use Slayer to train networks directly in SNN domain. You can train network as a artificial neural network and then transfer it into uh, uh, into SNN domain. Um, and then we have the interface using HDF5 files to kind of port your network on Loihi for inference. Um, and then, uh, so the network will be expressed as these processes, Lava processes, as I said, so each layer will be a process. You have your network, you um, it will be compiled, put on the chip, and you can run your inference. So that's the pipeline that we have today. And, and today, uh, most of the solutions, they use more or less conventional deep neural network architectures, you know, CNNs, transformers, in their spiking uh, version. Because we are on a neuromorphic hardware, then usually we won't be able to put you know, your favorite very large language model on a chip. You have limitation with the number of neurons and number of synapses. So usually um, you would have some small scale uh, networks and, and you will target energy constraint, real time embedded you know, applications. So signal processing where you have some simple task, but you need to run it really fast on a really power you know, restrained um, setup or scenario. And these are the examples. So RGB or DVS visual processing for scene analysis, object detection, um, navigation, the pilot net uh, networks are really a simple network, um, which you might want to run very, very efficiently. Audio processing. So there's this DNS challenge that Intel was running for denoising um, applications in, in a small, small form factor um, or motion processing. So for optic load detection um, and motion classification tasks. So this is what we have today. And this is what most people you know, do on the chip today. Um, in the future, um, we would like to develop algorithms that go beyond just deep learning um, and, and develop um, you know, algorithms that really exploit all the features of you know, this asynchronous, um, massively parallel with uh, fine-grained parallelism architecture. Um, and, and one of the methods is training, uh, training sparse models. 
So really exploiting sparsity that can be enabled on, on chip. Um, training recurrent models, because you know, the spike in neural networks, the main feature is that um, you have this recurrency um, and statefulness of your computation in inherent in the hardware. So instead of you know, unfolding your recurrent network um, in time, you just train the recurrent network directly. Uh, optimization is an important workload where we see large gains in um, uh, computing time and power. Um, and then we have uh, you know, this framework that supports designing um, optimization algorithms on, on Moihim. Um, and it can be applied to all kinds of logistics tasks, but also can be applied to you know, landmark extraction, pose estimation, SLAM, um, representing objects um, in graph-like networks on, on chip. Um, and then designing algorithms that are kind of heterogeneous algorithms with different modules. For instance, with an attention module that, that is able to cut out part of your uh, visual field and then do some uh, computing on only on this part uh, with high resolution, but with small, small, small part of the visual field. And then having an algorithm that can shift this attention window to different parts of your, of your visual field. So here you not only have you know, some kind of a deep network that does classification, but you also have an attention algorithm that is a different type of you know, some recurrent neural network probably. And then you have some neural state machine that switches from uh, one region to another one. Sorry, my voice is losing me. <laughs> yeah, so, so in the future, we aim to develop different types of algorithms that really exploit the properties of the hardware. It will be efficient and smart sensing at age, Low latency in, in our language, it's um, workloads below one millisecond latency. Low power in our language is below one watt. Some might uh, argue whether that's low enough. Improved efficiency with event cameras, exploiting the properties of event cameras like high dynamic range or uh, little motion blur. Multi sensor support and support for heterogeneous networks. And importantly, uh, ability to adapt to the networks uh, on the chip. Um, using um, on-chip learning rules, right? That neuromorphic hardware and particularly his support. All right, thanks a lot. I hope I'm on time. Thanks. Any questions for Yulia? Hi, uh, really, really interesting presentation. Um, could you provide more details on your uh, interface between the event cameras and your chips? Uh, it was mentioned high bandwidth and low latency, but if you could provide some numbers, that'd be great. Thank you. Right. So, so the, the bandwidth, so, um, so at the moment, we, the, the, by default, we use the interface that goes over the host computer. And, and there, from the host computer to here, we have 10 gigabit Ethernet. The Ethernet will probably bring you one to two millisecond latency, but you have really high bandwidth. This <coughs> direct interface uh, will be faster. We, we like haven't enabled yet, so I don't have the measurements for you. Um, so so I, I hope that we will also have uh, one millisecond or less additional latency coming from the interface. All right, and then the bandwidth um, also cannot give you a number at the moment, uh, but it could support um, HD video. So for anything event based, that will be kind of more than enough to transfer all events that the camera can output. The camera can output up to 10 giga events, I think, per second. One, one, one giga event per second. Yeah. So it will be definitely enough to ingest that, that kind of data. Can you comment a bit about low EV2? What's the support for convolutional operations um, compared to low EV1? Um, so there's support for convolution so that you can, you don't have to, in Luigi 1, you had to specify like full connectivity matrix, you had to unfold it. Now you don't have to do it. So you can store the kernel uh, and then, no, it will be used. So you don't have to waste a lot of memory to represent all the weights. You don't have to unfold it. So in that sense, it will be more compact. You can have larger networks. So at the moment we are working with Proc, Proc uh, which DVS camera are we planning to, to integrate? Um, so I think over time, uh, like, like all of them, so the ones from innovation and prophecy now very concretely this interface board um, was designed with prophecy gen, gen 4 camera. Yeah, but this board is relatively easy to design, right? So it can be easily supported. 
Yeah. For instance, innovation cameras also have uh, uh, AER interface exposed, and it's now like relatively easy to like, design the, the middleware support to ingest the events from the users. All right, thank you very much. And we'll share the screen. Can we share the other screen? Can I share the other Going through, right? I don't know. Yeah. Okay. We're ready. So the next speaker is Kainan. Kainan Eng. He is co-founder and CEO of Innovation. You know, Innovation has the Davis cameras starting from the 240 and um, the 346, in, and also produces the PV Explorer. Thank you very much. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, thanks very much for the invitation, and uh, I'll, this will be um, not too technical. Uh, I know it's very late. You've all been sitting here through many equations over the day, so this will be fairly fluffy, uh, but hopefully entertaining. So um, in today's talk, I'll just... Can you see the three dots at the top there and get rid of that little box with the X? Do you, do you really need that, Toby? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, I'll start with a very brief uh, look back at how we got here um, from 15 years ago. Talk a little bit more about the limitations and bottlenecks. Um, you know, we've all been working on this type of sensing for quite a while now, so it's probably a good time to reflect on you know, what we're doing right, what we could probably improve. And then I'll talk a little bit, um, the main part of the talk about uh, a candidate next generation sensing technology that we've been working on for about two years now. So let's first look back. Um, I remember very distinctly sitting with Toby um, thinking, okay, we're going to sell a camera, right? We're going to be rich. We're going to sell this camera for a thousand francs. That's about a thousand dollars. And you know, we were really happy that we someone actually paid money for this. Right, that was amazing. And all jokes aside, I think what's even more amazing is that we're all sitting here today. Right, people bought that camera, wrote grant proposals. All of you wrote grant proposals, raised lots and lots of money. Right, even got huge companies to start burning money on this stuff. And hence, we're all sitting here today. So I think it's a um, it's a testament to the creativity and ingenuity of everyone sitting here um, that we've been able to bring this actually very simple idea such a long way. And one of my favorite things in the office is this map. It's on. It's in our demo area showing little dots where someone's running our software and that's usually connected to a camera, right? So it's a lot of countries. Um, you can see above the North Pole for reference, um, our Sydney colleagues, of course, have got it onto the ISS. and what um, not all of you may know is that uh, Guillermo, he didn't want me to say this, but um, he sent one to Antarctica uh, to record penguins. Uh, so that paper is under review. So you, hopefully you'll hear about that sometime soon. So it's been everywhere, right? And so, you know, so what's the point of all of this, right? We've got to get some applications, you know, start justifying all of this money that's been uh, spent on this stuff. And so I'm not going to go through a whole list of these. I'll, I'll just mention three um, representative examples, right? Um, so one I would classify as a sort of industrial vision example. Um, 
In this one, our customer is actually sticking cameras under trains and doing train slam, right? And you think, you know, I thought train positioning was a solved problem. Turns out it's not. Um, and so they're currently scaling this up in the UK and they have some um, proof of concept testing going on in some other countries. The second one is an IoT example. Um, we're working with our sister startup, uh, Sinsense, which is combining on a single chip, a very low resolution DVS array. It's only 128 by 128 pixels with an ultra low power spiking neural network. So this is all on a single piece of silicon. It was designed to be as cheap as possible and is designed to do very simple tasks such as um, detecting a face or recognizing a gesture. Um, I call this the teddy bear sensor. And the idea is that it's on your toy. It's on all the time. It's burning no power. And when you pick it up, it starts detecting whatever it is that you've trained it to do, so a face. And it doesn't have to work all the time, uh, but it has to work well enough to switch on the rest of the teddy bear and use very little power while doing this, a kind of a smart on sensor. And so hopefully this will be the first um, mass produced uh, product using this technology. And then the, the third example I've mentioned here is, I guess, one that's uh, quite topical at the moment that we and other companies are working on, which is event-based eye tracking. Okay, so we can sort of see there are these different niches uh, where the technology can and could um, find applications. Um, if we look a bit more at you know what we've been doing, um, essentially up until now we've been trading off um, speed and signal quality, right? And the bottom in the bottom right, you know, frame sensors they're pretty slow, but they they take great pictures. Right, that's a good thing. Right, that's why they've They've done so well while you have them in all your cameras. And event sensors, they've been very, very fast, that's good, but they've also been very noisy, right, for a number of reasons um, related to the analog pixel circuits and, and so on, right? And so up until now, you've had to choose one, right, which is very frustrating for people designing products, right? They would like to have everything, right? And so the question is, okay, how can we give them good signal quality and um, high speed in, in the same chip? Right. And so people have, you know, done dual camera systems with beam splitters and all this stuff. And um, here's a very quick overview of the different things people have tried. So they've added the RGB frame and they have the DVS pixels. Um, we have some uh, chips which combine the, the two and using the same photo diode for the events and frames. This turns out to have certain advantages and disadvantages. And there are also hybrid ones where the large DVS pixel is mixed in with lots of smaller RGB pixels. And then you know, by combining these in different ways, you can do uh, different types of reconstruction and so on. Um, but you know, these methods uh, have you know, shown promise, uh, but you're still dealing with two streams, right? You have the event stream and the frame stream. So you're throwing even more data at the problem that you're trying to solve. And this extra um, bandwidth um, starts to become a big issue the, the lower in power that you want to go. Um, in this little cartoon here, I've shown sort of a typical um, power share in a vision system. On, on the left, you have a high power system, uh, for example, let's take automotive, where the sensor uses some power, you know, perhaps one, two, watt or something. The data takes some energy to send to the processor, and then the processor is running a whole bunch of GPUs or something to do the processing. As you go down, um, the, the transmission power actually starts to dominate, right? So you might have a very nice sensor and a very nice processor, um, but you end up burning as much power actually getting the data to the processor as you saved uh, in doing all your fancy uh, DVS stuff. And so the question is, okay, you know, is there something we can do about this, right? We obviously have to send less data, right, to get around this problem. And, you know, this is something that your eye is really good at. Right. Um, you know, your eye has, you know, on the order of a hundred million detectors. Um, your visual cortex, you know, hundreds of billions of compute units, and somehow your brain, sorry, your your retina condenses this into what's been estimated at about one megabyte per second. Right. So obviously something is smart is going on there, which is general purpose, fast enough, and really, really low bandwidth. And so. You know, the, the long, very long term goal is to work out what that is, but you know, we have to sort of uh, set ourselves um, achievable goals uh, in the meantime. And so, 
we've been working on a um, new technology called the, the Avion sensor, um, which aims to give uh, users the benefits of the very high speed, the high dynamic range, you know, um, also be able to have small pixels with good signal quality and have on-chip data reduction, different types. And um, here's the obligatory corporate uh, animation. So it's kind of like the DBS animation you've seen before, except um, now we have these cores, uh, these event cores, and each of those covers a different small part of the pixel array. Uh, what's important to note here is that this is mainly digital, right? We've moved uh, quite a distance away from the um, analog circuit in current DBS pixels, and we're actually using uh, more or less off the shelf um, CMOS pixels with known uh, good performance characteristics, right? And so um, it's a unified pixel architecture. Um, this means you can have the one bit events. Uh, you can read out the full pixel. You can also read out multi bit events. So no longer can, um, do you have to send out one bit. You can actually get the magnitude of how much changed. Um, this is all happening losslessly um, in the high speed. The dynamic range uh, is also very high uh, because we have an internal floating point representation. And uh, you can act, the pixels can actually adapt. Um, on an individual basis, and I'll, I'll come to this in a sec. So one of the drawbacks of DVS up until now has been that the um, response characteristics have been fairly constant, um, independent of the lighting level. And this can be a problem when it gets very dark, right? Your signal to noise ratio is much lower when it's dark. And um, this means that you're getting a lot of noise events which are using up energy and bandwidth but not actually telling you much about what's going on in the scene and so then with a the new sensor you'll, you'll be able to um, have intensity dependent response characteristics in a curve which you can uh, set on a per pixel level and also update uh, during operation um, so this is one way of basically reducing unnecessary noise data which is not telling you anything about the scene um, each of the cores can be configured differently, so you can basically have multiple ROIs across your scene. So in this example, you may want to monitor um, the, the global scene in binary, for example, just to know roughly that there's something happening there. And if there's a particular thing that you're interested in, then you can choose to collect you know, more data in that area. So this is one of the ways that you can shape your data stream so that um, you're focused mainly on what you're interested in. So what does uh, this look like um, in, in practice? So the chip doesn't exist yet. Well, we're getting very close to the first tape out of it now, but because it's in digital, we are able to create an emulator uh, for this, uh, for the chip. So uh, here you can see typical one bit events and uh, typical reconstruction. I know there are many fancy ways of doing deep network re uh, reconstruction. This is just a very trivial uh, one bit um, integration. Uh, reconstruction and on the bottom part you have the uh, multi-bit events and then the reconstruction which is basically just adding right um, so there's no need for any deep networks or anything uh, we have a couple more examples here so uh, this one you can see is a high-speed hummingbird um, you may see some small artifacts there that's because uh, this is actually a five-bit um, data that's being sent, right? So it's, um, I didn't just copy the source video and put it there. Uh, this is actually the output uh, from the emulation, but it still gives um, definitely much better results uh, than what's possible using the one bit DBS. Um, here's an example of a typical uh, type of output you might use in eye tracking. Um, this one is a kind of a whole camera moving thing in an, in an automotive type of scenario. And this is a type of reconstruction you might get uh, in a full camera motion drone kind of scenario. And so the question is, okay, does this reduce data? And the, the answer is yes, uh, otherwise I wouldn't show the slide. Um, nothing's free. Uh, so it does cost more data than using the one bit DBS. Um, the test cases we've run indicate that it uses anywhere from the same amount of data to about double the amount of data. Uh, for a one bit DBS, and the, the thing you get for that is the uh, high quality reconstruction. Um, it's actually possible to reduce this data again back towards the one bit um, DBS, and there are a couple of ways of doing this. Um, what you can see here is a way of 
uh, handling edge cases. So one edge case um, which generates a lot of data with DVS is if it's dark in the room and then you switch on the lights, right? Or in, in this case, you have a flashing siren, right? So there's a lot of events being generated here. And so instead of encoding every single pixel event individually, what we do is we encode the mode. So the, the most common change upwards, for example, and then the outliers um, to give the you know, individual uh, the individual pixel values. Uh, so in this example, you're seeing just the modes, right? Otherwise, it would be quite hard to visualize. But you can think of this as kind of like an event JPEG, sort of, yeah, very, very rough analogy. But again, <clears throat> it's a way of um, moving the DVS concept away from single pixels to small patches of area, of area right? And you can imagine, you can all imagine where this might go uh, in a couple of generations from now. Um, we also have motion encoding. Um, this is again, you know, looking at um, compression, looking in the in the neighborhood. This is not optical flow, right? It happens to look sometimes a little bit like optical flow, but it's actually because it's looking in a very small neighborhood. We're not making any claims about this being an optical flow thing. Perhaps you can take this data and improve it, you know, to get decent optical flow. But um, what we're concentrated on here is um, data reduction, right? And so by using these two methods, it's actually possible in some cases to get the the total bandwidth down below the the one bit DVS, right? Because it's just a much more uh, efficient way of encoding the information, uh, particularly for whole camera moving scenes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, all of these points here on this slide, but the, the overall message is that uh, with this um, architecture, we're able to um, combine the small pixel size, the, the good uh, performance of the uh, of the uh, current frame sensors, uh, with the high speed. Um, of the um, DVS that we've been used to up till now. And by doing this, we can, and having the cores, which you can of course scale, um, you're able to scale up to um, arbitrarily high resolutions uh, that you are used to in your, you know, in your phones and so on. Um, here are a couple of sort of a very, very rough sample specifications uh, for the types of uh, sensors that we're envisioning. Um, and you can see, you know, the Pixel pictures here are typical uh, for these types of sensors and the resolutions are as well. Um, you can see the number of cores uh, required to, to make this type of sensor work and that the die area is also uh, fairly typical uh, for this uh, inner stacked uh, sensor technology. Yeah, so uh, that's that's uh, what I have to say. Um, I realize, you know, I've probably left out a lot of details, which is true. Um, I hope hopefully next next year at CVR uh, we'll be able to give you a lot more details. Uh, thanks a lot. Any questions for Kainan? Hi, uh, this is very interesting for somebody who has worked on low level energy processing things and have been working for a long time. Um, can you give some details on what are the processing units and how do you program them? Um, when you say processing units, so so you mentioned that you have uh, like uh, near chip units cores that. Oh, okay, uh, yeah, okay. So the, the cores are not programmable in that sense. They're configurable, but they're not like little Turing machines that you can do whatever you want, right? So it's not the idea is not to program them like you would a GPU. Right. Uh, they they are doing the generation of these higher order events. I see, but, but so it's a predefined function that, that you can configure, but but that's all the flexibility you have as a as a user. Yeah, you can adjust the thresholds and so on, the rates, um, the modes in which they're running, but you can't generate a different an, an inherently different type of event. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. You were talking about 160 by 160 pixels, and then you know, the cores, uh, the cores process these multiple events. The output of those cores is again 160 by 160, or do you do a reduction? Um, I didn't see the 160. Sorry. What, what was the resolution? Oh, um, so the one we're working on right now is uh, quad HD, so it's like 3.6 megapixel. Yeah, so each each core covers a significant patch of the array. 
it's it's just shared between the entire patch and the output resolution is unchanged. Correct. My question was uh, uh, how does it behave in low light? So uh, it behaves the same as a normal sensor, right? Because it's the same pixel. You you configure the event response. Um, that, yeah, so you can you can have the the high uh, sensitivity, so you'll understand the contrast. So, so yeah. uh, do I understand that this multi level piece that means that you have multiple uh, um, polarities? Yeah, so you can have a it's ne positive, it's negative, it's and you can have if you want, you can output ten bits positive or negative okay. yeah, if you want. Yeah, you can do one bit, five bit, or ten bit. Question: What is the fundamental like multi-bit event representation? What are we getting? Is it still expressing just algorithm negative polarities, or is it expressing it itself? Uh, you can do both. So you can have a delta, or you or you can say just give me the absolute. Gotcha. Yeah. And um, you're talking about these different nodes, which sort of break out adaptation at the pixel level. Um, are those kind of going to be fixed and baked into the camera? Or how much control do you have over how those nodes are operating? You can configure, you can send commands to the sensor while it's running to switch the modes. Yeah. The idea is to be able to sort of follow something you're interested in. Um, yeah. Thank you for the next talk. And uh, can you apply the uh, uh, detection threshold as a uh, contrast? As a yes. Uh, I think the question was, can you emulate the existing DBS? Then the answer is yes. You can have like you know normal, say 10 percent uh, contrast. How about the uh, uh, absolute change? So you yeah. yes yes yeah yeah. And uh, how about the individual threshold for the Yes, there's some memory on so the chip. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Time. Yeah, uh, but let's say it's not a super, it's not designed to be a super low power ship unless you run it slow, right? You can run it slow, super low power. Um, the power consumption is similar to a, let's say, let's say you had a high end mobile phone sensor. If you're running it at that kind of speed, then it's similar to a high end mobile phone sensor, except you can get less data out of it, right? Nothing's magic. So, yes. 500 milliwatt, 100, then? Depends on the speed, right? The dynamic range. Uh, you talked about using a normal CS um, front end. Yeah. So I guess you're bound by the same limits, noise, and saturation. Yes. So, but you talked about 120 dB. Yeah. So, so how do you define that? Yeah. Range? There's an internal um, floating point representation. Right. Okay. So, yeah, it's a 10 bit A to D, but uh, by fiddling around with it, you can get equivalent 120 dB, which is. But it's, yeah. But for the, for the pixel part, it will be noise by saturation. But for for here, it's more like an EVS pixel where you uh, look at the low light cutoff. And is that still? I don't know how you define a, a dynamic range because you claim 120 dB. I don't think from your pixel front that you will get 120 dB unless you have some order control. Right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, I didn't mention that. Um, it can locally it control the exposure time. Right. Yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't be possible. Yeah. So that that is an intrasy. Yeah. Um, all right thank you very much we're very excited about this one today Thank you.
Uh, yeah, uh, I would like to share okay. my screen, but uh, how to share? <laughs> Which one of these is Microsoft? Like, uh... I think uh, there is a PowerPoint script, but uh... I don't know which one is it. Japanese. Yeah, but uh, there is uh, no. Ah, this one. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Is that uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. Okay. All right, so our next speaker is um, Atsumi Niwa, and I believe he's uh, been very involved in the development of the latest event based the chips from Sony, the IMX 636 and the 637. I think you are leading the event based vision research on, on this development of the Sony event based cameras. Okay. Thank you for the invitation. And uh, I'm Atsumi Niwa, uh, leading the event-based sensor development at Sony. And uh, today, I will explain about uh, event-based vision sensor and uh, on-chip signal processing development. Oh, oh. So, yeah. Here's today's contents. And uh, first of all, uh, I will shortly introduce our organizations and uh, develop sensors, and then move to the uh, presentation of the event processing development. This is an uh, uh, operation of the uh, event-based vision sensors, and uh, uh, I uh, belong to the uh, uh, R&D team in Japan, and I uh, uh, developed the uh, EBS-related technology uh, with uh, Switzerland branch and uh, broadcasting with a uh, business team. And uh, this shows uh, three different generations of our uh, prototyping uh, with uh, pixel shrink trend. And uh, due to the complexity of the uh, EBS pixels, the uh, size shrink uh, had been uh, limited, but uh, we uh, tackled to achieve the small pixel with our using the uh, warehouse stacking process and circuit technologies. This is uh, our first generation EBS uh, developed with uh, prophecies. And uh, the uh, feature is uh, higher time resolution thanks to the uh, asynchronous readout uh, method. And uh, uh, it's suitable for the uh, industry applications. This is uh, our second generation uh, with uh, featuring technology of the uh, small pixel size and uh, lower consumptions. Because uh, it is just a prototype, so the currently sensor consumes uh, 70 milliwatts, but uh, if we design, uh, we can reduce to under the uh, 10 milliwatts uh, with keeping the 1000 uh, frame per second operations. Third one is a uh, RGB hybrid EBS, uh, which is configured by embedding uh, high frame rate event pixel with uh, low noise uh, advanced mobile RGB pixels. And the uh, simultaneous output is used for the uh, image enhancement applications like uh, Debra or the uh, video frame interpolation. This is a summary of our target applications and uh, three different uh, sensors uh, with uh, different uh, features is uh, suitable for the uh, industry, mixed reality, and uh, mobile imaging uh, as uh, listed applications. Then uh, I move to the, uh, talk about the uh, event processing development. I will explain the, uh, our motivations. Actually, the uh, EVS is uh, efficient sensors, but uh, there are also the constraints to obtain the stable output. Uh, the one reason is the uh, detection threshold. And uh, which is uh, need to be uh, determined uh, correctly. But uh, uh, second is uh, some uh, noise from the photons or the circuit or the uh, interface from the interference from the uh, pickups. And uh, we have developed uh, old threshold controlling processing and uh, confirmed uh, certain uh, improvements. For example, the uh, right uh, top figure shows uh, example output uh, with a uh, too high threshold, and uh, we hardly need to uh, detect uh, any event. But uh, uh, after the, uh, tuning the uh, threshold properly, the, we can obtain the, uh, enough event as uh, you can see the uh, left top uh, figures. But uh, in case of uh, including the uh, noise or the flickers, there is a uh, still low quality event after the uh, tuning of the uh, threshold properly, 
uh, as you can see from the uh, left bottom figures. In recent days, uh, lots of uh, following the application is uh, realized uh, by using a neural network. And uh, if there is uh, infinite uh, computing uh, resource and uh, enough data set to train network, uh, maybe uh, this problem will be gone. But uh, with considering the uh, limitation of the uh, available hardware or the uh, computing the, uh, latency or power consumptions, we still think uh, uh, more primitive uh, processing uh, with on chip implementation uh, is uh, useful uh, in some application fields like a uh, mobile. So uh, now we are focusing on the uh, random noise uh, and precursor suppressions. And uh, we studied uh, uh, with uh, three different approaches. And uh, the first is uh, filter-based uh, denoise, uh, including the three different algorithms. And the second is also the filter-based uh, anti clicker both in the uh, digital and analog domains. And the third one is the uh, relative suppression of the known identities uh, by enhancing the object itself. So uh, I will explain each detail as follows. This is a denoise. And the uh, left figure uh, is uh, finding the uh, noisy area by uh, counting the uh, event in blocks. And uh, if the uh, event number is uh, less than the predetermined uh, noise threshold, the uh, event in the uh, area uh, is considered as a noise and uh, removed. And the uh, middle figure, uh, there is a calculation uh, similar to the uh, left uh, figures with uh, defining the uh, area as a surrounding uh, of the uh, events. And the uh, right figure is applying the additional IIR filter to the uh, left approach. And uh, uh, we also think that uh, it's uh, important to uh, set the uh, proper uh, threshold for noise distinction. So now uh, we evaluate the force detection uh, characteristic uh, with no contrast input as an initial calibration sequence and uh, uh, obtain the uh, noise threshold table for uh, each uh, contrast threshold. This is an uh, anti uh, processing, and the uh, left side is a uh, digital domain approaches, and uh, uh, we are finding the uh, period uh, of the uh, event stream. And uh, if there is a uh, periodical trend equivalent to the uh, precast, the uh, event in the uh, patch uh, removed. And the right side is an uh, analog domain approach, and, and uh, we are calculating the uh, global flicker frequencies uh, by uh, compression uh, with uh, internally generated uh, flicker reference uh, waveform. And if there is a flicker component, the uh, detection threshold uh, will be increased to suppress the detection. There is also two different uh, object enhancement approaches. And the uh, left side is uh, uh, edge preservation. And, uh, we calculate the uh, gradient uh, with a uh, horizontal, vertical, and uh, diagonal directions. And the uh, nominal uh, object generates a uh, decent amount of the events. Therefore, the, uh, the event uh, with a uh, weak gradient at any direction uh, is considered as a noise. And the uh, right side is a uh, shoot template matching, and the uh, matching uh, will be determined by uh, comparing the uh, previous and the current frames and number of the event in patch. So, uh, for example, uh, there is an isolated and a blinking uh, event between the uh, frames. Uh, we can uh, uh, distinct uh, such uh, event as a noise. Mm -hmm. This is a uh, measurement setup and uh, methodology uh, for quantifying the uh, impact of the uh, signal processing. And we are using the rotating object with a radial patterns and also defining the uh, object area and noise area. And uh, though it is not accurate, but uh, we uh, regard the uh, event in object area as a signal and also the uh, regard the uh, event in noise area as a noise. Then uh, we are evaluating the uh, noise suppression ratio uh, with uh, comparing the uh, uh, event in noise area uh, with turning on the uh, processing. And after turning on the uh, processing, uh, the event uh, is preferable to be uh, reduced enough. And as a similar manner, uh, we evaluate also the object preservation ratio with monitoring the uh, object areas. And obviously, the preservation ratio is preferable, preferable to close to one. 
And uh, this is uh, the noise result. And uh, uh, as you can see, the uh, filter based approach shows a uh, good result uh, both in the noise suppression and uh, object preservation ratios. And uh, C1 of the edge preservation shows uh, also a good characteristic in noise suppression, but the uh, event uh, from the uh, object is also reduced. And uh, C2 of the uh, shoot template matching uh, shows a uh, worse result. And uh, we think a uh, good result uh, by using the filter approach is uh, from the uh, predetermined uh, noise threshold uh, through the initial calibrations. And also, uh, we can see the uh, difficulty of the uh, template matching. And uh, when uh, the object uh, moves with keeping the uh, direction and the speed, the uh, well matching is obtained uh, at each uh, local area. But uh, in other words, uh, there is a different trend in the uh, peripheral side and uh, center side of the rotating object. That is why the matching fails. Next is a uh, uh, amplifier processing uh, results, and uh, uh, we are putting the uh, flickering LED uh, near the uh, object, and B uh, one uh, of the uh, digital uh, filter based approach shows the uh, best uh, scores. And uh, as you can see, the, uh, when uh, we find the uh, period of the flicker, the uh, uh, flicker suppression is well down. But uh, on the other hand, uh, there also uh, happens to be an unexpected uh, period uh, around the uh, center of the object. So uh, it causes uh, block noise. And also, uh, the, uh, the other uh, methodologies uh, shows, doesn't show the uh, perfect result. So I mean, the uh, B1 of the analog-based uh, approach, the uh, uh, higher uh, threshold uh, disturbs the uh, object detection also. Or the uh, C1 of the edge preservation uh, preserves the uh, uh, outline of the flicker light source also. So we need to uh, choose carefully uh, each uh, algorithm uh, to con with considering the uh, impact uh, from the such imperfection on use case. This is the uh, last experiment uh, with uh, changing the scene light from the constant to the uh, global flickers. And uh, uh, yes, we think that uh, this is the uh, most uh, problematic situation. And uh, uh, currently, uh, C1 of the edge preservation uh, shows uh, best so far. And uh, uh, though the uh, shape of the object, uh, especially at the circumference, uh, changed, but uh, uh, noise uh, from the flicker is very well suppressed. On the other hand, the uh, area-wise approach of the B1 and C2 uh, doesn't work anymore, regardless of the whether its area is uh, fixed or the uh, top based. The, actually, the uh, object uh, becomes like a design art. Mm -hmm. This is a summary of our insight for the uh, relationship uh, between the requirement of the uh, applications and the uh, applicability of the, uh, each algorithm. Actually, the, uh, we think the, uh, the best algorithm is dependent on the each applications. So now uh, today, uh, this table is uh, just a hypothesis, but uh, we will uh, very uh, carefully the, uh, each uh, application with uh, taking uh, the available uh, computational resource uh, both on the uh, sensor side and uh, uh, following application processor side into account to establish the uh, optimized systems. That's all for my presentation and thank you uh, so much for your kind attention. Any questions for Miwa-san? The algorithms you are only evaluating the software or on the chip? Uh, actually, the, uh, the, is, uh, only one the, uh, on chip uh, implementation of the uh, analog domain and The other is uh, just uh, outside. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, well, your time window can be efficient or has fixed. 
Can you hear me? And you have full screen. Yeah, we'll try. I hope this goes away. All right. So our next speaker is Andrea Sus from uh, Omnivision Technologies. He's a senior manager of the novel image sensor systems and principal engineer there. Good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, this work. Yeah. Okay. Um, I won't bother you much with uh, motivating use cases. You've seen plenty of that today. I just want to point out that this is Omnivision, which is a company that's making image sensors for consumer markets. Primarily, we are focusing on really applications that are enhancing, uh, right now enhancing um, image sensor uh, perception. And we're looking at uh, potential applications that can be deployed in, in consumer markets as well, such as deep blur, uh, slow motion capture. And we hope that there will also be more progress in, in other use cases like SLAM, for which, for instance, David's group is studying the combining EBS and, and intensity frames more intensively. Yeah. Um, so what we are looking into is a hybrid camera approach. We presented this at ISSCC uh, earlier this year, we have an extended paper upcoming in uh, JSSC uh, journal. Um, compared to a dual camera approach, it has the advantage that we solve synchronization on chip and we don't have baseline or parallax error. Also, we need only one lens and uh, one package, so it reduces cost and size. We do this by implementing wafer level stacking technology. We actually have a free wafer stack set up um, for, to achieve a small footprint, and we have a high speed readout circuit. And all of that was detailed in the conference. I'll touch upon it here. This is a cross section of our free wafer stacking process. You can see on the left hand side, well, that image. The top wafer is really for the pixel devices. There are micro lenses and color filters and uh, deep trench isolation. The top wafer connects to the middle wafer using stack pixel level connections. On the middle wafer, we have basically all the EBS pixel readout circuitry connecting to the bottom wafer using backside TSVs, uh, where we have all the peripheral circuits. And you can see how those three wafers are allocated in the right hand part of the image, right pixel to the left, middle wafer with EBS pixel and periphery like ADCs, the EBS readout circuit, and so on to the right. The pixel wafer incorporates pin photodiodes because we care a lot about image quality, and we use the same photodiodes also for the EBS pixel. We just operate it as a static bias. The EBS pixels connect uh, on a cluster of four by four pixels to the middle wafer. You can see on the bottom part, there is a color filter array, right? RGB, 
for your normal CIS uh, channel. And then one of these uh, pixels um, has a clear color filter and connects to the middle wafer for EVS function. So you see that the EVS pixel is actually wrapped behind this four by four cluster of pixels. Um, the, EV, um, the CIS pixel connects to the column bus and, is, uh, bus and is connected to the peripheral circuit at the edge of the sensor. Um, here you can see a simplified schematic of our pixel uh, circuit. It's pretty conventional, um, photodiode to the left, logarithmic amplifier, um, a buffer to prevent from kickback, um, difference detector, comparators, and then a bit keeper. Um, so far, so good. We do further implement a time to digital converter. In the past, we have at this conference presented Shushan uh, Shen, um, the former CEO, CTO of uh, Cellapixel, who's now Omnivision, has presented a time to analog converter. We are now uh, using a time to digital converter so we don't have to use extra space for ADCs. Uh, we use a programmable resistor in this feedback path of the uh, difference detector that's basically acting as a high pass filter. The pixel itself already forms a low pass filter. So basically we can achieve band pass filter characteristic. And this can also be interesting for Flickr. We do sum up all the photo current of all the pixels on a supply and measure the current. This basically acts as a global ambient light monitor signal. This can be used again to derive information of how the pixel is operated and you can use it to tune parameters. And we also actually uh, generate an activity monitor signal. So basically we do this by um, operating this or implementing this um, this latch in such a way that one of these cross-coupled inverters is current starved. So if there is no event, there is no current from the supply. If there's an event, there's a specific current, we sum them all up and then we basically have a global activity signal that basically gives an indication of how many events you still have to read out. And you can use this for tuning, filters, uh, readout circuit and so on. This is a high level view on the sensor. Again, there's much more detail in the uh, ISSC paper and upcoming uh, JSSC paper. Um, we have the pixel array here in gray. We have readout scanner uh, at the left and at the bottom. Um, we have a scanning circuit. It's not arbitration, but we do implement the scanner such that if there is, if the row does not have a read request, we skip over the row in a fraction of a, of a clock cycle. We don't spend clock cycles on rows that or columns that don't have events. So we, we still read out sparse. Um, yeah, so this is pretty much the high level view on the sensor. And we also outline several strategies to deal with Flickr. When you talk about Flickr, actually you have to separate what sources of Flickr do exist. Um, fluorescent light is basically um, a Flickr source where you have a, a light ripple voltage uh, on, on your or ripple uh, photonic flux. Um, then actually you can adjust the contrast threshold as the former presenter has presented. But if you have other sources of a flicker like um, LED um, uh, pulse or, or uh, pulse width modulation, of course your temporal contrast is so high that this doesn't help you anymore. You basically lose any sensitivity to signal. Um, One-time events like flash can be uh, dealt with if you reset the whole uh, array at once. Again, then the activity monitor can be really helpful to know, okay, so uh, we have, on the 90% of the pixels fired, Let, let's just reset the sensor. Um, we can uh, do region of interest and stop sample, uh, and we um, implement a mode where the subsampling is randomized so you don't always subsample the same pattern. And if you do fusion, for instance, for deeper and so on, this does matter because you might see some artifacts if you always subsample the same pixel. And again, I talked about the band pass filter, but this is really implemented in analog in the pixel. So here you can see some images taken from the sensor. You see a 1080p image on the left, 120 FPS. You see the corresponding uh, aggregated EVS frame on the right-hand side. We have some rolling shutter correction videos here. Um, you, yeah. And here you can see the same at longer exposure where you see blur and again, EVS can help you to mitigate this. Um, so this is, by the way, um, I talked about at the beginning that we have this four by four array of CRS pixels corresponding to one EVS pixel. These images are in 1080p, so actually this is binned. So now you have basically one EVS pixel and then RGGB. Yeah, and here you have a slow motion video. So we interpolate basically from 120 FPS using events up to almost eight kiloframes per second. Yeah. 
Um, so this is one part of the talk. The next part of the talk is how do we actually develop these algorithms in order to develop algorithms we uh, use end-to-end -end training, so we need high-speed reference data. We capture the reference data using a high-speed camera, and we use a simulator to synthesize frames and events with a blur, rolling shutter artifacts, and all of that. Um, given that we make the sensors, we know pretty well in detail what, what is inside those sensors, so we make our own custom simulators. So we had uh, two publications on the simulators that are cited here at the bottom of the slide, one at EI and one at ISW. Um, the EI paper focused more on how we generate from the frames the photocurrent maps, uh, and then how we do all the readout parts so that we correspond uh, that we um, model the scan latency effort. But where current simulators mostly do not cover scan latency, um, the ISW paper talked more about an accurate pixel of itself. So the way that we do this is we use ordinary differential equations to model the, the pixel circuit, and we use autoregressive noise models using Monte Carlo to generate random paths that match the desired autocorrelation functions. And of course, they match the uh, models. And I won't bore you with math, but if you want, if you're interested in the math, all of that is given in the ISW paper. You can see here some sample paths. And what was interesting to see is that um, if you increase the um, scene contrast above the contrast threshold, um, the time point at which you get an event, if you don't have any noise or if you have noise, they kind of converge to the same point. Basically, that means that if you just have enough contrast, um, you can actually um, use this noise, a noise-free model for which we actually found an analytical uh, solution to estimate parameters. So you can do um, model parameter for search using an optimization approach. And uh, we also found a goodness of fit indicator because in the end, if you measure, the only thing you can really observe are events, event probabilities, and event timestamps. Um, event probabilities, well, and if you have a high contrast, the probability of firing is almost close to one. So this, it's not really good as an indicator to sort out which events are useless for fitting, but the jitter is actually still a very good uh, indicator, it turns out. So we plot here normalized uh, jitter to the median value, and you can see it linearly correlates almost um, at least for, for high enough contrast with the um, with the error between noise free and noise affected timestamps for difference. Here you can see some reconstructed, um, so some modeled um, S-curves on the right-hand side and some measured S-curves on left-hand side from that sensor that we presented. And here you can see some latency curves. So we have pretty good correspondence with actual physical measurements. And we use that basically to generate algorithms. Okay, so in summary, uh, we use advanced stacking technology uh, to realize hybrid EBS CIS sensors. Um, using a, a hybrid sensor um, avoids synchronization issues, avoids parallax. We need only one lens, one package. So we basically don't, uh, we, we reduce cost. Um, we do look at several use cases such as deep blur, slow motion, slam could be interesting in the future. Um, we employ, um, low latency readout uh, that is scene driven. So basically, we skip over rows of columns that don't have events. Um, we achieve uh, decent performance in noise uh, readout and power. And I want to point out here that again, a synthesis of uh, realistic ground truth uh, data is important, which is why we work on simulators as well. Thank you. Uh, no pure event sensors and look great at all. They're no. all frame based or you're not yet doing the telepixel design or you... currently this is what we focus on. That that's the one, right? Yeah. So the hybrid one. But it's not asynchronous gray levels the way Shushun should walk no. you stop that, right? Yeah. I think that there is a several uh, types of uh, noise source, but uh, how do you uh, fit uh, each uh, parameter? Yeah, that's a great point. Uh, when I talk about parameter extraction, actually the only thing, that's a very good question. The only thing that we fit uh, is really the latency model we, uh, be, because we are here using the noise-free model. So clearly we cannot match the noise. If you look at, uh, so the noise is currently uh, matched to simulations. So we look at power spectral densities. Uh, we have several uh, sources of noise. Uh, we have the shot noise from the front end, the shot noise uh, from the uh, second 
yeah, from, from no, actually we don't uh, look at the change detector. We have the front uh, the, the front end noise from M1 and the, and the current source, uh, this feedback amplifier, and then the uh, source flow buffer. So those are the key noise sources. And this is a pretty good match uh, to uh, power spectral density simulations of this pixel according to cadence for most of the scenarios. So in other words, uh, you uh, take the uh, how much of, uh, from the simulation? We have analytical equations for large signal model. We build up small signal models. We used uh, dominant pole approximations to simplify the small signal models. And we match the, uh, well, it turns out that uh, the equations that you will find in the paper are an overestimation of the noise. Yeah. At least for the, for the, for the low frequency, an overestimation for the high frequency, well, it depends on which, which, which part. Okay, thank you. Um, so we realized the weakness of the original V2E model was this uh, generation of the shot noise, you know, yeah. independent plus on proxies. And that leaves out the fact that most on events, shot noise events are followed by off event, mm -hmm. by this alternate. But are you, you get that back with this auto regressive model, but yeah. does this auto regressive make you just inject a band pass filtered signal and then generate noise from that? How is it? No, we, we, we basically have. Um wide random uh, Gaussian noise and we fit it in uh, we push this into a filter that filter is, is a linear filter so it's still Gaussian distributed uh, but uh, the filter coefficients are used to uh, basically match the uh, the, uh, the, band the, the band pass characteristic and given that we do the dominant pole approximation all of our noise sources are single pole so it's pretty easy yeah. and we have that now in V2E to generate this what we call photoreceptor noise but, mm. but the problem with it is that it now you can't easily label what's a signal and noise event. Yeah. Yeah. So you would have to run two models in parallel, noise free and noisy model in parallel. Then you could tell which is noise and which is signal. But yeah, I find I find that pretty hard to do because sometimes you in reality, if, if your signal is very close to the threshold, right? It's just noise that uh, elevates you yeah. over it. So how do you even this? Like yeah. 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 So, so in reality, you cannot easily uh, distinguish between noise and noise-free. So actually, this is a really challenging problem if you want to validate the quality of a denoise algorithm. The denoising algorithm. Yeah, because then indeed it's 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 difficult to determine which one is real noise, which one is not. If you just ignore the noise and call that noise-free, and now you add noise, you, it's a whole different world. Yeah, quite a bit. I mean, if you, if you don't have a model like this, for instance, you cannot match S groups at all, right? So right now, a lot of the uh, EVS simulators um, add noise in, they basically simulate noise free and then add noise uh, later on in the, in the stream. But then you don't have that part where the threshold is just below, uh, where the signal is just below the threshold. But like I said, V2E does that now, does the okay. photoreceptor noise model. And that's what you realize is weakness, that it's a yeah. model that's alternating events. Right. But then you can't really label it. Yeah, true. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Okay. Hi. Can you hear me? Can you guys hear me? Nanda, can you hear us? No. Yeah, I can hear you, Gavin. Now I can. Uh, we cannot hear you. You cannot hear me. Mm. Yep. Yeah, no. No, we can. You can. Yes. Can you share your screen, please? Yeah, I will share the screen. Can you see it? Uh.
Yes. Yes, but uh, maybe I have to. No, I do need to. All right. Let me minimize this. You have to go to the view options at the top, but pull down this one. I no, you can't do it. No, it's just you. Okay, well, I think we can okay. make it. Yeah, it's okay. Good. So, before uh, one more from Prophecy Christoph Koch, we have and then Yaman Pali from Brainchip. Um, thank you very much for accepting to give this presentation. He's going to be talking about um, education. Thank you, Yaman. And thanks uh, the Prophecy team also for inviting us. Um, would have loved to be there in person, but uh, uh, Good news is I'm probably going to raise the level a bit. It's much lighter than the previous two presentations. But the key goal about a presentation is to talk about bringing the time element into uh, vision processing, and hence the title. Right. So I can skip past this. The only thing I was going to say overall, for those that don't know BrainChip, it's uh, the first to commercialize neuromorphic digital IP platform and reference chip. Um, we are extending that capability with the second generation, especially where we bring in the temporal elements as well as vision transform elements. Um, and then we are trusted by a number of uh, key partners, such as Megachips, Renesis, and our technologies has been demonstrated by folks like Mercedes. And we're building out our ecosystem and partnership to get people there. Okay. So, um, let me start with the key technology changes that we're making to support uh, partners like um, Prophecy Innovation and other uh, folks that are building not just event-based solutions, but frame-based solutions and vision. Um, it, most of you have probably seen this before, but just quickly to go through, um, Akita is our um, IP platform that's uh, now getting into the second generation. Uh, the key focal points are how do we actually make it neuromorphic, how do we make it efficient, but keep it portable across different foundries, different processes, and make it easy to implement. So it is silicon proven now twice over, but it's a digital neuromorphic implementation, which makes it much more easy to be, um, not just implement, but port across different uh, platforms. Um, it is event-based, as you know, right? Um, minimize, and the focus is on minimizing the host CPU usage, which we'll get to in a second. Uh, we are using app memory. We're not looking for custom memories in this discussion. We're looking for standard cell memory, I mean, standard SRAMs configured in, and we're designing compute around it, again, to make it easy and portable to implement across uh, our various licenses, right? Uh, with having the, the fully connected last layer, we can do on-chip learning, uh, one-shot or few-shot learning, which helps with extension of uh, products in the field, customization, but also doing it in a secure and private fashion. And then, of course, as an IP provider, we are making it pretty scalable and configurable, as well as having that capability post-silicon, not just pre-silicon with the configurability, but post-silicon. Okay. So in terms of the architecture itself, um, it, it's effectively designed to sit as a black box on an AXI bus uh, to provide the acceleration to the rest of the chip. Uh, and it consists of two main components, um, uh, at least in terms of compute. One is the uh, uh, event-based uh, neural network node. And in this case, we're also bringing in the temporal event base, which I'll get to in a second. But also, we have a, an optional vision transformer node that we're adding in this generation, all of it connected by a, um, a neural mesh, which is, again, doing the event-based communication, event-based uh, setting across the various uh, nodes in the fabric. Uh, we have a, a pretty advanced DMA that manages um, our processing. And uh, the conversion from traditional uh, networks into spike 
based or event based uh, done by the HRC or uh, high resolution convolution uh, capabilities. One of the key benefits of the way we've done this uh, is that convolution is built into the, the nodes and the fabric, right? So it's not just event based or not just about spike based neural nets. It can support standard convolutions, um, standard models that we have today. Uh, and it's designed to do multiple layers at the same time, um, handled through RDMAs that actually offloads the CPU. So with this generation, we're also doing long rate skip connections in hardware, which should increase the amount of, uh, of the complexity of networks we can handle. And we support with this generation also 8-bit along with four, two and one bit weights and activations. Um, in general, we're trying to keep it intelligent, but simple to engage. So the, the IP is in a black box, uh, and the runtime and the software management is through simple APIs. And just to highlight some of the key benefits that we see from a customer standpoint is that because it can manage the entire network um, in hardware, um, the CPU or the processor doesn't need to do much apart from the initial pre-processing. And then once we're done with all the acceleration and done with the inference, the post-processing. So this actually enables um, our, the accelerator to be combined with a much smaller or less capable CPU even to deliver higher end uh, AI tasks. And in particular, we'll talk about vision in this case. So let's move to the, the big kind of reveal, if you will, right? So in order for us to make um, key uh, improvements in vision processing, um, we want to make sure that our models can understand the physical world better. And in this case, let's use the human inductive biases that we have today, for example. And, and effectively, we're learning with the laws of physics, objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Objects cannot be like teleporting from one spot to the another. So there's continuity. And then, of course, the permanence aspect, which is even if you may not see an object, if it's passing behind the other, um, it is still there, right? These are things that the human brain kind of well understands. And we need to find a way to kind of get this into um, our modeling infrastructure. So we've taken the approach uh, to build in temporally um, um, the integrated, uh, we use time as a key domain. And we also use this to kind of constrain whatever objects that are detected to follow laws of physics. And so effectively, the ML models that we can generate that can efficiently uh, extract and represent these temporal features um, are temporally consistent, right? So that also simplifies the computation. Um, it gives you an, a better understanding of depth of motion and more efficiently so. And hence, as a combination of both of these things, the models themselves can be substantially smaller, faster, but at the same time, uh, precise and accurate. And so you're not going to lose any accuracy or precision by going to this type of model. Um, the basis of what we're doing here um, is the temporal event-based neural net, which is a, uh, a model that is easy to train, it's extremely data efficient. It trains just like a regular uh, CNN uh, does with that propagation. So 3D data is taken as spatial frames and temporal frames, so 2 and 3D, uh, 2D for spatial, 1D for temporal. Um, trains with back propagation, inference is done in current, you know, recurrent mode. For 1D time series, which is more like uh, uh, health signals, audio signals, which are combined with an under vision. Similarly, training done with 1D data with back propagation, where the temporal aspects are extracted and the inference done in recurrent mode. And what this does is it delivers similar benefits that you'd expect from the RNNs, LSTMs, GRUs, but it is substantially smaller and more effective in doing that. Um, along with the temporal aspect that we're doing with TNN, uh, another thing that we've added is uh, the vision transformer capability. Uh, and we have focused on building the vision encoder or the transformer encoder. 
Uh, and so, for example, with two nodes um, at running at 800 megahertz, we can deliver about 800 uh, frames per second performance, I mean, sorry, 30 frames per second performance for the 224, 224 by three uh, configuration. And just like the rest of our nodes, the uh, it's quite contained once the uh, model's loaded and it's quite small in size. Just to give a context, right, you'll see some of the uh, service uh, support on TNMs shortly in terms of results. Um, in let's say seven nanometer, this, these two nodes running 800 megahertz giving 30 frames per second uh, would take less than 20 milliwatts of uh, energy right, or power. So it's really capable of doing uh, much more full-fledged vision capability in a very small edge environment. So going over to results, this is highlighting the capabilities of uh, TNNs, right? So the temporal event-based neural nets. In this case, uh, with the Prophecy event camera road scene uh, data set. Uh, Prophecy you know, has published a lot of good data uh, in that they kind of demonstrated with gray retina at a mean average precision of about 43% effectively, but a large model, about 33 uh, million parameters and about 2.4 million max per second. Uh, with the Akita TNN, right, you can build a, a much, much smaller model, which is 1 50th the size in terms of parameters, 1 30th in size in terms of actual operations that need to be performed while actually increasing the precision, right? Um, so it really lends itself to bring, building much more compact models, which are ideal for the edge, and yet not losing precision, actually gaining precision in the process. Um, now, taking the Kitty 2D data set, uh, again, for road scenes, now using SimCLR with the ResNet 50 backbone, uh, you got an average precision of about 57. With the Akita 10s, with CenterNet, we can get at least the same level of precision, but substantially fewer parameters, again, 150 times fewer parameters and about six times fewer operations. And what that does is, as I said before, running 50 frames per second with a camera resolution of 30 meters by 512, um, you, you take less than 20 milliwatts in a seven nanometer uh, process technology node for 50 frames per second. So this is really making sensors and hence processing of data from sensors much more capable at the edge at sensor. Um, this is not necessarily vision, but just to highlight, you know, this model is pretty versatile. It can be applied to any type of time series data. In this case, uh, we're talking about raw audio. Right? Uh, on the left hand side, you see the traditional edge um, raw, uh, I mean, audio processing, which needs uh, front end DSP filtering, FFTs, et cetera, going into a DSCNN. Accuracy gets to about 92% but it's 320 million max per second. With Akita and the TNN, uh, you could take the inputs directly from a, an ADC uh, or a PCM and feed it into the network. So you don't need additional filtering or DSP, which reduces bomb cost, makes it much more memory efficient. Accuracy actually goes up um, and the number of actual operations go down substantially. So in this case, it's well under two microjoules per inference in a 28 nanometer technology. So when you start thinking about visuals and uh, other time series like audio going alongside that, the combination is extremely effective, right? And it's effectively the same type of net model that's doing both types of things. Um, just to extend that, uh, you know, with the Beth Israel Deaconess Medical uh, data set, uh, the goal behind this is to show reduced error. Again, we're trying to show precision here. Um, whatever is available on the market is not capable of delivering the root mean square error of less than one, which is what medical um, production quality requires. 
and and the state of art algorithms like S4 are extremely compute intensive and, and large. So in this case, with the TNN, we get well below the the, the required uh, accuracy or required error, uh, while taking 800 times fewer operations. So almost three orders of magnitude fewer operations to achieve the same thing, uh, an order of magnitude for fewer parameters and hence compactness of model. So as you can see, this is really capable as a model. And what we've done in terms of our architecture itself is we've built in 3D separable convolutions and a, a, a storage, hidden storage capability within it to bring in all the benefits of RNNs um, GRU type solutions while making these models substantially more compact. So in terms of deployment, um, I, I'll just quickly run through it, right? So we have the ability to evaluate with our MetaTF software upfront without need for silicon. We have integrated into Edge and Pulse uh, as a platform. We have our own model zoo to support it. Um, a lot of the folks have taken our for generation chips and boxes to go build and design their prototypes and POCs. We have actual silicon uh, based uh, solutions that people are developing for small volume. And then of course the IP can be used to build in fully integrated SOC solutions for um, production quality. And so to summary, um, brain chips really uh, quite taking the next step for radical vision solutions at the edge. You can do video object detection and untethered battery operated type devices, whether it's event-based cameras or frame-based cameras. And this can be extended to different types of time series data, including audio, remote health monitoring. Um, and then we have built it so that it can support today's complex models, ResNet 50 and up, um, as, the, as well as supporting tiny vision transformers. Uh, and we're working with the ecosystem to make that deployable. And at the same time, we can do a lot of this by minimizing the amount of training and uh, as we customize on the field, like you not to need to do any more retraining in the cloud. All right, so that's what I had. Thank you very much. Any questions for Nandan? Okay, I guess in the interest of time, we are running out of time. Uh, we will move on to uh, the last talk from Christoph Bosch. Thank you very much, Nandan. Thank you. Okay, I'm seeing him. Okay, that's good. So, yeah. Yes. Okay. Thank you very much. So the last talk is from uh, Christoph Bosch, co-founder and CTO of Prophecy. Okay. Uh, thanks, everyone. It's getting late. We are all tired. At least I am. So let's uh, try to be fast. <clears throat> so the, this talk is about event sensors for embedded AGI vision applications. And so, so I, I want to look at event sensors from the for the, from the user perspective, so uh, users in this in this case are system integrators or camera builders or application developers, and I uh, want to to look a little bit on uh, why actually the adoption of event based technology has been slower than many have actually expected, and so what are actually the the challenges for event sensors to be used and integrated in vision systems, and um, so first of all there's 
use cases for event centers are all over the place. There's, it's a very diverse field of applications from, from industrial to IoT to mobile to automotive. This is, of course, this is very good, but it's there's a lot of different uh, requirements from the application side. Uh, we have this unconventional format of the event data that many people used to not know what to do with them. This actually this relatively unfam unfam unfamiliar encoding of, of the dynamic vision of visual information in the form of events. There are non constant data rates. Interfaces are not standardized. There's, there are no protocols that are used. So this is it's all over the place. So we have we have looked at uh, and tried to to overcome some of these problems and and develop a, a new generation of of sensors that try to to get a bit better with some of these points. So what do I mean by integrability and usability in in a vision system? I think there are two buckets of of, of features that we need to look in. The first is um you need to prepare the event data for transmission and for processing. And we have built in several features into the new sensor that pre-process the data that filters them, that formats them, et cetera. We will see much more about that in a minute. Um, we need to be compatible with uh, industry standard interfaces like MIPI or DCMI. Um, we also want to be able to connect to not, not non-mainstream compute platforms like uh, neuromorphic processors, SNN accelerators and this, this kind of, of processes. Um, and the second bucket of, of, of uh, features that we think is, is necessary for HAI vision is um, power. Of course, latency and power are always the two like uh, main KPIs that people, when they talk about neuromorphic vision systems are praying at. So um, what we try to build into the sensor is uh, the different modes of, of operation that, that give you different uh, power consumptions that you can adapt, actually you can switch between its one. We'll see that also in a second better. Um, we want to have like really ultra low power operation where the sensor can, can wake up itself or, or the system. Uh, we do on-chip power management and we do, uh, we built in an embedded microcontroller for, for all kinds of different usages, we will we'll see that. So what this is, this is, the uh, like the overview. This is the uh, a block diagram of, of this of this new sensor family. Uh, this this first chip has a, a relatively small pixel array. It's only 320 by 320, which gives an optical format of one fifth inch. The, the sensor itself is the chip itself is relatively small, with 13 square millimeters. It's fabricated using a stacked PSI CIS on CMOS with a pixel pitch of 6.3. And here are the the features that I'm going to uh, explain a little bit. We have uh, sensor features that uh, global contrast detector. We have these power modes I, I was talking about already. Uh, we have a very flexible region of interest programming that can be reprogrammed on the fly and do saliency, et cetera, this kind of thing. So temperature sensor, ambient light sensor on the chip. And then we have a an, an, uh, digital event signal processing pipeline on the chip that does all kinds of things from noise and flicker filtering, edge enhancement filtering, event rate control of data format, etc. And then we have this embedded risk five CPU. We have two uh, standard interfaces that that can adapt to different requirements from of, of applications, and configuration interfaces are also very standard. Okay, let's go into some of these features a little better. So we have what we call uh, GCD, a con uh, global contrast detector, which are basically uh, event detector circuitry that works on on the on the sum of photocrons of, of several pixels. So we actually we, we subdivide the the array of of, of 320 by 320 into nine subarrays of 108 by 108 pixels and and feed the sum of photocrons to this to these circuits that that do uh, 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 activity monitoring or change detection as as you would expect from a single pixel. And by doing that, you can you can do very, very low power operations, uh, create uh, smart, um, like smart PIR, if you want, and, and wake up either yourself as a sensor to go into an, another power mode or to, to wake up also a system. Um, the next thing is uh, we have this very flexible reach of interest programming that, that can actually uh, pixel individually uh, 
in enable, in enable or disable the, the pixels. We use this for many different things from, from hot pixel removal to uh, fully customizable ROI shapes. I'll, I'll actually, something like this, for example, you can, you can do this on the fly. You can reprogram them very fast because we have a very uh, a hardware uh, accelerated uh, Windows controller. You can uh, program eight, up to 18 different ROI windows at the same time and, and move them around very quickly across the, across the sensor array. This can be used for uh, like yeah, which of interest that, that moves around the sensor array, for example, or so. Um, now to, for the uh, digital uh, event signal processing pipeline. So we, starting from the pixel array, we first have an, an, an random noise filter that, that filters out a little bit like what we have heard before, actually, this is a similar kind of filtering of, of random noise events. An anti-flicker filter, which I'll show in a little more detail in a second. Then we have a, an edge enhancement filter. We have a, an ERC, event rate controller, that very, you can program actually a, a maximum or a limit event rate that will never be exceeded by the output interface. Uh, if, if the events uh, internally get up above this, this program uh, threshold and events are dropped in a systematic smart way, you can actually choose between different drop uh, strategies like every other column or line or random in space and time or so. So there's many ways to uh, smart to do a smart reduction of, of event rates. Then we have a, a, a data formatting block that allows you to, to, to uh, encode this, the, the, bit, the, the event stream into different data formats. I'll also show a few of them later. Then we have an, another actually branch in the pipeline that, that does an aggregated uh, data formatting. We, we produce on the chip uh, histograms or of, of event frames that we can read them out through one of those two interfaces I was already speaking about. So we have a MIP interface and the CMOS parallel interface. Um, so a little bit about some of those uh, processing blocks with the uh, anti-flicker filter, also a little bit we've heard before from, from Nivasan, for example, they're also looking at, at anti-flicker filters. Uh, Samsung has done similar things as well. So what we, as, as you know, natural scenes often contain uh, modulated light sources, such as, for example, here on the, on the top, this is a, this is a, a tunnel, actually we drive through a tunnel here and the, and the light that illuminates the tunnel is, is flickering at 50 hertz, for example. Very, very huge data rates if you if you drive actually and, and this this and on top of this flickering light sources yeah, would produce a lot of, of data that you don't actually want. Also our street lights here on the bottom here, this, these are street lights that, that flicker at, at 50 or 100 hertz or something like that. So producing a huge amount of, of, of nonsense data that you don't want. So what we are doing actually a digital notch filters for for uh, for, to remove this 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 uh, this events from from the stream, uh, we can actually hear already some some results. We can actually pro program a, a center frequency and and uh, the width of these notch filters, and you can see they are very effective. Uh, these are um, showing uh, events per per period of a, of a modulated. Uh, Stimulus and you see that the in the in the in the band stop parts of the of the of the of the spectrum you see that the, the, the reduction in, in events of, of this of this frequency are is is two two orders of three, uh, two and a half orders of magnitude or around that so this is, this works really well you can also invert this and you can actually for very very special applications where you actually want to detect for example as a single uh, flicker frequency because you're looking for active market tracking or something like that. You can actually invert the whole thing and, and do the same thing in with a, a band pass notch filter. Um, as I said before, we have a RISC V CPU on, on, on the chip that allows you to do several things like we do the, the boot of the of the sensor from at power up. So the time to first data is very short. It, it supports power management. It, we, we can insert metadata into the MIPI string, for example, like, like a frame number, data statistics, et cetera. But we don't do any like algorithm-based event processing on the, on the chip itself. Um, for the uh, interfacing to different compute platforms, here are just three examples of, of different uh, compute platforms that you want to actually be able to, to connect to. So that the top one is, for example, a, a normal application processor where you want to to stream this this uh, high bandwidth uh, data to 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 
some kind of application where we use the full uh, digital pipeline to, to pre-process and, and format the data then they are streamed to, through MIPI to the application processor. In the middle, we have, for example, a, a very low power microcontroller that uh, does some kind of CNN-based HII application to this uh, platform. We will, for example, stream uh, uh, either frames of events or event histograms or something like that at, at very low power using, for example, our, our uh, DCMI compatible parallel interface. Well, at the bottom, we have, a, for example, a neuromorphic processor that, that likes to receive direct a, ER input, uh, for example, a spike in your network uh, uh, implementation. So there's no time stamps, for example, we directly stream the events to, to our interfaces. So this, this different data, uh, again, as I said before, we, we have AR, we have this, this timed events using uh, some kind of compressed data formats, and we have this, this, this aggregated data formats, and we have these two interfaces. So we have this parallel interface for very low power and low latency transmission to, to uh, compute platforms. This, it's adjustable, so you can select between four to eight bits of, of CMOS uh, parallel uh, up to almost 300 megavents per second, which is more than enough probably for the small array size in, in most cases. Or we have the MIPI interface, it's a one lane, 1.5 gigabit per second. Uh, that would give you a theoretical upper limit of one gigavent per second, which is uh, more, more than, by far more than enough to, uh, of bandwidth for, for, this, for this array size. Here we, we also transmit compressed or uncompressed vector uh, event data or this, this aggregated formats as well. Uh, for the power modes, uh, as I said before, we, we tried to, to implement several uh, modes of operation of this sensor, where we start from a super low power mode, it's called here PM0, but basically everything is off except actually we, we route the, uh, the, the photodiode signals from the, from the, from the, from the pixels to, to this uh, GCD blocks for, for a very low level activity monitoring and detection. Then we have, we have another uh, next uh, level of, of low power mode where we switch on this, the uh, CPU and, and pre-process this, this data from this nine, nine uh, um, arrays of, of pixels and, and, and do some more elaborate smart uh, presence monitoring. Uh, and and so on, and then we, we can go up to to full uh, full resolution uh, pixel array um, activity detection to full streaming modes. Um, here is the some examples. So again, we, we do for example this 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 nine uh, nine regions of 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 uh, of uh, GCD. Uh, Activity monitoring in this mode, the sensor actually runs at 35 microwatts, which is uh, you can really do an always on uh, uh, sensing system here and, and use this, this um, activity monitoring or detection to, to either switch on uh, or switch the sensor to one of, one of the other power modes. So, this, this, these are hierarchical, so you can go between switch between those different power modes uh, seamlessly or also. Uh, create uh, wake up signals on, on an external pin to, to, for example, wake up your, your processor to, to look at what's happening. And there are the different power modes. So we have this, this uh, super low power mode of 35 microwatts. We have another one that this is more elaborate with, with this, as, as I mentioned before, this pre-processing of, the, of this data with the, with the on, on board, uh, on chip uh, CPU that's still below one milliwatt. The next mode is at 2.5 milliwatts in the full streaming mode, depending on the on the interface uh, between 3.5 milliwatts up to 20 milliwatts and more if you go full, full steam with the MIP interface. Here, this is just to compare actually what, what the two interfaces uh, give you in, in terms of power consumption. So um, MIP is a, an, an interface that has a large overhead, so it, it, it consumes much more power. So you, you can see that Actually, the interface here consumes more, more power than the sensor itself. While for the, the parallel interface, you can you can go to much lower power consumptions. Also, the, the bandwidth, of course, is a bit limited here. But uh, for, for many edge, edge applications, I would say that the, the parallel interface is the interface of choice, probably. 
Um, summary conclusion here. So we have a, we have designed this this sensor for specifically for for edge applications. So this is power where power and latency are typically the, the most important KPIs. It's fabricated on a stack BSI CIS 65 on CMOS 40 nanometer. We have these different uh, features for pre-processing, filtering, formatting the event data before they are strained out of the out of the of, of the chip. And uh, we have these two interfaces to choose depending on your on your application, your requirements on your system. Uh, different transmission options, different file formats. This uh, uh, hierarchy of power modes that you can use to to build systems that that are very effective in, in terms of power consumption. Um, that's it for it. And I want to close actually with a little teaser because we, are, we also have a, a booth on, in the exhibition hall downstairs from tomorrow. And we will show a few things here. For example, we also, we actually are, are working a lot on, on, on fusing uh, event data with, uh, with RGB data with the frame. So we, for example, this is an example here of uh, still image deep learn and you can see before and after. If I go back, you, you can appreciate actually the ball here. Again. So we, as, as, it, as it was described before, we used the event data that, that I accumulated during the exposure time of the sensor. You see the ball and it comes actually pretty good. So this, this, uh, this you as we had before, this utilizes the the, the fact that you you can uh, accumulate and, and store the events during the exposure time of, of of your frame and then use this this information to to uh, remove the deep and, and back to a sharp frame. Um, some more applications that we're also having live demos in the, at the booth. So of, as also we have heard before, event-based art tracking is, many people look at that. This is, this is really working very well. You can do up to kilohertz uh, eye tracking, very robust. Um, this one has, I think uh, Ultraleaf has shown this, this, this live demo to, today in the, at, the, at the poster session using a, a stereo setup of, of, of two of these of these cameras to, to do this immersive uh, interaction with your computer or well, this is this is like a active marker tracking so we, we you track this this different uh, light sources here and every one of them is encoding a different uh, identifier a bit pattern in, in in the in the modulated light output and we can do this very robust and very fast tracking you, you see that you always know which 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 one you're you're looking at because you'll have this unique identifier so for game game controllers or, or many other things that very need to have a very very fast very precise uh, position in, in space and time and this is this is our booth one, four, two, three, four. From tomorrow on, come and see us and see some of us. Thank you. Any questions for Christoph? No, not Andrea. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> You have a slide where you're talking about hypothetical uh, event rate and data rate uh, of about, uh, I think you were referring to 1.5 bits per event. Yeah. Can you point out what is the typical range of the uh, encoding efficiency bits per event? Yeah. It just varies wildly, of course, from from no compression to to that one. Yeah, depending on the on the. Also, of course, you know that uh, how the activities is is distributed over the over the scene. If it's very very local, very concentrated, then you have the best. If it's if it's spread about, then it's you're getting worse. That's yeah. How do you know that, right? <laughs> I was hoping for a less political answer. <laughs> Diplomatic. <laughs> But it's in that phone right now. You can buy those phone with that camera in it, or not. Well, this this chip I'm talking about here. This this one is is uh, we have it. Uh, we just fabricated it. No, it, it's not. It's it's nowhere in the front. It's on the bench right now. This is on the bench right now. Yeah, it's it's it be you take out mass production of this chip. So this of this small chip in like now. But this one is not for. This is not for mobile imaging. This one is for. Quiet and, and edge, yeah, yeah. 
Sorry, second. All the all that is on the chip. The, all the all, all all I showed here is is, is in hardware on the sensor. On the output chip, I think. chip. It's all on the chip. There's nothing software here. This is this is all in hardware. Not in the pixels, but on the output from the chip, I think, right? So most the, most of that is in the in this digital pipeline I was describing. Yeah, right. it's it's so there's the, the pixel array, and there's the readout, and then there's this digital pipeline that is doing all these these things. Yes, yeah, yeah, that, that thing. So here's here's the pixel array, right? and then and then this is this is all outside of the pixel array. But it's on the chip. It's on the it's here. Where's that thing? Yeah, it's all it's all here. Right? Yeah. Yeah. ERC, yeah. yeah when is that when it is activated, when you want, you switch it on or off, and then you program your your rate, and then. Okay, so when you start doing the that's a use that's a user feature right it's a use it's user control whenever you want to switch it on or off yes please 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 be, be <laughs> the, so kind and, and the documentation doesn't say what's the latency of switching on and off of what what his question when you want to turn on and off the pixel for roi how fast is it oh the roi yeah, yeah. not the erc not the erc the roi how fast? Yeah. I, oh, this is fast. I just I just flip a flip a, a flip. I know, I know, but the microsecond is wrong. I want to know the number. The number is nowhere to be found in any documentation. Because there there is not yet curious. any document. You mean huh? the you mean that? Yeah, that thing. How, yeah. Yeah. How, how fast you can reprogram that? Huh? How fast you can reprogram that? Yeah. How like fast? How to... fast can you change? Like, say, I don't want this anymore. Then this guy is. How fast can you? Yeah, this is. This What's is, the latency per per on and off? Uh, to, to switch the bit. How, how, how? And this is this is these are just this is a these are a register of 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 very essential facts. So this is this is. Oh, microsecond. Like, 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 not no no not even. No like, no. Less no. than millisecond. Yeah no I think it's uh, measured few microseconds. I can't see. Why is it so slow? I thought it could be fine, but. Actually, I don't know. I have no idea how fast yeah, it okay. is. But we can we can calculate yourself. It's not. No, no, I can. You just remove the data into that and, and, and program your your flip flop in the in the issue. I think that's fast. But I have no measurement results. I'm okay. No, but in just up on the streets, nowhere. It's uh, and people ask a lot about this. Thank you. All right, we're getting to the end. Uh, maybe I can get some more, more of your minutes. All right, so we're getting to the end, and um, every in every edition of the workshop, we we receive a lazy many applications. Something I didn't say, like the the, double, the number of applications doubles of submitted papers doubles every two years. So this year we had like sixty one, and out of those we selected uh, after the review uh, twenty six two percent, and uh, out of those twenty six, we there is a there is a committee. Uh, that selects the two remarkable ones. Okay, so we are getting to this part of the paper awards. And first of all, we need to thank all the reviewers because we do this in a very short time, typically 10 days, two weeks. Uh, we try to push as much as possible the deadline back so that people who um, has um, ideas, they, they can submit it and hopefully get feedback as soon as possible before 
the deadline is ultimately determined by the IEEE that we have to provide the camera ready versions by mid April. So thank you all, uh, the reviewers, for uh, making it possible. I mean, we wouldn't be able to do it. And every time that you know more and more submissions are coming, we need more uh, from you. So thank you very much. And um, yeah, just to say that the paper award was uh, uh, put together by Cornelia, Riyad, uh, Mike, who Mike and Gary, who couldn't attend, they are not here. And the sponsor of the of the award is uh, Science of Intelligence, which is the cluster of excellence in in Berlin uh, that I'm part of it. And um, we have this disclaimer that none of the jury members have an affiliation with the award sponsor. And without further ado, I will pass on the torch to Cornelia. All right. So our runner up is for event IMU fusion strategies for faster than IMU estimation throughput. And the winners are William Chamorro, Juan Solar, Juan Andredo Cheto. And this paper was for novel fusion schemes integrating IMU with event data in a very fast post estimation algorithm. What they did, they combined event line based data association with IMU correction in a Lee Kalman filter and a tracking method that is really much faster than state of the art is achieved and was demonstrated for the PTAM slum pipeline. I think William was here before he was presenting the paper. Okay, maybe he left. We can tell him. Okay. Well, I guess he will get receive that paper in the email or by email. Well, now the winner asynchronous event based panoptic segmentation using graph mixer neural networks and the collaboration between multiple universities. Sanket Kajole, Yusra Alkendi, Faribor Spagai Naeni, Dimitrios Makris, and Yahia Tsveri. And this was for a novel graph neural network based segmentation algorithm in a robotic setting. Through novel architecture adaptation, this work achieved higher accuracy than state of the art event based segmentation algorithms while using significantly fewer network parameters. Mm -hmm. And then Sanket couldn't attend online because he didn't get the visa on time. Um, but I saw him online before. Nobody else is here either. I guess not. <laughs> we should we should make like real tokens and some so <laughs> probably you should offer cameras, guys. The camera guys. <laughs> <laughs> the winner. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so maybe one last thing um, before we all leave. Uh, could we go outside and take a picture? Yeah. Mm -hmm.